welcome back if you have been able to follow the course until now and do all the things hands on that means you are writing a lot of code you can look at the number of lines of code that we have in the character class it's very good you're writing a lot of java code and that is the best way to learn it right so the best way to learn programming as we discussed earlier is hands on it's just like cycling right so you get on the bike you start riding your bike and you would get good at it and the same is the case with programming i hope you are having a lot of fun until now let's continue the fun with the first exercise for this video which is my care dot is consonant so is consonant I want to find out if a character is a consonant or not so anything which is not a vowel is a consonant so any alphabet which is not a vowel is a consonant so we would want to be able to print that out so let's do a system dot out dot print ln my care is consonant right so let's go ahead and create the method control one command one this must be one of your favorite shortcuts by now and we would want to return a boolean back one of the ways to do this would be to list out all the 21 alphabets which are not a or e or i or u and which is not of these let's we can do that uh, like which are not in this list write the characters and try and write if condition for each one of them right that's very bad because uh, you need to list out 21 smaller case characters 21 uppercase characters so is there a way i can actually use the logic which we have already implemented right so if something is a consonant it means it's an alphabet and it is not vowel we already implemented the logic for alphabet right so can we say something like if something is an alphabet and it's not a vowel then it's true so if alphabet and not what is the not character not right not vowel then return true otherwise return false what do you think about this kind of logic you can stop here and try and implement this logic by your own now you're back so i hope you have tried it so if is alphabet uh, the end is double end and not vowel not is vowel 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 okay so return true and now let's see what would happen run it a is consonant oops i'm getting a value of true is a consonant yeah okay that's because we actually did not handle a's in here that's the reason why we are getting a problem because we did not handle the capitals one way of handling the capitals would have been to just add all the capitals in here right so if ch is equal to a or ch is equal to a right so that's one way of doing it hopefully you have given it a try earlier but there is another way inside the character class so there's a character class there's utility method and the utility method in the character class can do an uppercase so you can do an uppercase to uppercase of a character so you can say to uppercase of ch is equal to is equal to a so this is one way of doing it what it does is it would do an uppercase on all characters and compare it against the capital alphabet right so that's one way and if you don't really want to use the method for now it's okay what we can do is we'll say or ch is equal to a or because these are related i would really want to have them together so or ch is equal to e or ch is equal to O R C H is equal to U. Okay, now we have the complete logic for A I O U, so I can remove the to do A I O U in here. So that's cool. Now let's run this. So is vowel is true, but consonant is false. That's cool, right? So it's not a consonant. So it's saying okay, consonant is false. Let's use another alphabet to run this. B run it. Mm -hmm. Now it's true. That's cool, right? b is not a vowel it's not a digit it is an alphabet and it's a consonant 
So, that is cool. So, now we have implemented the consonant logic. Let us move on to printing all lowercase alphabets and printing all the lowercase things. So, one of the important thing here is here we are creating these as static methods. What is a static method? What we are doing in here is we are not really using the alphabet, right? So, we do not really care about what is the character which is present in there. What we want to do is we would want to print all lowercase alphabets and print uppercase alphabets. In these kind of situations, it is better to create static methods because we are not using any data from the class. So, from the class, from the object, we are not making use of any data. So, in that kind of situation, there is no use to create an object. So, I, in, I don't need to create an object and then call a method on it. We use static in that kind of situations. We will discuss about static in depth a little later. For now, what we will do is do a static control 1 and create method lowercase alphabets. So, you can see that it, because we used char, Eclipse is already putting a static keyword in here. So, the difference between this method and this method is the static keyword because when a stat method is static, you do not need to create an instance. So, I do not need to say new care of B. I can directly call it using the class name. So, you can see that it is printing lowercase alphabets. I will create the print uppercase method as well. So, I will say create method print uppercase. So, that is cool as well. Now, these two methods are not doing anything for now. Now, think about it. How do I print lowercase alphabets in here? How can I print all the lowercase alphabets? I want to print from A to Z. Think about it. Try it as an exercise and be back. Okay. I hope you have given it a try. So, I would want to print from A to Z. So, the easiest way would be to say use a loop. So, char ch is equal to A ch less than equal to z so a to z and increment ch and inside it system dot out dot println ch isn't this cool isn't this very easy so the thing is we are making use of the fact that character is a number right internally characters are numbers so we start with a go up to z and increment them and do that. So now print alpha uppercase alphabets. It should be easy, right? A to Z. That's it, right? So I'm changing to capital A to capital Z. Okay, you can see all the things printed. So A to Z, A to Z. That's cool, right? So in the last few exercises, we did a lot of programming because we wrote a lot of logic. We used different things about characters to do all the stuff that we wanted to do about them. One of the important things is if you are confused about any of these, you can actually directly take this and print it in JShell. So if you have problems understanding any of them, just type it in JShell and you'd be able to see what would happen. So the output which you are getting in here, you would also be able to get it in JShell. So if you would want to play around with it, let's say I would want to only print C three values, a to C, you can start with that and it's only printing A, A to C. So JShell is an awesome way for you to explore. Once you explore the code, once you understand it perfectly, then you can use Eclipse to move the code into a proper method. I hope you are having a lot of fun and we were discussing a lot of data types in this specific section. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this section, we talked about the different primitive data types in depth. We talked about integer data types, floating point data types, Boolean data types, and character data types, right? So we talked about byte, short, int, long, float, double, Boolean char. I hope by now you have a good understanding of when to choose which kind of a data type. We talked about different literals, operators. We talked about conversion between these, and also we saw how to use them in different classes. We created a lot of example classes in a lot of exercises and tried to play around with all these data types. One of the important things that you need to remember is while discussing, discussing floating points, float and double, we also talked about big decimal. Big decimal is not a primitive data type. Big decimal is a class. We discussed about big decimals in this section. 
because I see a lot of beginners making a mistake with float and double. In calculations, do not use float and double. In calculations, always go for big decimal. And to stress that fact, we included this topic called big decimal in the primitive data types. I hope you are having a lot of fun during all the exercises and during all the topics and the puzzles as well. I'll see you in the next section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this section, we will focus on conditionals. The conditionals are if, if else, nested if else, and switch statement. We'll use a problem for designing a menu. What we want to do is we would want to ask the user for two numbers and give him a menu. So I would want to give him a menu saying, okay, one is add, two is subtract, three is divide, four is menu, multiply. Choose the operation and we would want to publish the result. So that's the use case we would be using while we talk about if, if else, and then slowly move into switch. Conditionals is a very big part of programming. Whenever we write code, we have a lot of conditions in there, a lot of branches in code, if, else, switch. These are kind of the mostly used statements. So we'll look at the problem statement, which is to design a menu. We'll also look at a lot of examples and also a lot of puzzles to get an in-depth understanding of this. We have used the if a little bit earlier in the course. We'll quickly try and revise all that and get started to look at if and else and nested if else's and switch in depth. I'll see you in the first video. Bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's get started with the basics of if condition. We discussed this a little bit earlier as well, but let's quickly revise a few concepts and try and get familiar with if statement again, right? So in a if condition, if the, if the condition is true, so if the condition is true, then the code in this if would be executed. So think about this. What would be the output of this program? If true, system.out.println true. One of the best practices is to use a block always. So we are using a block, open brace, close brace. So what would be the output? Yep, it prints out true. Now the same thing, if I have a false condition in here, what would be the output? It's not printing it at all. So this is not executed. So this line is not executed if the value is false. So let's take an example. So int i is equal to three. If i is equal to is equal to three, print true. It prints true because this condition is true, right? And if this condition is false, let's say i less than two. i has a value of three, i less than two is not true. So what would happen? Think about it. What would be the result? It will not print it, right? So you are right. Cool. It will not print true. So this is if, right? So if you want to basically execute anything under a specific condition only, you would specify the condition in here and you would specify the code to be executed in that condition inside the if block. This condition can have multiple things as well. So we can use logical operators in here as well. You can say if I less than equal to 3 or i greater than or equal to 35. For example, I'm just taking it as an example. So you can have or instead of or actually we should use the or operator. This is the or operator. So now this, what would be the result of this? True. True or false is true. So the code inside this is executed. Now, if the same thing I would execute with an AND, what would happen? It never gets printed. Actually, this is almost impossible, right? The number can never be less than 3 and also greater than 35 simultaneously. When I'm writing AND, it means this condition is true and this condition is true. So if both conditions are true, only then the code inside the IF is executed. Now, let's look at IF ELSE. So let's say if i is equal to is equal to 3, then 
print something right so i would want to print system dot out dot print ln true now if i would want to write execute some code if this condition is not met so if this condition is met this code is executed if this condition is not met then i would want to execute some other code let's say system dot out dot print ln i is not three so what would happen if is executed if i has a value of five let's say i'm assigning i a value of five what would happen now i'll execute the same set of statements again i is equal to three system dot out dot print ln true let's go to the else part and print i is not equal to three and what would happen the statement in the else gets printed because i has a value of five i'm saying i is equal to is equal to three which is not met this condition is not met so what would happen the output is i is not three so whatever code inside the else block is executed so the syntax for the else is very simple right all that you need to do is at the end of the if block type in else and start your else block so that's basically the syntax for else in this video we took a quick look at if and if else so the code in the if is executed if the condition is true the code in the else is executed if the condition is not true in the next video let's look at nested if else welcome back in this video we'll be talking about nested if else before we start with it let's create a new project control n we want to create a java project let's take the defaults with everything uh, the project name i would want to give it as conditionals if and switch let's click finish the new project is created down here and over here let's create a new class i'll call it if statement runner so i'll just call it if statement runner i'll use the package as com in 28 minutes dot if statement dot examples and i would want a main method to be there so let's go ahead and finish now let's start with a simple if else condition very similar to what we did earlier so i is equal to 25 and let's say if i is equal to is equal to 25 i would want to print what do i want to print i is equal to 25 and i can write else here saying i'll copy this out and say i is not equal to 25 okay so let's run this program you'd see that i is equal to 25 is getting printed because i has a value of 25 if i has a value something other than 25 26 for example what would be the output the output says i is not equal to 25 because the code in the else is getting executed this condition is not true so the code in the else gets executed let's say now i have a requirement so i would want to print i is 25 i is 25 so if i has a value of 25 i want to print i is 25 if i has a value of 24 i would want to print i is 24 uh, otherwise i would need to print i is not 25 or 24 so it's neither 25 or 24 let's say i have to print i is neither 25 or 24 how can i do that so think about it how can i do this requirement with the code that we have in here so i can say if i is equal to 25 if i is equal to 24 would this be working do you think this would work let's say i is not equal to 24 this will not work because when i has a value of 25 what would happen it would print both these statements right so if i do this it would say i is equal to 25 and i is equal to 24. what i would want to do is this each of these is an independent condition so i, I is equal to 25 i is equal to 24 i is not 25 or 24 right so what we would need to do in this kind of situations is use else if so what would happen is if this condition is true the code will not even go into this condition so this is called a else if structure so if i is equal to 25 i is not equal i is equal to 25 if else if i is 24 this else do this so 
now i would need to say i is not equal to 24 and i is not equal to 25 because i have a value of 26 right now i'm moving it to 26 and executing the code so it prints i is not equal to 24 and i is not equal to 25 the same thing if i had value of 24 i is equal to 24 is printed and you would see that if you put a value of 25 25 is printed and the great thing about nested if else is you can have as many nested things as possible so you can say i is equal to 23 and you can add in here saying i is not equal to 23. the thing about nested if else is, is that only one block is executed so either the if block or the else if blocks so only one of the blocks is executed and once that specific block is executed it would leave the control would leave the thing and it would go out so this is nested if else this is very useful when you have uh, four set of different conditions or you have multiple set of different conditions and only one of them is true at any specific point in time here we were using is equal to you can also have conditions with greater than less than and all that kind of complex combinations in the next video let's focus on looking at a few puzzles with if if else nested if elses until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at a few puzzles to make sure that we understand if statement very well so what we have in here is a simple piece of code right so i have a main method and i have a static method called puzzle so because this is a static method i can directly call it puzzle one so i'm calling puzzle one from the main method and this puzzle one has case 15 and you can read the code which is present in here i would want you to guess what the output of this would be let's run this okay the output is two so this is the code that is getting executed so what's happening here is case 15 so what would happen if case greater than 20 so case greater than 20 nope so it goes to the next condition case greater than 10 yes so it prints two the important thing for you to understand is the rest of the else ifs are not even checked so once a condition matches even though this condition would have been true so case less than 20 because k has a value of 15 but that condition is never checked because a condition before it is already true so in a nested if else only one block is executed so that's something you need to be always cautious about because if you look at this code then it says okay if case greater than 20 this is not true case greater than 20 greater than 10 sorry yes it's true because it's 15 case less than 20 it's true also so you might be thinking it would print 2 and 3 but actually only one of the blocks would be executed in a nested if else so as soon as this block gets executed control will shift out and it would go out so only two would be printed now let's look at the puzzle two um, l has a value of 15 so this is the code here so what would be the output think about it what what would be the output of this specific program what i'll do is i'll go to the main and change to run puzzle 2 let's see what would be the output of puzzle 2 puzzle 2 says l less than 20 and who am i l less than 20 and who am i so this is executed so this is executed as well as this line is executed how does it happen actually these two are independent statements right so this statement does not have any relationship between with this statement so if l less than 20 it would print l less than 20 and next this condition gets executed l greater than 20 so nope it's not true so else gets executed the best practice in all these puzzles is to make sure that you have an o block separator so that would actually make sure that everybody who looks at your code will be able to understand it very easily so i would recommend you to always use blocks irrespective of whether there is one statement or more that would ensure that whoever writes the code next time will also not make a mistake because he would write code in here so it's already in the block so this code would be only executed when this is true so that's something we should need to be careful about let's move on to the third puzzle you can look at this code in here it's not really formatted very well so you can think what would be the output of this 
puzzle. This looks very similar to the previous one, except for one small change. Pause the video here and try and figure out what would be the output of puzzle 3. Let's run it now, puzzle 3. You would see that nothing is printed. The console doesn't even come up. Why do you think nothing comes up? Puzzle 3. Because what happens is inside this if m greater than 20, so this condition is not true at all. So the way this whole thing behaves is as if this is one big block inside this. So this is almost like the way it's executing. So it's if m greater than 20, then the next statement is a if and if else forms one big block. So this entire block is under this. So that's the reason why if m greater than 20 is first tested, okay, m has a value of 15, so this code is not at all executed. That's the reason why using blocks would make it very easy. So you, you would not need to worry about what is happening. You can easily, much easily read code. So make sure that you are using open brace, close bricks with every if. Let's now look at another puzzle. Let's say int i is equal to zero. And I say if i system dot out dot print ln i. What do you think would be the output of this statement when I execute it? Think about it. I'm saying int i is equal to zero and i is assigned a value of zero and I'm saying if i do something. If you are a C or a C++ programmer, you might be thinking that this would be giving a no output, but actually it gives you a compilation error because I cannot use a integer number in the place of a condition. In C and C++, it was allowed to have an integer and any non-zero integer was treated as true. But in the case of Java, you are not allowed to use an integer in place of a condition. Now, let's try one more. So if i is equal to 1, what would be the output of this? Think about it. Be very cautious. There's a small mistake in the program. So you can try and guess what would be the output. The thing is, again, this would be an error because i is equal to 1 is an assignment. i is equal to 1 is not a comparison. So if I had to write it really well, then I should have written it like this. Double is equal to is the comparison operator, right? So that's something you should be cautious about. Again, you should always use the comparison operator to compare. This is an assignment operator. You cannot use an assignment operator in a if. Now, let's look at puzzle 5. Number has a value of 5, and this is the code which is present in here. What would be the output of number? Try and pause the video in here and try and think what would be the output is. Puzzle 5. Mm -hmm. It says 6. Why is it printing 6? Number has a value of 5. If number is less than 0, so is number less than 0? Nope. But why is number plus plus getting executed and the value is printed as 6? Why is it happening? Because this statement is actually not under the if. If you don't use open brace, close brace, only one statement is under the if condition. So it's almost like this. So this if condition is something of this kind. So if number less than zero, number is incremented by 10. Otherwise, number plus plus would happen. Five plus plus six. So six would be what is printed in here. Cool. In this video, we looked at a lot of puzzles related to if, if else, and nested if elses. The summary of the whole thing is whenever you're using a if and else or a nested if else, Make sure that you are using blocks, proper blocks. Uh, use open brace and close brace. And that would make sure that the code is readable and understandable by whoever is look at it. So use open brace, close brace, and make sure that your code is well formatted. And that's it. They should not have any problem understanding if conditions. Until the next video. Bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous videos, we looked at if and else and nested if else. Now, the problem we wanted to solve was we wanted to design a simple menu. We wanted to ask user for an input. Um, we wanted to ask user to say, okay, enter me two numbers. Enter number one, enter number two. And we wanted him to choose the operation. 
and based on the operation that is chosen we wanted to publish the result so now for doing this we have now learned how to solve the problem of choosing which operation so based on the operation chosen if i write if else conditions then i would be able to execute the right operation but the first thing that i would want to learn now is how do i ask user for an input so how can i ask user to enter a number one so the first thing is this i can do it by using system.out.println right i would want to print something to the console so i can use system.out.println to do that now how do i get a number value and accept it in that's basically what we will look at in this specific video in this video let's focus on the interaction so let's try and ask the user enter number one and get a value of number two enter number two and get a value of number four and also display the menu and then have the user choose a specific operation let's create a new class i'll call this menu runner and oops i could have added in a main so i can type in main and press control space or command space control space and then you would have the complete main method coming out so the first thing i would want to do is system.out.println let's try and accept one number right so i would want to take in one number so enter number one so i'm doing a system.out.print because i don't want a new line i would want just to print this and as soon as user enters i would want to take that so now what i would want to do is whatever user enters i would want to take it into a variable i would want to call this int number one so how do i take whatever is entered by the user and put it into a number how do i do that in java there is something called a scanner so scanner is one of the classes which is present in java and to this you can tell where to get the value from what do we want where do we want to get the value from from the user input and this is called system dot in so system dot in is user input system dot out is user output so whenever we do a system dot out dot print something gets printed out to the console so that's output whatever user enters is input so to this scanner class i would need to pass in a argument the argument is where do you want to read the input from i would want to read the input from system dot in the entire syntax is very similar to creating a new object right so how do we create a new object type object name is equal to new type right that's the syntax typically and over here we have an argument to pass in the argument is system dot in so the syntax is scanner scanner is equal to new scanner instead of type i'm putting in scanner instead of object i'm putting in scan uh, scanners with a small s typically all object instances we would start with a smaller letter the types would obviously be, be a large i mean a caps and over here i can say system dot in there are compilation errors let me remove this line of code it is not needed anymore so scanner scanner is equal to new scanner of system dot in what i can do is press control one or command one because this is an inbuilt java class and if i want to use it what i would need to do i would need to do an import so i can press control one or command one and import this in so just type in if you are not able to do control one command one you can also type in import java dot util dot scanner so this scanner is what would help us to read the values in now i can say scanner what do we want to read scanner dot we want to read a integer so i would say next int there are a lot of other methods which are present in this scanner if you look at it you can read a byte you can read a short if you just say scanner dot next it would read it as a string so for now we would want to read it as an int so next int as simple as that right so we have number one so let's make it easy for us right now for now let's just say system dot out dot print ln the number you entered is number one so this is one of the things in java if you append a integer value to a string what happens is it, this is not really treated as an addition what happens is whatever 
the number is is appended to the text it's kind of an append when you're using plus with an string it's an append so what happens the number you entered is gets appended with the number so it would get appended with whatever value you enter on the screen so let's try and run this program right click run as java application you can see that it's asking enter number one. I would say 35. And now I press enter and you'd see that it says the number you entered is 35. So whatever value I was entering has been picked up and it's printed out in here. Now, what I'll do is I'll leave it as an exercise for you to implement the rest of the menu. I would want to be able to accept number two, enter number two, four, and I would also want to be able to print the menu. So I would want to say one is add, two is subtract, three is divide, four is multiply. And we would want to ask user to choose an operation. That also should be a number. So take that also into a variable. Let's call it choice. So I would leave it as an exercise for you to try and do these two things. So try and get the value for number two and try and get the value for choice. I will see you in the next video where we would do this exercise and go ahead with this problem. Welcome back. Let's quickly do the exercise from the previous video. I would want to get the number two. So I would remove the system.out.print and say number two. And the variable name I would want to say is number two. There's no difference in code at all. For the choice, I would want to say enter choice and take the value into choice right so this is very simple but before this i would want to make sure that i publish the entire menu so i'll use a system.out.println so that i get a new line each time so system.out.println choices available are and i can type in all the operations right one, two, three, four, and whatever else you would want to add. So one is add, two is subtract, three is divide, four is multiply. So now we have all the things present. So now I can say system.out.println. Tell in your choices are. I can say I can try and print the choices which the user selected, right? So I can say system dot out dot print ln number one and say plus number one and the remaining stuff as well. Number two is number two and choice is choice right isn't this cool so now i have all this stuff present so i can say enough run enter number one 25 enter number two 50 choices available are one add two subtract three divide four multiply let's enter our choice so let's say i would want to multiply them i would say four and press enter and it says your choices are number one 25 number two 50 and the choice is four that's cool right so we are able to get the choices from the user and use them now i would want to print the message based on the user choice how can i do that so based on the choice of the user the choice that user makes i would want to be able to execute the specific operation on the numbers. So if user chooses multiply, I would want to multiply the numbers entered and print the result out. Now think about how you would implement that and I will see you in the next video. Welcome back. I hope you had enough time to do the exercise and come back. I hope you have try to solve the problem right so this is how you can approach solving this problem so if choice is equal to is equal to one what do we want to print we want to print system dot out dot print ln what do you want to print 
the addition. So result we would want to say is what is the result? If choice is 1, what we want to do? Addition. So we would want to add number 1 plus number 2. So I will put it in a bracket so that number 1 plus number 2 is executed first. The result is concatenated to result. Would it be okay if I just say if a choice is equal to 2, do this? It should be, right? Because both all these conditions are independent of each other. That's possible. But typically, the way we would do that is by using an else if. So else if choice is equal to 2, what we want to do? We want to subtract. Choice is equal to 3, we want to divide. Right? So let's do that. Choice is equal to 3. What do we want to do? We want to divide. And if choice is 4, we would want to multiply them. Okay, is this cool? Let's go ahead and run this now. So number 1 is 23. Number 2 is 10. And I would want to subtract them. So I'll enter 2. And it says your choices are number 1, 23, number 2, 10, choice is 2, and the result is 23 minus 10, which is 13. That's cool, right? So this is how we use if else. When I was further reading through the program, I found that this is wrong, right? Choice is equal to is equal to 4 should have been the right way. It should not have been choice is equal to is equal to 3. And now you can go and execute and try and see all the operations. They should be working fine. Now, if I want to further expand this, I would need to actually to really make the program complete. I would need to say, okay, if he enters an invalid operation, I would need to print invalid operation, right? So this would make sure that the program is more complete. So we have now covered all possible choices range. If you look at this specific piece of code right now, you can see that if choice is 1, then I would want to do this. 2, I want to do this. 3, I want to do this. 4, I want to do this. Else, I want to do this. So, this constructs which we are using in here is little complex in the sense that each time I have to write else if choice is equal to 2, else if choice is equal to 3. And all these constructs makes the program much, much more complex. Is there a simple way to do the same thing? So I would want to do the same thing without using a complex structure like a nested if else. How do I do that? That's basically what we would be discussing in the next video when we introduce this switch statement to you. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we would look at one of the interesting things that you can do to practice whatever you are learning. This website is called codingbat.com. Just go to the Java problem, few interesting exercises which are present in here. You can try and do some of them. So if you want to do the very basic ones, you can click the warm up one and say sleep in. This would give you a problem description and also it would say what the method should do, when it should return true, false, and also, you, you can type the code directly in here, and it would show if your code is working or not. So let's say I just return true in here, right? I'm not really implementing it. So you can see the test, which test cases passed, which test cases failed. And also, you can see the solution as well. This is a great way to become a good programmer. There are a wide variety of problems which are present in here. So there are problems which are related to basics, conditional and things like that. You have problems related to arrays, logic, strings, and also there are a few complex ones related to recursion and stuff as well. You can have basic map things and also a few things related to functional programming as well. What I would recommend you to do is as and when you complete a specific section, you can come over here to codingbad.com and see if you are able to solve the problems in here. Good luck and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. One of the things that we are doing in here is using nested if else, right? So in this video, let's look at an alternative to implement the same thing. That's called switch.
when you have a set of choices and you want to execute the code based on the choice, you can use switch. Switch makes it much more easier to read your code. Now, what I'll do starting off is I'll try and refactor this to a separate method. You can highlight this entire code and I would want to take this out to a separate method because this is acting, this is performing the operation. So I'll say right click, refactor, make sure that you are choosing if choice is equal to one to the last line of the else. So make sure that you are choosing all the blocks in the if statement, in the nested if statement. And you can say right click, refactor, extract method. So extract method is one of the refactorings which I present. You can see that it's passing parameters as well. It's sending parameters as number one, number two, and choice. Those are the parameters you would need. And it would automatically create the method for you. I'll say perform operation using nested if else. So because we are using nested if else to do this operation, I'm saying perform operation using nested if else. So that's cool. Now, what is happening is a new method gets created. You can see that the parameters are also in here. So the three parameters in number one, number two choice, and all the logic gets moved to this specific method. Now, what we want to do is we would want to do the same thing using a switch. So I would want to do this using switch. So I'll copy this method and paste it in. So I would say perform operation using switch. Before we do this, let's write a simple switch statement. Take a simple integer variable int i is equal to 5. Now, you can do a switch in a very easy way. So you can say switch on what variable you would want to switch. And you can do the open brace. And you can type in all the code that you would want to do. So if I want if case one is when i is equal to one, what do I want to do? System dot out dot println one. Next, when case five, what do I want to do? System dot out dot println five. In switch, the default case is called default. So there is no else, it's called default. So system.out.println default. And you can close the brace. What we are saying is, if i is 1, do this. If i is 5, do this. Otherwise, do this. So you can see that this is much, much more easier code to read, right? So now, you can see when I execute it, it's actually printing 5 and default. Both of them are executed. This is one of the common mistakes that beginners with switch statement do. In switch statement, what would happen is once a case matches. So over here, i has a value of 5, so case 5 matches. So what would happen is all the code below that gets executed. So 5 gets executed and default gets executed. Now if I have i is equal to 1, what would happen? So I'm putting a value of i to 1. So i has a value of 1. So I'm executing the switch statement again. Let's do this again. So switch case 1, case 5, default, and the close place. What would happen now? What would happen now is the code in 1 gets executed, 5 gets executed, and the default also gets executed. So when, do, when I do a switch, what would happen is by default, from the matching case, so i has a value of 1 right now, so from 1, so this is the matching case. So from 1, every case gets executed, including the default. All the cases that are below it get executed. Now, how do I prevent that from happening? In switch, you can do prevent that from happening by using something called a break. So what we do is case 1, system.out.println, break. Break statement breaks out of this switch. So now, case 5, break, default, break. You don't really need 
a break for the last case which is the default in here but it's a good practice to put it in there so now what would happen is only the matching case is executed system dot out dot println one break so this is one thing you should always remember when you talk about switch so what we looked at until now is a couple of examples with switch the syntax is very simple the variable name is in here and case uh, the value in here followed by a colon and then the code that you would want to execute followed by a break so this is very simple switch statement what we'll do now is we'll do something similar for our code as well so now i can come here we would want to do a switch here perform operation using switch right so what i can do here is switch on what should be the switch on based on the choice so switch on the choice case one if choice is one i would want to execute this line of code and if choice is two i would want to execute this line of code case two this line of code case three what do we want to execute you would want to execute this line of code division and case four is multiplication the last one is the default case what do we want to print invalid operation now i'll remove this code out from here because we don't need it anymore now one thing which i have not added in yet is a break statement so let's add in a break so that only that specific code under that specific case is executed so this is your switch statement to perform the same operation that we were doing using the if else nested if else right if choice is equal to one choice is equal to two choice is equal to three over here the code is much easier to read so you can actually very easily look at it and say okay i'm doing a switch on the choice if case is one then this case is two then this is the thing which would happen over here it's much more difficult code to read so that's the reason why we prefer switch i mean whatever you can do typically in a switch you can actually do it also using a nested if else that's not really a problem code written using switch is much more readable typically than code which is written using nested if else so what we'll do is we'll now execute this code so inside the method we'll actually say perform operation using switch and let's run this right click run as java application and i would say enter number 10 number 2 20 i would want to do a multiplication for so your choices are number one is 10 number two is 10 choice is 4 and result is 200 and this is now being performed using a switch case if you're having any problems with switch you should be very careful with the syntax it's a open bracket close bracket around the variable and a open brace and a close brace in here and this is a colon so this is something which you might be getting wrong so case followed by the value followed by a colon and after this a simple statement so this is very simple typically people make a mistake when they are using a colon or they would actually probably not use a open bracket and a close bracket in here so be careful about this and you should be able to easily write switch statements and execute them i would recommend you to try and get your first switch statement running on jshell and then you can go into the code and update the code to use the switch statement i hope you are having fun with switch and nested if else we'll talk about a lot of different puzzles related to the switch statement in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at a few puzzles related to switch statement to make sure we understand switch statement very well so we'll start with the puzzle one you can look at the code on your screen right now you can pause the video in here try and look at the piece of code which you are seeing in here and guess what would be the output in main i'm calling puzzle one so this is the method which is being executed so try and guess what would the output for this be okay now let's move on to the solution what what would be the pro solution what would be the output 
Now let's try running the program. 2, 3 and default. Why 2, 3 and default? Because number is 2, so switch number is 2, so case 2. From here on, all the code until it faces a break is executed. Because there are no breaks in here, what happens is this is executed, this is executed and this is executed. If you want to prevent this from happening, you need to put a break in every case. So if you don't have a break, then all the code subsequent to this would also be executed. Right? Let's move on to the next puzzle. Okay, the next puzzle is on your screen right now. Puzzle 2. Number has a value of 2. Um, try, pause the video here, try and look at it. It has a few breaks, but there is something different about this puzzle. Think about it and come back. I hope you had chance to think about it. What do you think the output would be? Let's run this and see. So instead of puzzle 1, I want to run puzzle 2. Let's run this. Okay, number is 2 or 3. So this is the code that is being executed. Why is this line being executed? Think about it. Right, number is 2. So switch to case 2. So in case 2, there is no statement at all. There is nothing which is present in here. So what happens is it does something called a fall through. So it, it starts executing the code under the next case. So case 3, number is 2 or 3 and there's a break here, so it breaks out of the switch. So the thing is, in a switch, all code from that specific case to a break is executed. So either it would come out of the switch when a break is encountered or when the last case completes execution. This specific way of writing code is called fall through code. So over here, if I want to do the same thing for case 2 and case 3, I can do it in this way. So case 2 colon leave everything empty and case 3 and I can write the code for both these cases in here. If either of these cases match then this code is executed. Whether it's 2 or 3 the same code would be executed. Isn't that cool? Now let's move on to the third puzzle. Right? So puzzle 3. Number is having a value of 10 and we have a switch on number 10. What would be the output? This is Kind of a simpler puzzle compared to the earlier ones. We have breaks everywhere. Try and pause the video in here and try and guess what would be the output. Let's run it now. Puzzle 3. Run this. The output is default, right? This is kind of a basic puzzle. Because it has 10. It does not match any of these cases. So the default case gets executed and prints out default. Yep, this was an easy one. Now, let's go to the puzzle 4. Number has a value of 10. Oh, ho! Oh. default is the first one. Is this really allowed? Should default not be the last one? Think about it and come back. Okay. Now, if I run this, the output would be no different from how it was earlier. So, puzzle 4. Default. Typically, in a nested if-else kind of a scenario, the last else gets executed when none of the other conditions get matched. And that's the only place we can write the last condition. But in a switch, nothing like that. You can even make the first one as the default condition. So when none of these cases match, then the default gets executed. So when the value is 10, the default gets executed. When we execute the code, it prints default. If I actually remove this break, you'd see that it would flow through. So it would fall through to case 1. This line is executed and break. So you can have default anywhere in a switch. Now let's look at puzzle 5. That's the next puzzle that we would want to talk about. It's giving us a compilation error. Why is it giving us a compilation error? Think about it. Pause the video here, think about it and come back. Let me highlight the compilation error. It says, cannot switch on a value of type long. Only convertible in types, strings, or enum variables are permitted. So that's one of the important things. So you can do a switch only on, let's say, a char. So let's say this is a char. So I can do a switch on a char or a int or a byte or a short. We'll look at uh, string and enums a little later, you can do 
switches on strings and enums as well. So those are the only things that you can do switches on. You cannot switch on a long or you cannot switch on a double. That would always give you a compilation error. Same is the case with a float. It will give you a error. Boolean also will give you a compilation error. So that's puzzle five. You can only use switch on specific types. Those are the integer types, char, int, short, and byte. Other than that, you can use it on string and enum. That's all. Let's comment this out to make sure that the code compiles. I hate not compiling code. Okay, let's move on to puzzle six. Number is equal to six. This piece of code is not compiling. Think why? Yep, the answer is inside the case, you cannot have a condition. Inside the case, you should only have things like case five. You cannot have something saying number greater than five. That's not really a valid case. That's the reason why this piece of code does not compile. Let's comment it out to make sure that the code compiles. Okay. Now, in this video, we looked at various puzzles related to switch statement. In the next video, we will look at a few exercises related to the switch statement. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a few exercises related to the switch statement. We discussed about the syntax of this switch statement. We talked about default, break, and all the important things around this switch statement. So these exercises would help you to reinforce those concepts. Now, let's look at the exercises. The first exercise is to create a method. Like if you look at all these methods, we are creating them as a static method so that you can directly call them from main. So the first exercise is to create a method called is weekday. Pass in the day number. The day number is basically either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 0 represents Sunday and 6 represents Saturday. And you have to determine if it's a weekday. So if it's a weekday or not. So return if it's a weekday or not. So the way we would look at it is Sunday and Saturdays are weekends and the rest of the five days are supposed to be weekdays. And you can use a switch to do this. The next exercise is to determine name of the month. So pass input as 1 to 12. So one uh, number 1 to number 12. You need to determine the month name. So you need to return January, February, December, and so on. So that's determine name of the month. The last exercise is to determine name of the day. So given a number 0 to 6, you need to say Sunday to Saturday. So that's basically the exercises. You can pause the video in here and try the exercises on your own before you can look into the solutions. I'll start with the most basic of the exercises, which is to start determine name of the day. Let's start with creating a new class. I'll call this switch exercises runner. And I'll add in a main method and click finish. Yep, that's cool. I want to start with the last one first, so let's copy this in. And I would go ahead and now, uh, for the starting, I would just determine empty string. So now I can say sys out, control space, command space, control space, and call this method. Determine name of the, right, system.out.println, and the name number can be anything, 0 to 6, right? So that's basically what we would want to do. Now, when I run this, what would happen? It would print empty string. That's why you're not able to see anything in here. So this is what written and this is printed out. So now, one of the important things is the written type is string. Because we are returning a string value, we would want to return Monday. It's not one character. If it was one character, then I could have returned M back right this is care so but because we want to return a complete string back the return type is string so string is representing this text we'll talk about strings a lot little later in the course for now the important thing is the written type string allows us to return multiple characters so this is what is a example string 
let's implement the logic so let's start with this switch so switch based on day number right so switch based on day number I can say case one let's look at the exercise so it starts from zero so case zero what should be the value the value should be a string result I would need to have a variable is equal to I'll just put empty value in there so I'm having an empty string right now um, if it's zero then result is equal to what should it be Sunday and case one result is equal to Monday I'm making a mistake think about it what mistake I'm making in here so so on right case two three four five six Sunday Monday Tuesday what's the mistake I made think about it while I type this out for you Wednesday I'm testing out my spellings Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday right so this is cool now instead of Monday actually I can return the result back right so whatever value goes into the result variable I'm doing a control shift F so Eclipse can do the auto format for you this is called right click source format if you format then it would format the code comp automatically for you so over here what is the mistake I'm making or so let's if you figured out that's good if you have not try and spend some more time to figure it out so I'm sending zero determine name of the day zero what would be the output you expect it to be Sunday what is the output Saturday why because of the fall throughs actually the case also is wrong so it should have been six but what happens is the code falls through so case zero so result is Sunday then result gets set to Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday and that is the value which gets result to prevent this from happening what do we need to do we need to put a break everywhere right so that's what we learned break break let's add a break quickly everywhere that's cool now what would be printed Sunday so for zero the value is Sunday you can run the program for other stuff as well and you'd see that it would be printing the right values one of the things you can actually do here is we would, Sunday is the return value that we would want to return back right case zero I would want to return Sunday back so one of the things you can do is not really use a variable remove the variable and directly start returning the thing so return Sunday then I would not need to have a break because when I return something from a method what would happen is the flow goes out of the method Sunday would be returned and the flow goes out and in that case you would not need a break at all I would recommend you to try and play around with this to understand this further but when you return something from a method the next lines of code will not be executed at all so we don't really need a break because the flow goes out of the method completely so I can say directly return Tuesday I don't need all the complex stuff this is where writing methods is really really useful so try and write methods for simple things like this and you would have good understanding of when to use which kind of a structure okay let's go ahead and quickly do it return Friday return Saturday and at the end is this code comes here when none of the cases match you can either have a default in here or I can directly write something in here invalid so now when I execute this what would happen you would get Sunday that's cool right so now we have a method which determines the day remember this kind of a structure would only work when you are doing a return otherwise you have to put in a break so if you are actually doing an assignment to a variable or things like that then you need definitely have a break in here if you are not doing an assignment and doing a return directly then you don't really need to do a break one of the things I would recommend you to do is to try and debug so try and put different cases 
and try and have break in here try and debug put a breakpoint in here by putting a double click in here and doing a right click debug as java application so go ahead and try debugging this if you have any confusion around it that would help you clear any questions that you have the next exercise determine name of the month i would leave it as an exercise for you so I, it should be very very similar so determine name of the month pass the month number in and return january probably march so that's quite a simple thing you should be able to do it on its your own now the last exercise is is weekday let's try that right now so is weekday so is weekday the way we would want to implement it is using a switch right so switch and day number so case 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 we learned that it's unnecessary to create a variable right so I can say if it's 0 it's a weekend so it's written false for case 6 it's written false as well for case 1 it's written true okay now let's try and print this okay by default I'll return false so any other number I would return a false because we have no idea what it is so if you don't have a written below this it would be a compilation error because this would ensure that if this code does not return anything the final code would be executed so the thing about return is if this line gets executed line 11 return gets executed none of the code below that would be executed at all that's why we don't really need a break and that's what we used in the previous example as well if I run this here is weekday for zero it should return me false is big day for five it should return me true that's cool that's good but one of the things you can see in here is there's a lot of duplicate code written true 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 in here written false false is there a way I c you can prevent that pause the video in here and think about it how can I make this code much more simpler okay one of the ways I can do that is by combining the cases which are related so 0 and 6 are having weekday as false so why do I really need to do it in here so I'll use the fall through so if I say case 0 6 return false case 1 2 3 4 5 return true how does it work isn't that cool that's awesome right so now if it's case 0 or 6 it would return false back 1 2 3 4 5 it will fall through and return true back now I would recommend you to play around with that a little bit more to understand that further but basically the way it works is if it's 0 it would flow down so it does a fall through because there is no break in here and it would return false if it's 2 let's say so it starts here it sees any code in 3 no 4 no 5 there's a return true so it returns true back because we are writing a false in here we can make use of that also and actually even these two cases you can commit them out so because it would check if it's one two three four five it would return true otherwise it would return a value of false okay what we are looking at is kind of variations of how you can think about writing code one of the most important things that you need to always remember is make the code very easy to understand so if it's easy to understand easy to look at and read that's the most important thing in this video we looked at various exercises related to switch we'll talk about other conditional operators in the next videos until then bye bye welcome back in this video we would look at one of the most important tips related to eclipse which is control one let's create a main method main and over here I would want to use big decimal right so I would want to create a new instance of big decimal big decimal BD is equal to new 
big decimal. Control 1 can be used to import. This is the basic thing, right? We have been doing this multiple times during this course. So if you go to the line and press Control 1, it would show the import option. So you can import. That's one of the basic uses of Control 1. Actually, I have to pass in a value. So let's say 25. Now, let's look at a few other things that you can do with Control 1. Let's say I would want to implement an interface. So I would want to create a class and make it implement an interface. So let's say I would want to say class test implements comparable interface. So comparable is one of the interfaces which is present. And I would want to compare strings. As you can see in here, once I go in here and press Control 1, it's giving me the option to add the unimplemented methods. In the comparable interface, there is a method called compare to that needs to be implemented. So any class which needs to implement the comparable interface, it needs to implement the compare to method. So you can actually manually type that in or you can press control one and say add unimplemented methods. Automatically the basic structure is there so you can go ahead and add your implementation. Again, control one on Mac is command one. So control one or command one. The other use of the control one is when you are throwing an exception. So let's say I'm calling a thread.sleep in here. Thread.sleep is one of the methods in the threads which would throw something called an interrupted exception. So sleep throws interrupted exception. What this does is it causes the program to sleep for how much ever time you specify in here. The time you are specifying here is in milliseconds. So this thread would sleep for one second. However, this is throwing a interrupted exception. So what you need to do is to throw it. In that kind of situation, you can do control one and say add throws. You can see that throws interrupted exception is added to the method signature. The other useful feature with control one is trying to create a class. So let's say I want to create a new class, right? So I would want to create a new class called dummy for test and say dummy for test is equal to new dummy for test and I would say dt dot do something. So this class does not really exist but I can go ahead and say control one and I can say create class dummy for test. You can see that Eclipse directly creates that for you when I press finish. So the class is created. You don't really need to do it manually and then you can also press control one on the do something error and you can say create method do something. So the method is also created for you. So you can save valuable keystrokes by doing control one or command one. The last thing you can do is also create local variables for some things you are doing. So if let's say I'm doing a big calculation in here, 100 into 45 into 456. And let's say I would want to create a expression for it. Highlight it and press control one. And then you can say extract to local variable. And this would create a new local variable in here. I'm doing a control Z. Other things control one allows you to do is to extract to a constant. So you can extract to a constant. It would create a public private static final int. We will talk about a static and final a little later, but this allows you to create a few constants as well. I'll do a control Z to undo this. And if you'd want, actually you can even extract this to a method. So control one, and you can say extract to a method and it creates a method. You can even change the name of the method, return something, <laughs> does not really matter, right? So what we are looking at in this specific video are all the things that you can do with control one. Do not worry if you did not understand some of the things that we are doing in here, especially the things related to interfaces and exceptions. The idea behind this video was to just show you a little bit of the magic you can do with just one shortcut, control one or command one. We'll talk about interfaces and in exceptions a little later in this course, and then you would understand everything about this specific step. If there is one thing that is a takeaway from here, that's control one or command one. Try it and have a great time. Until the next video, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous sets of videos, we looked at if, if else, nested if else, which, and all the variations around them. There is one last conditional operator which is called question mark is equal to this is also called a ternary operator. 
the syntax of the ternary operator is very simple right you have a condition so based on the condition what should it return if the value is true so if the condition is true what should be the return value if condition is false what should be the return value that's basically the syntax right so typically let's take an example right so if let's say int boolean is even so let's create a simple boolean variable and i'll want a int i is equal to 5 so if i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 then is even is equal to true right this is simple piece of code if i mod 2 is equal to 0 is even is equal to true and else is even is equal to false this is simple code to find out if a if a number is even or not so if i is equal to 5 what would happen what would be the value of is even now think about it what would the value of e is even it would have a value of false because i has a value of 5 now let's make i is equal to 6 and execute the same statements again so if i mod 5 2 is equal to 0 e is even is equal to false oops i got it wrong so let's fix that i mod 2 is even is equal to is even should be true else is even should be false right so now after executing the code what would be the value of is even i has a value of 6 so is even is true right so this kind of simple code right here i'm just setting a value so i'm not doing anything in the if except for setting a value this kind of code can be done using a ternary operator as well so you can say is even is equal to and put the ternary operator in brackets so inside the brackets i can type in the condition so the syntax is condition value if it's true so this is value if it is true if condition is true if condition is true colon value if false so if condition is false in our case is even is based on which condition i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 so if this condition is true what is the value we would want to return we would want to return is even is true right so true if it is false you can return false okay now you can see is even is true because i has a value of 6 i is having an even value so it's returning true if i has a value of 7 is even will have a value of false because this condition gets executed the condition has a value of false because 7 mod 2 is 1 the remainder when 7 is divided by 2 is 1 so it would return false back the thing is the conditional operator can also be used on other data types as well so here we are using it on boolean but you can even use it on strings so let's say i would want to create string even or not let's just say i would want to return a string back so i can say i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 question mark i can return even is equal to yes and even is equal otherwise no so even is no because i has a value of 7 if i 6 the same statement would give you a value of yes so similar to this you can actually return integer numbers or any other data types from the conditional operator or the ternary operator the most important thing is both sides of the equation should return the same type so i cannot have different types in here and here so if this is a string the second one also should be a string if i say four what would happen nope it says bad type you cannot do that or if you say true in here error you should have both strings so so both the return values in here should be of the same type so that's cool right so that's the terminary operator you can use it in very simple if conditions it makes it easy to write code 
but I've seen rules. Uh, I mean, I've seen coding standards saying don't use ternary operator at all. So try and figure out what are the rules in your specific organization before using the ternary operator. But I have found it to be really useful when I'm talking about very simple conditions. So very simple conditions like this, ternary operator is important. But don't try to do complex stuff with the ternary operator because the code becomes unreadable. When you are doing complex stuff, try and go for if. If you are doing very, very, very simple things like easy when or things like that, which just depend on a very simple operator, a ternary operator is good enough for those kind of situations. Okay, there you go. In this video, we discussed about the ternary operator. We took a simple if example and tried to see how it would look when we use a ternary operator. Ternary operator is good to use in very, very simple conditional kind of scenarios. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this section, we looked at a wide range of conditional statements. We looked at if, switch, if else, nested if else, and we ended it with the ternary operator. We also designed a simple menu that allows user to choose an operation and we can go ahead and publish the result as well. I'll see you in the next section where we would move into loops. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to this section where we will be talking about loops in depth. We already discussed a little bit about the for loop, right? So in this section, we would also talk about while loop, do while, and which is the right loop to pick in which situation. And also, we would be talking about a couple of important things with respect to loops. There are two keywords called break and continue. So we'll look at them. We'll also try and do a lot of fun exercises and puzzles with respect to the loops. Loops is a very big part of programming. Typically, any program that you write would have a number of loops. So having a great understanding of it would be of a great help in your journey as a programmer. I'll see you in the next video where we would start with the for loop. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's start revising all the things that we have learned about for loop until now. We have used for loop in the previous sections to do a few things, right? Let's revise the syntax of it as well as try and play around with a few puzzles with respect to for loop. As we discussed earlier, the syntax of the for loop is one of the simplest. I'm kidding, right? The for loop syntax is a little bit complex. So we looked at a few examples of for loop earlier. Let's quickly write out an example for loop. So for int i is equal to 0, i less than equal to 10, i plus plus, and open brace, and let's type in system.out.print ln. Let's do a print so that everything is printed on the same line. So I'll say print i plus space. So I'm giving a space. So the way space would work is because I'm appending a string, it would be appending the space at the end of the number. So let's not really worry about it. So now you can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. This is what is printed. So what is happening here? The for loop syntax has three important parts, right? One, this is called the initialization. This is called the condition. And this is called the operation or the update. The for loop keeps executing until this condition is true. So what do I mean by that? As long as this condition remains true, the code inside the loop gets executed. This statement, which is in here, is called initialization. This is executed only once. At the start of the for loop, this is executed once. And as soon as this is executed, the control goes over to i less than or equal to 10. So the condition is checked. So i is 0, so i less than or equal to 10 which is true so the code is executed and from then on from the second iteration on 
the I++ is executed. This is called update. So, for every iteration starting from the second one, I++ is executed and the condition is checked. So, the way it would be working is for the first iteration, this initialization is executed and the condition is checked. And from the second iteration on, the update is executed and the condition is checked. As long as the condition remains true, the loop is executed, right? So let's now try another example, right? So for i is equal to, instead of doing i plus plus, I'm doing i is equal to i plus two. What do you think will be the output? Think about it. What would be the output for this? For int i is equal to zero, i less than equal to 10, i is equal to i plus two. So it would print alternate numbers up to 10, right? So zero, two, four, six, eight, ten, and that's the output for this. Now, if I would want to print odd numbers up to 10, how can I do that? Think about it, pause the video and try and change the code to print odd numbers. Yep, you have already seen the code, right? So I just need to change it to one. What would be the output? One, three, five, seven, nine. Now, let's consider another small puzzle, right? Int i is equal to, let's say I'm giving a value of 11 and I'm saying do this. So what would happen? Will this code in here, will it be executed even once? Will it be executed at all? Think about it. I'm assigning a value of 11 to i. The condition is i less than or equal to 10. Will it be executed at all? Nope. It's not executed at all because after initialization, the condition check happens, condition is false. So the code inside the for is not executed at all. So the precondition for the code inside here to be executed is that the condition should be true. Only then the code is executed and then the update, check again, update, check again, update, check again, and so on and so forth. Now let's do another simple thing. So let's say over here, I'm making this empty. So there is no code there and here I'm making it 20. So i is equal to 11, i less than equal to 20. There is nothing in here. I'm printing the value of i and over here I'm doing i plus plus. Do you think this is valid syntax? If so, what would be the output? Think about it. Pause the video in here. Think about it. What would be the output? Okay, it prints from 11 to 20. The thing is, the update part can be empty. Actually, each of these parts in the code can be empty. So in the for loop, each of these parts can be empty. All this very important is to have the semicolons in here. So we are doing the update here. So this is printing the output. This is good for a puzzle, but don't write this kind of code in real world, right? So. That's not good practice because typically this is what you would expect to do. I plus plus in here. Okay, now let's move on. Let's look at another example. So I'll assign a value of int i is equal to 20, right? So i is equal to 20. And in the for loop, what I'll do is I'll remove the initialization. And I'll say until i less than 30, i plus plus. What would be the output? There is no initialization, right? What would be the output? Think about it. Yep, you're right. It prints from 20 because the current value of i is 20. It prints from 20 to 30. That's what, um, so initialization is not mandatory. This is not mandatory. Actually, even the condition in here is not mandatory. In this video, we discussed the basic syntax of a for loop as well as executed a few puzzles on it. In the next video, we'll look at a few exercises related to the for loop. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Let's now look at the different exercises that we would want to do with the for loop. We would want to create a class called my number and we would want to pass in a number to it. So we are creating a class called number and we are creating a constructor to pass the number to it. After that, we would want to create a method in the number class. This would be a member method, which would check if the number which is present in here is a 
prime number. So number dot is prime. You would want it to return if it's a prime number or not. Is the number prime or not? What is a prime number? A prime number is something which is not divisible by any number except one and itself. Let's assume that the input which is passed in is greater than one. So given a number greater than one, we would want to find out if the number is prime. For example, five is a prime number because the only numbers which can divide it are one and five. It is not divisible by two, three and four. Same is the case with seven, 11. For six, it's not prime because it's divisible by two and three. So that's the first problem is the number prime. The second problem is we would want to find the sum up to n. So given nine, I would want to find the sum of all numbers up to nine. So I would want to do one plus two plus three plus four up to nine. So if the input is six, then this is what I would want to calculate. This is called sum of numbers up to n. The next thing I would want to do is find the sum of divisors. So what I would want to find out is given a number, let's say six. I would want to find out the sum of all divisors of six, excluding one and itself. So if I pass in six, the divisors of six are one, two, three, and six. So I would want to exclude one and six, and the sum should be two plus three. So for six, the result should be five. If I give eight as input, then the divisors of eight are one, two, four, and eight. So it should return 2 plus 4 excluding 1 and 8. So 2 plus 4 is 6. So that's sum of divisors. The last exercise is to print a number triangle. So we would want to print a number triangle. Let's say the input is 5. I would want to print a number triangle of this kind. So this is a right angle triangle as you can see in here. So I would want to print 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So given 5 as input, it should print this. If 4 is the input, then it would print this. If 3 is the input number in here, then the triangle which would be printed would be something of this kind. So you can try and pause the video in here and try, try and play around with the exercises. Let's now start with the first exercise. So let's create the class and create number dot is prime. Right? So before that, we are in a new section. So let's create a new project. Let's create a new project control and Java project. I would want to create it as loops. I would say finish. We have a new Java project in here. I would need to create a new Java class. Let's quickly create that. And I would want to call this. What do I want to call this? We said my number. So we'll call this my number runner. My number runner. And I would want the main method in here and click finish. So we have the main method and the runner in here so what we want to do is my number is equal to new my number number is equal to new my number of nine the code would have compilation errors we'll fix them number dot is prime right so number dot is prime let's say this uh, let's take it into a boolean boolean is prime is equal to number dot is prime and let's do a sysout on it sysout control space and is prime i can say is prime and print this out so this is what we would want to do in this first exercise, we would want to print if the number is prime. So I'll hover over, I'll bring the mouse over here and press Control 1, create class my number. I would use the package com. Oops, caps lock is on. Let's turn it off. Com dot in 28 minutes dot loops and finish. Right, that's cool. Uh, let's now go ahead and now create the constructor as well. Again, Control 1. So I'll say create constructor my number of int and this is int number I will call this. Let's write the typical code that we write in all constructors. This dot number is equal to number and I can now again have an error control one create field number 
private int number that's cool right so we have now the constructor and the number present in here okay one of the things is i do this a number of times because you can get eclipse to do a lot of things for you and you can actually start typing the number down saying private int number and have a public constructor you can type all the code yourself that's another option but i prefer getting eclipse to do all this stuff for me and that's the reason why i first think about how to use it so always it's good to think from the perspective of the consumer who is using your class how would he use it that would help you to look at it from a different perspective and that's what we are doing in here so let's go is prime i'll say create method is prime and public boolean is prime and for now it's returning false that's cool so that's the default automated automatically generated method and now this looks okay so this is compiling so let's do a right click run as java application it would print is prime is false right so that's cool but if i pass in a prime number like 2 for example what does it say is prime is false because we are hard coding written false cool so we have some work remaining to do before that i just observed that there is a small uh, discrepancy in here so my number runner is in a loops package this is in com.in28minutes.loops i don't really like this so i can go ahead and say package com.in28minutes.loops right once i type in the package it would give me an error because the package structure which you would have in here should match the folder structure so because of that there would be an error so you can press control 1 or command 1 and you can say move my runner package to package okay now eclipse does the magic and now my number runner is now in the package com in 28 now in its loop you can delete the loops package right click delete okay now this is looking good this is better now what we want to do now is we would want to implement the is prime method so when is the number prime when it's not divisible by 2 to number minus 1 right so any number will be divisible by 1 and itself that's for sure we would want to check if from 2 to number minus 1 if the number is 10 from 2 to 9 i would want to check if they are divisible think about it how can i check if a number is divisible by 2 think about it try and pause the video in here try and think how can i check if a number is divisible by 2 what options do we have is there something that we discussed earlier okay we talked about the modulus operator earlier right so 9 mod 2 would return 1 this means 9 is not divisible by 2 same thing if i actually do 9 mod 3 it leaves a reminder 0 that means 9 is divisible by 3 right so let's make use of that fact in here so we would want to check if number mod 2 is equal to 0 if it's 0 then it's divisible if it's 0 then it's divisible then it's not a prime if number mod 2 is equal to 0 then return false right otherwise you can return true is this good enough solution okay this is not the perfect uh, implementation as such but this is kind of the starting point right so number mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 that means a uh, number is even it's divisible by 2 so it's false what we want to do is we would want to do similar checks with number mod 3 number mod 4 number mod 5 and so on and so forth so how do we do that for all the numbers i can put it in a for loop right so i can run the loop from for int i is equal to 2 to number minus 1 that's what we want to do we need to follow the syntax so i'll say i plus plus here Let's say i less than equal to number minus one in here i plus plus and we would also always want to follow the right formatting let's do this right click source format here is this good here it should be i so what we are doing in here is in a loop so we are starting with two to number minus one and we are checking if number mod i is equal to is equal to zero 
if number mod i is equal to is equal to 0 then the number is divisible by that number so if number is 9 we are starting with 2 okay is it divisible by 2 no is it divisible by 3 yes so then it's not a prime return falls back okay that's cool right so let's go ahead and now run this program and see if we are able to get it working properly so my number two it's prime that's cool my number three cool it's prime as well my number five mm -hmm, that's cool as well my number six is it prime false that's cool so what we have in here is we have implemented our first exercise is prime so we are able to check whether a number is prime or not one of the things while you do programming is you'd want to handle all the possible situations so what we'll do is if the number passed in is negative what we should do we should return that it's not a prime because negative numbers cannot be prime zero is also considered to be not a prime and also one is neither prime nor composite so what we'll have at the start is something called a guard check so what we'll say is if number less than two so if number less than two we will return a false back because it's not a prime so this is something which we typically write in all program this is called guard condition before we come into the method we would want to check if the input is valid and all the basic conditions you would want to check in here so that you would return those specific things back and then we would get into the real logic so if you return any number which is less than if you pass in any number which is less than 2 then this would be false in this video we got a quick overview of the exercises and we started with the first one which was to find out if a number is prime i'll see you in the next video where we'll be looking at a few other exercises until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's go on with the exercises that we started with in the previous video so we would want to do the next one which is sum up to n so let's copy this we would want to find the sum of numbers up to the n so if it's 9 i would want to do 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus so on up to 9 so let's get started i'll go to the my number runner and i would start with this so in sum is equal to number dot sum up to n right so uh, let's also print it in the output so sum i'll put sum up to n is sum okay so that's kind of basic so let's now as usual command one create method sum up to n so you can see that sum up to n is returning a integer number back and the default method which is created is returning a value of zero that's cool right so what we want to do is find this sum up to n so 1 plus 2 plus 3 so on up to number so that's what we would want to do so how can i do that it's easy right so we would need to put it in a for loop you're becoming an expert on this right now so i we need to start with i is equal to 1 i less than equal to n i plus plus right over here what we want to do is to do the sum so when we are doing the sum how do we store the value so the way we would be doing this is you would have sum of one sum of one plus two one plus two plus three and so on up to number and for storing that we would need to have a temporary variable before that this should have been actually number because number is what we are using in here so how do we have a sum variable here int sum and we need to initialize the value of sum to zero because that's the initial value in the sum and after that what we would want to do is we would want to each time we are looping what we want to do is add i to it so sum plus i sum is equal to sum plus i what happens when i is one sum is zero so sum one zero plus one would be into sum next the loop goes to two so zero plus one is one so one will be in sum and one plus two three will be what would be in the output if you are having difficulty understanding this logic do not worry at all try and debug this so try and put a debug point in here and go to the runner class and you can do a right click debug as a java application the code would stop in here and then you would be able to figure out what's happening in the background 
Over here, instead of 0, I would want to return the sum back. Now, let's go ahead and run this. So, you'd see that sum up to n is printing as 21, and we are passing a 6. So, 6 plus 5 plus, so 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus, plus 5 plus 6 is 21. You can verify that, that where if that's true. So, this is sum up to n. This is kind of the starting point where we are going into a little bit of more complex logic. Here we stored a temporary variable called sum and at each iteration we are adding the value of i to it. So by the end of the iterations we will have the sum of n numbers in this specific variable. Move on to the next exercise. This is called sum of divisors. So let's copy this down. My number runner. In sum of divisors, let's copy the system dot out dot println as well. Sum of divisors and sum of divisors. Let's go ahead and create the method. Control one, command one, create method sum of divisors. It's written as zero. That's cool. So now I would want to do a sum of divisors. You can try and pause the video and see if you would be able to do it on yourself. So if the number is six, then I would want to get the sum of all the divisors of 6 except 1 and 6, right? So I don't want to include 1 and 6. So first, if the input is 6, except 1 and 6, all the other divisors, which is 2, comma 3, I'd want to add them up and I would want to return 5 back, right? So how do I do that? Think about it. I can do something very similar to sum up to n, right? So I can, I'm copying the code in here for sum up to n. This is returning the sum back, so let's fix that. So this would be as it is, it's returning sum of everything. So it returns sum of 1, 2, 6, right? I don't want to include 1 and 6 in here. So I'll say i is equal to 2. I'll say i less than number because I don't want to include the number also. So if the number is 6, I would want to go from 2 to 4. Sorry, I would want to go from 2 to 5. So 2 to 1 less than the number. So that's why I made it i less than equal to number or you can say i less than equal to number minus 1. Both of the options are good. So I would want to do a sum is equal to sum plus i. But I don't want to do it for every number. So the code as it is right now would return the logic for 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, right? So if I pass in an input of 6, it adds 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. I would want to add only those numbers which are divisors of 6. How do I find out if the number is divisor of 6? Or a div I can say number mod i is equal to is equal to 0. If i is a divisor of the number, only then add it. Cool. Isn't it cool? So, what we are doing in here, we are looping from 2 to 4. If the number is 6, what we are doing is looping from 2 to 4, 2 to 5 actually, and checking if 6 is divisible by each of those. If it's divisible, if it leaves a remainder 0, then I am incrementing the sum. Let's see what would happen now. I'll run the program. You can see that sum of divisors for 6 is 5. Let's pass in a different number. Let's pass in 9. For 9, the divisors are 1, 3, and 9 itself. So we want to exclude 1 and 9. So the only other divisor is 3. So the sum should be 3. So for 9, it's 3. That's cool, right? So what we have in here is a very simple program to calculate the sum of the divisors of a number. In this video, until now, we looked at sum up to n numbers and sum of divisors. We'll look at a couple of other exercises in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Now, let's move on to the next exercise, which is the last exercise for for loop, which is number dot print a number triangle, right? So we would want to print a number triangle. If the input is 5, this is the triangle I would want to print. So think about it. So I'll copy this triangle out and let's create the method as well. So we would want to print number dot print number triangle. Okay, control one, command one, create method, please. Okay, now we are in here. So what we want to do is to print something of this kind. Let's take it step by step, right? So 
if number is 5 and I would want to print all these, how do I do that? It's very simple, right? So we write a simple for loop for i is equal to 1, i less than equal to number, i plus plus, sys out, control space, and say, oops, I've not declared i, so we have to declare it int i is equal to 1, i less than equal to number, system dot out dot println, i plus space. So I would need a space between the numbers, so I'm adding i plus space. So this is a string. So we would have the number appended to the space. So that's cool, right? So now if I run this program, if I save this, this should compile. And if I run this program, what should you see? It's printing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, because um, the number passed in here is 9. So we are using a system.out.println, which also adds a new line character. So let's remove that. So let's do just a system.out.print. What would happen? Okay, that's cool. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's what is printed. So let's make the number 5 just so that it matches our example. Okay, now when I run it, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we, up, this is getting printed. So we would want to print all these as well. How do we do that? You can pause the video and think about how would you do that. So I would want to print everything, not just this one, but I would want to print the entire triangle. How do I do that? Now, let's look at the solution. One of the ways you can do that is to use something called a loop within a loop. Now, inside here, we are running a loop from 1 to 5, right? So what we can do is actually run another loop inside here. So I would say for int j, j is equal to 1. The second loop, I would only want to run it up to i. So j less than equal to i, uh, j plus plus. This is very important. We should be very cautious about it. So the j, the second loop, I am only running it to up to i. So if i is 1, the second loop runs only up to 1. So if i is 2, second loop runs up to 2. 3, 4, and 5. So that's kind of the complete logic. So let's run this. Let's see what would happen. It's printing 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. What's happening? We don't really want this kind of stuff, right? One of the things is over here, I'm printing the value of i. Let's see what would happen if I print the value of j, right? So j is the one which is getting incremented, 1, 2. So what would happen now? So it's printing 1. It's printing 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is exactly what we want. But we would want a new line between each one of these. How do I get a new line? What would happen if I do put a system.out.println new line in here? Let's say I'm doing a sysout, system.out.println in here. What would happen? Mm -hmm. Everything is getting a new line. I don't want new line after everything. I would want new line after each one of these. So I would want to have a new line after this loop. So what I would need to do is, mm -hmm. let's give it a try now. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. That's cool, isn't it? So this is how you would print a simple triangle. And whatever we are doing in here is called a loop within a loop. So we have a for loop for i running, and inside that we have a for loop for j running as well. I would recommend you to put a breakpoint in here, go to the runner class, right click debug as Java application, and try and see what's happening in there. Go to the debug perspective and see what hap what's happening with the variety of variables in here. That's the last exercise I would leave you with for this specific series of videos on for loop. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video related to Eclipse tips, we would talk about an important feature in Eclipse, templates. Earlier in this course, we would have created the main method a number of times by saying control space, typing in main and pressing control space. And you can now choose main method. So the entire syntax for the main method is directly created for you. You can also do it with for loops, for E, and press 
control space and type in for each. Now, you can see that the entire loop syntax is generated for you automatically. The other thing which we have commonly used is sysout control space and other one is sysr control space as well. These are all the templates which are predefined in Eclipse. The interesting thing is you can create your own templates as well. Where are these templates stored? Let's go to Eclipse preferences. If you are on Windows, it might be Windows preferences or window preferences. Open up the preferences and type in templates. If you look at Java, there is a code style templates as well as editor templates. The one which we are interested in is editor templates. And over here are a wide variety of templates that are present. For example, this is R is from here. This is out is also from here. If you want to do, you can even try a few things from here. You can try if not null or if null or if else. Let's give if else a try. If else, control space. That generates the entire if block. If null, checks if something is null. If not null, you can check if something is not null. All that we need to do is type in the shortcut, press control space, and that's it. You can create your own new template as well in here. So you can actually give it a name and also go ahead and describe the pattern in here. In this video, we looked at an Eclipse feature called templates. It's very useful when you'd want to quickly type some code in. If there is some code which you are typing in multiple times, you can probably create a template for it and use it. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we talked about for loop and the puzzles related to them and the exercises related to it. Now, we'll switch to the while loop. While loop is one another kind of loop which has a syntax which is similar to a if condition. When we talked about if condition, we said the syntax of if condition is something of this kind. If condition, so if let's say I, there's a variable called i, int i is equal to zero. The syntax of if is if i greater than two, then I would want to have some code in here, system.out.println do something. Or I can say i greater than two. So this is how we have a if, because i does not have a value greater than 2, then this is not really printed. The same code, if I had a value of, let's say, 3, what would happen? If i greater than 2, what would happen? It would print i is greater than 2. The syntax of while is very similar to that of a if. So you can easily replace the if with a while, and that would form a valid while loop syntax. So I can say, let's say i has a value of 0. So while I would say i less than 5. So this is the condition. So while condition system.out.println, I'll print the value of i. So system.out.println i. One of the important differences between an if and a while is if is executed only once, but while is executed multiple times. And in the while, what we would need to do is we would need to increment the variable. So i++, plus plus, what would be the thing which is printed? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So what is happening in here? This is very simple while example. So this is while condition, the code you would want to run in the while loop. What, what's happening in here is i has an initial value of 0. So while i is less than or equal to 5. What happens? The first, the condition check executed, i is less than or equal to 5, so it has a value of 0, it's less than or equal to 5, so 0 is printed and the value of i is incremented. So i becomes 1, i becomes 2, 3, 4, and when i becomes 5, this loop would stop. So if I print the value of i now, it's 5. That's when the loop stops executing. So the code in the while is executed until this condition is true. So, if you actually put a condition which is never true in here and execute it, then this code will not execute at all. So, let's say i has a value of 6, right? So, if i has a value of 6 and I say while i less than 5, and I'm saying 
system dot print ln i and i say i plus plus as well i has a value of 6 currently so i what i'm saying is if i less than 5 is 6 less than 5 no so this code is not at all executed so if this condition is not met the code in while will not be executed at all now if i have a value of minus 2 in i what would happen the same code what do you think will be the output now think about it so i has a value of minus 2 i'm saying i less than 5 system dot out dot print ln i it will print from minus 2 oops i had to do a command c or control c to kill it there's a small bug in the code which i wrote so i said i less than 5 system dot out dot print ln i did not increment the value of i that's the reason why there's a problem so now i has a value of minus 2 now so what would happen so it prints from minus 2 to 4 until i has a value of 5 it keeps printing it so i is 5 that's when this condition stops matching so in summary while loop executes until this condition becomes true one of the important things that you need to be cautious about in a while loop is infinite loops right if i don't increment the value it would what would happen is the live loop gets executed again and again with the same value so if the i plus plus here is not there what would happen i value remains whatever it was previously if i was minus 2 before the loop it would remain minus 2 and the loop gets executed infinite number of times a good question to ask is when do you use while loops so we have for loop and we have while loop so when do you use for loop and when do you use while loop we'll discuss about the exercises as well as trying to understand when do you use while loop versus when do you use for loop in the next video until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at the exercises related to the while loop what we want to do is we would want to create a class called while number player okay very interesting name but don't worry about it you can call it whatever you want for now i'm calling it while number player so i would want to create a class called while number player the constructor of which accepts a limit so 10 is the limit or 100 is the limit 30 is the limit 50 is the limit whatever so what we want to do is print squares of numbers up to the limit for example if limit is 30 i would want to print all the squares of the numbers which are less than 30 so one square two square three square four square five square six square is 36 which is greater than the limit so i don't want to print it and over here print cubes up to limit right so i would want to print cubes of number one cube two cube three cube four cube is 4 into 4 into 4 which is 64 which is greater than the limit so that will not be printed so that's cool right so that's what we would want to do in the exercises for a while you can try and pause the video in here and try and spend some time doing the exercises on your own and you can join me on the other side when we solve these exercises okay let's get started with the solutions for these exercises as is usually the norm i'll copy this piece of code and go to eclipse and create our runner class so what we'll do is we'll create a new class i'll call this um, while number player runner while number player runner okay i did not i forgot to add the main so i can do main control space and it would be a easy way of adding the main method i'll paste the code in it would not compile so let's create the while number player so create class while number player yep this is cool i'll this is fine enter let's go back to the while number player runner and we'll create the constructor so create constructor with int so public while number so this will be the limit so i'll call this the limit and as usual this dot limit is equal to limit there is no limit in here so let's create a field private int limit that's cool so we now have compiling code hopefully this will compile so let's get to the next one so print squares up to limit create method print squares up to limit so it's a void let's not worry about it for now and let's move on to the while number player let's create this method as well create method print cubes up to limit cool now we have got our code to compile so that's the first step right compiling code 
So now I will copy these comments out to my methods. This would help me while I'm implementing them. Oops, control X and cool. Okay, one of the things I'm doing in most of these exercises is trying to think from the perspective of somebody who's using this class. That's an outside in perspective. So this will help you to design your classes much better. So when you think from outside in, you're always thinking about the consumer of your class, whoever is going to use your API. And that helps you to see how somebody will use your APIs. So this is a very good way when you are trying to design something and that's the practice which we want to get into and that's why we have designed these exercises in this specific way. I hope this becomes a practice when you are trying to develop something. Try and think how somebody would use your API. Okay, now that aside, let's get to the problem at hand. We want to print squares up to the limit. So the thing is, over here, one of the things is limit is equal to 30. So we said limit is 30, right? So let's put that in here as well. So let's say we are running the program up to 30. What we want to do is print all squares up to 30. We don't really know how many squares we would print because we don't know whether I would be printing five values, whether I will be printing six values or seven values, right? So until the square of the number is less than 30, I would want to keep printing it. At the start of execution of the loop, I have no idea how many times this loop would get executed. And that's the kind of situation in which we use a while. So now I can say while some condition is less than 30. While something is less than 30, I would want to do, right? So let's create a variable int i starting from 1. So what I would want to do is while i star i. So i star i is the square of i, right? Square of i is nothing but i into i. While i into i is less than 30, what we would want to do? We would want to sys out system.out.println i into i, right? That's basically what we would want to do. We would want to print the squares until they are less than 30. What would happen? If you run the program right now, it would go into an infinite loop because I'm not incrementing i. So let's increment i as well. So now let's see what would happen. I'll remove the new line because I don't want a new line. And let's append a space so that each of the things is separated by a space just like this in here. So let's run this right now. So let's run the while number player runner. Cool. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. That's cool, isn't it? So it's printing all the things up to the limit, up to 30. So this is kind of a very simple program. One of the things I just observed is I have hard coded 30 in here. Actually, we should not hard code 30. I would need to actually make it limit. So let's run this program again. So we will want to print up to the limit. Let's see if we are doing it properly by actually putting, uh, let's say, I would want to print all squares of numbers up to 90. Okay, cool. So it's printing up to 81. So it's printing the first nine squares. That's cool. The other exercise that we have is to print cubes up to limit, right? So how can you do that? Think about it, right? It's almost the same code. You can pause the video, try and get this code to work to print cubes up to the specific limit. How do we do that? Into i star i star. Let's run this. Okay. This is causing a little bit of a problem because this each of the methods is not printing out a println at the end. So let's do that. So println so that at the end of the method, it would print a new line. So we have added new lines in here. Now you can see these are squares and these are cubes. So we have the limit set to how much? It's to 90. And when we run this program, we see that it's actually printing up to 64 because phi cube is 125, which exceeds 90. That's cool, right? One of the important things you should be very cautious about is, is up to the limit. So should the limit be included or not? So whenever we are programming, we should be cautious about the edge cases. The edge case here is if I give the limit as 27, let's say, should I 
output 27 or not. If you have to output 27 as well, then you have to put a i less than equal to limit. So if I put 27 as the value in here, you'd see that now 27 also would be printed. So if I change the program and this is less than limit, then you'd see that 27 is not really printed. So it depends on your requirements, whether you'd want to print 27 or not, whether you would want to include the limit or not. Is, it, is the limit inclusive or not? So in this video, we looked at what kind of scenarios you would use a while loop. Typically, when we use while loop, we don't know how many times we execute the loop. So we execute the loop until a specific condition is met. Like in these examples where we have a limit and we would want to print squares up to the limits and cubes up to the limit. I hope you are having a lot of fun with the loops. We'll look at the last loop in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we looked at the while loop, right? While gets executed until the condition is true. In this video, let's get started with the do while loop. Let's understand what is the syntax of a do while loop and when do you use a do while loop, right? The syntax for a do while loop is very, very similar to the while loop. Let's check the value of i. i has a value of 5. So let's actually set it to 1. So i now has a value of 1. And if I execute the while loop right now, this while loop would print from 1 up to 4 because when the i value is 5, this condition will not be met. So similarly, you can write a do while loop as well. The syntax for do while loop is very simple. Do followed by uh, open brace and you can type in the code in here. So system.out.println i and over here we would want to do the increment. So I'm doing the increment and now over here, when you type in the close brace is when you put the condition. So while i less than 5. So the syntax is very similar to the while loop. You can see the while loop in here, right? So while i less than 5, here it's while i less than 5. The only difference is the condition check is at the bottom. So at the bottom is the condition check. And at the start, instead of this, you would have a do. So do open brace what you want to do in the loop while condition so the difference between the while loop and the do while loop is that in a while loop the condition check is at the start in a do while the condition check is at the end so now if i execute this code what would happen one two three four so while i less than five this code is getting executed right so now you might be wondering what is the difference between while and the do while both of them look very very similar right so when should i use a while and when should i use a do while now let's get to that question now let's say i has a value of 10 now i execute the while loop now so while i less than 5 system dot out dot print and and i'm doing an i plus plus what would be the output the thing is why in the while loop the condition check gets executed at the start of it so what would happen is if this condition fails, none of the code is executed. So what would have happen? Nothing is printed. The loop, this code is not even executed at least once. The same thing if I do in a do while loop, let's do that now. So do system.out.print i++ while i less than 5. i has a value of 10 right now, right? So if I do this, you can see that the loop is executed once. So i has a value of 10 so system.out.print i is executed once i is incremented and then the condition is checked so the major difference between a while loop and the do while loop is that the code in the do while loop will be executed at least once even if this condition fails is 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 not true this code is guaranteed to be executed once but in a while loop, we check the condition first. So if the condition is not true, then this code will never be executed. The answer to the question of while versus do while is you would use do while in situations where you would want the code here to be executed at least once. If you would want this code to be executed at least once, then you would go for a do while. 
in all other situations you would go for a while i'll recommend you to think about the kind of situations where you would want to use a do while think about them and in the next video we'll discuss a example program with do while until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at an exercise for the do while to try and understand it better so what we would want to do is we would want to ask user for a number so we would want to ask user okay enter a number he enters a number and what we want to do is we want to print the cube of the number so you would want to say okay cube is 125 we would want to do this repeatedly until user enters a negative number so until he enters a number less than zero we would want to keep doing this so he's entering a number five we print cube is equal to and ask him okay what's the next number three twenty seven enter a number again we are saying okay minus one and then we say thank you have fun because he's entering a negative number we end the thing here so that's basically the program that we would want to design try and think about how you do that you can pause the video in here and try the program okay let's look at the solution for this right now i'll create a new class as usual i'll call this do while repeated question runner long name for the class so it's do while repeated question learner and i would want a main method finish okay what we would want to do let's look at it so we would want to start with asking a question right so let's try and do it once so enter a number five so sys out you want to do ask enter a number right let's not do a print ln let's just do a print system dot out dot print enter a number it would allow user to enter a number in here and what we would want to do is we would want to get the number which is entered do you remember how we did get a number earlier we had to create a scanner class right so scanner scanner is equal to new scanner it's one of the util classes um, we would want to where do we want to scan from we would want to scan from system dot in so system dot out is output system dot in is input we would want to get the input from the user so system dot in let's go here and press control one command one and import java dot util dot scanner so we are adding an import in here let's go ahead and now do a scanner what are we expecting we are expecting a integer so scanner dot next int so we want to take this int and put it into a number so int number is equal to scanner dot get int and what we want to do is we would want to actually print system dot out dot print ln or i could have actually done this out i would want to print cube is and i would just plus number star number star number right so that's the cube of the number i'll just put it in brackets just to be very clear so make sure that this is the closing bracket for this and this is the closing bracket for this if you hover over there you can kind of see a small box here showing which is the matching bracket so make sure that your opening brackets and the closing brackets match and we are ready to run this program right so let's run it right click run as java application it says enter a number i would say 12 one seven two eight that's cool right so the program ends down here now what we want to do is we would want to run this in a loop right so one of the important things is i would not want to create a scanner again and again so you should not create a lot of objects the scanner i don't want to really create in a loop because once i have a scanner i can use it repeatedly so what i'll do is i'll move this code up so the shortcut is alt up arrow just press alt and press up arrow that would move the line up or the easiest way or the other way would be to do a control x control v so either of those options would work what we did is we moved the line up so now we are saying enter a number what we want to do is we want to do this repeatedly right we want to do this while the user is entering a proper number so how can we do that do while number is greater than or equal to zero 
one of the important things is this number variable is only limited to a block so it's only available in this block it's not available outside the block so what we need to do is we need to declare it in here so i'll say int number and over here i would say number is equal to scanner dot next int and only then it's available in here so i'll give it a initial value number is equal to zero so what would this do this program would repeatedly ask a number until number is greater than zero let's format it the shortcut is Control shift f or right click source and format if you go there you would be able to see the shortcut so now i would run this program let's see what it do do so enter a number 2l so cube is 1728 enter a number again 6 cube is 216 enter a number 2 cube is 8 1 cube is 1 0 cube is 0 minus 1 cube is minus 1 and the program ended what we would want to do is we don't want to print it when it's minus 1 so for the last one I don't really want to print it so what I can do is actually move this above so I can make it the first line so what would happen now if I make it the first line if you look at it right now it's saying cube is 0 and it says enter a number so it's starting with printing the cube and now if I let's say enter a 1 it prints cube of 1 2 8 and let's say 3 it prints 27 minus 2 yep it goes out and while going out I would want to print a message right so what's the message that I would want to print the message we wanted to print was thank you have fun now if I run it so you can say cube is 0 and enter a number um, I can say 10 cube 2 and now I can enter minus 1 it says thank you have fun this is cool this is now giving the interactions that I would want the only thing which is a problem is the fact that this is getting printed uh, every time so one of the things I can do is I can assign a value of minus 1 initially and if number is equal to minus 1 then and print this only if number is not equal to minus 1 so let's format this control shift F let's do this this is where things can get a little complicated when we are writing programs right edge cases so now what would happen number initially is minus 1 so it's not printed enter a number so I print 2 cube is 8 3 cube is 27 as soon as I enter an invalid number minus 1 let's say this loop stops executing because this while condition fails we get the next number and the while condition fails and it says thank you have fun so that's cool we now looked at how to use the do while to repeatedly ask for a input congratulations you have actually implemented a very simple program using a do while what we are doing in here is we are repeatedly requesting user for input one of the most important things is one of the requirements is we should ask the question at least once and that's the reason why we are using a do while instead of a while I'll see you in the next video where we'll be talking a lot more about the loops until then bye bye welcome back in the previous video we looked at loops right we looked at for loop while loop and do while loop one of the important parts of using a loop are two simple statements called break and continue so there are two statements called break and continue we'll look at examples of that and try and understand them further in this specific video so for example if I say for I is equal to 1 i less than equal to 10 i plus plus and over here i'm writing a simple if condition so i'm saying if i is equal to is equal to 5 break and after that i write a system dot out dot print ln i let's not do a print ln let's do a just a print with a space appended okay what do you think will be the output of this program in a loop I'm using a break 
what break does is it would break out of the loop if this condition is met so a break statement inside a loop would take you completely outside that specific loop so if i press enter you would see that it only prints from 1 2 3 4 so when i see a break statement what it does is while this loop is executing it says i is equal to 5 okay the condition is met so i'll break out of the loop now, try and guess the output of this program. If i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0, I'll do a break. And let's do a sysout and get out. So, what would be the output of this program? Yep, it just prints 1. Because when i is 2, this code, this condition is true. So, the thing breaks out of the loop. The other keyword is continue. So let's write a very simple program. Let's write the same program again. So now instead of break, I would say continue. What do you think will be the output of this? Instead of break, I am typing in continue. What continue does is it does not break out of the loop, but it goes on with the next iteration. All the code below it is skipped so when i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 we are doing a continue so i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 0 for even numbers so for even numbers this code is skipped so what would happen continue would take the execution to the next iteration so this i value is skipped and the next i value is picked up and the loop is executed with that so we see the difference between break and continue in here, right? Break takes you completely out of the loop. So as soon as a break happens, you get out of the loop. A continue, on the other hand, will let you continue with the loop, but the rest of the code for that specific iteration is skipped. So if I has a value of 2, that iteration is skipped, and I++ would be executed, and I will get a value of 3, and the iteration starts with the value of I as 3. Let's try an exercise. What you can try and do is try and get write a program which would print the even numbers using the same kind of logic. So I would want to print 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. I don't want to print the odd numbers. How can I do that? The same thing. However, I would do a continue if i mod 2 is equal to is equal to 1. Or I can say i mod 2 not equal to 0. If i mod 2 not equal to 0, continue and system.out.println do this so this would print the even numbers because for odd numbers we are doing a continue so all the odd numbers will be skipped and only the even numbers would be printed break and continue can make your programs little difficult to understand that's the reason why we would recommend you to try and avoid break and continue in your loops as much as possible in this video we talked a little bit about break and we talked a little bit about continue. Until the next video, bye bye. Welcome back. Until now, in this section, we looked at a variety of loops for while and do while. The important decision you make when you are writing a loop is which loop to use. In this video, let's take a quick revision of what we already discussed about when to choose which loop. Okay. So, the first question you would ask is, do you know how many times a loop would run? So, can I say it would run i times or n times or n by 2 times, n by 3 times? If you know that, then the obvious candidate to go for is the for loop. But in a lot of situations, you don't know how many times your loop would run. For example, the user is entering a list of values. So, you would want to run the loop until user enters a specific kind of values. Or the other situations might be you'd want to process a list of numbers until you encounter a negative number. You would want to process a list of numbers until you see a odd number. Or you want to process a list of numbers until you see a prime number. In all those kind of situations, you don't know how many times the loop would run. You'd want to end the loop based on a specific condition. In all those kind of situations, you would go for a while or a do while. Now, how do you choose between a while or a do while? Ask this question. 
do you want the code in the loop to be executed at least once when the condition is not met do you want the code to be executed at least once in that kind of a situation you would go for a do while in other conditions you would go for a while the important thing is actually any code that you can write with for you can write with while and you can also write it with a do while the same is the case of while and do while as well so any code you write with any of these loops you can write it with the other loops as well what really matters is the readability if you ask the right questions and choose the loop based on that your loop would be much more easier to read that's the reason why we want to choose the right loop i'll leave you with a thinking exercise right so what would be the loop you would use if i would want to use the menu from the previous section and i would want to run it again and again in the previous section we did this enter number 1 2 enter number 2 4 and we gave user a list of operations to choose from so what we did in the previous section was as soon as user enters an operation we printed result is 8 and we exited the program but now let's say i would want to go one step further i want to loop until user says 5 which is an exit so how would you implement it which loop would you use now let's ask the questions again so do i know how many times the operations would be executed at the start nope so for loop is excluded so the only thing which are left out are do while and while do i want to execute this the code in the loop at least once yes definitely because i would want to at least ask user once and if he says ex exit i would want to go out but inside the loop i would want to print the menu at least once so i would typically go for a do while in this kind of situation i hope you had an exciting time in this section i'll see you in the next section until then bye bye welcome back in this section on reference types we would discuss about what are reference types how are they stored in memory and how are they different from primitive types in the previous sections we created a number of classes and this is how we create instances right we used a new jupiter here is a reference variable planet here is a reference type and over here when we created an int variable i is a primitive variable and int is a primitive type we will discuss about all these concepts and we will go one level deeper we will talk about how reference variables and primitive variables are stored in memory what happens behind the screens when you assign a value to a primitive variable or you try to assign one value to another we will also talk about how they are initialized we will also look at a few reference types in java these are predefined in the sense that java provides them for you so they come free for you with java these are string there are a set of classes called wrapper classes and also we will look at a few date time stuff so we will look at local date and local date time i'll see you in the first video we would start discussing more about reference types and variables until then bye bye welcome back in this video we would be talking about reference types and reference variables we will understand how reference variables are stored in memory and also compare and contrast them with the primitive variables okay let's get started what is a reference type right so any class that you create is a reference type so uh, here the class planet is a reference type there are also predefined classes in java string is one of the predefined classes in java this is a reference type we looked at big decimal earlier and big decimal is a reference type instances of the classes that we create here we are creating an instance of the planet new planet and we are storing it into jupiter jupiter is a reference variable why is this concept called reference variable important and how are they different from a primitive variable here i is a primitive variable so here i am saying jupiter is a reference variable 
let's now start with discussion about how the reference variables are stored in memory and how is this new instance stored in memory let's create another class i'll call this class animal let's say in this animal class we have a int id so for each animal let's say we are assigning an id and to make it easier for ourselves i'll create a constructor if you remember the syntax of the constructor it's very simple right so the name of the class followed by the open bracket followed by what arguments i would want to pass in int id and over here i can do this dot id is equal to id and close bracket and sorry close brace and close brace that's it so we have an animal created in here uh, this animal can have a id value right so i'm not going to create getters and setters and make this private for now let's just keep it very simple now this class called animal has a field called id right so now how do i create instances of the animal class i can create it animal dog is equal to new animal and pass the parameter let's say the id i am assigning to this dog is 12 right i can create cat and assign it a value of 15. this is kind of the code that we typically write nothing fancy in here it's very simple code what is happening here is what we are really interested in now let's bring up a fancy spreadsheet to understand what's happening in the background right whenever you create a new object whenever you create a new object these things are stored in something called a heap when a java program runs it has some memory and there are two kinds of memory one is a stack and the other one is a heap all new objects are created on the heap this heap is kind of a common place which is shared by the entire java program so in this heap all your objects are stored so new animal of 12 let's say is stored in here i'll say animal 12. this is not exactly what will be stored in the memory but let's use that as a reference so animal 12 will be created on the heap heap consists of a number of locations right so i just gave some names to this location uh, let's not worry about the size of this location and all that kind of stuff because that would become very complex let's just give a name to these locations and ref use them as the reference so let's say animal 2l is stored in location 1a and animal 15 is stored in 1c it can be randomly assigned anywhere and can be stored anywhere but i'm just assuming that it's stored in a specific location on the heap now when we create primitive variables they are always created on this stack so when i create a local variable in a method it's always created in a stack so this is the way it would be stored so the variable name is i the value is 5 that's how they are stored so when i create a primitive variable all that would be stored is a variable name i with a value 5 what when i create a reference variable as we discussed earlier this is stored where is this stored this is stored on the heap now where is this stored the dog is actually stored on the stack somewhere so dog is stored the variable name is dog and what would the value dog is referring to what new animal of 12 so what is the location animal of 12 it's at 1a so the value which would be stored in here is the memory location so in the dog what is actually stored is a reference of the memory location where the actual dog object is stored that's the most important concept and that's why it's called a reference variable it's called a reference variable dog is called a reference variable because does it have the value of the dog nope it refers to the memory location of where the dog object or the animal object exists in memory similarly the other variable cat so now cat how does the cat get created what's the id 15 right so 15 1 c 
So this is how reference variables are stored in memory. The actual object is created on the heap and what would be stored in here is a reference to the location where the object is stored in memory. This distinction is the reason why a difference between primitive and reference variables is very very important. In the next video, let's dig a step deeper and look at what would happen when I assign a primitive variable to another and what would happen when I assign a reference variable to another. And also look at a wide variety of other operations. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a variety of puzzles related to the reference variables. We'll try and understand in depth about the reference variables, different concepts like equality of reference variables, initialization of reference variables, and assigning reference variables. Let's look at all of them in this video. Let's get started. Let's say I'm just saying animal nothing and creating this. What would be the value which is assigned to nothing? As you can see, it's null. And how is this stored? The way nothing is stored is because we did not create anything, nothing is created. And in here, the value which is stored is null. That basically means it does not have a memory location present. So it's empty. It's kind of empty. Null refers to empty. So null here means it's not referring to anything. It's a reference variable. But as of now, nothing is referring to nothing. I would want to store the reference to cat in nothing. What would happen? I'll say nothing is equal to cat. Now, you can see that you can see the memory location here is same as this, right? When I do nothing is equal to cat, what happens is where is cat stored? 1c that gets copied into into the memory location of nothing so basically we are not doing anything with the object so when we are saying nothing is equal to cat what is happening is the from the cat reference variable the location of where the cat object is stored that is getting copied into nothing that's basically what is happening in here so if i say nothing dot id is equal to 10 what would be the value of cat.id? What do you think would be the value of cat.id? It's also 10. Because the way it would work is nothing.id. Nothing is referring to which object? Nothing is referring to 1c. So what would happen? Here, the object at 1c would be changed. So I am changing the value of it to 10. So what would happen? This value becomes 10. The value inside the object becomes 10. 10. So now the value which is pointed to by cat is also referring to the same thing. So it has a value of 10. This is very important concept to understand, right? When we copy reference variables, when I say nothing is equal to cat, what gets copied is the memory location where the cat is stored. That gets copied into nothing. Let's say now I would say dog is equal to nothing. What would happen? If, say, if I say dog is equal to nothing, 1c gets copied into 1a. I'll not do that. What I'll do is I'll say nothing is equal to dog. What will happen now? Nothing is equal to dog, right? So what would happen? The memory location of dog gets stored into nothing. Now, if I say nothing.id, whose id is printed? Nothing.id would print the id of the dog, 1a12, right? So let's print. It's printing 12. So it's very important to understand what's happening in the background so that you'd be able to exactly know what's happening in here. However, in the case of primitive variables, what would happen if I say int j is equal to i? What would happen? j gets a value of 5, right? So j is created with a value of 5. And even if I change the value of j, the only thing which gets modified is j. So with the case of primitive variables, what you are storing here is the value. So if I type in i, I would still have a value of 5. However, with the case of reference variables, what we are storing is the memory location. When I copy a reference variable, what gets copied is the reference 
to the memory location where the actual object is getting stored. Now, let's say i is equal to is equal to j. What would happen? i is equal to is equal to j, it's say false because i has a different value as j. Now, let's say I copy the value of j is equal to 5, right? So, i and j now have same values. So, if I say i is equal to i is equal to j, what would happen? It has a value of true, right? Now, let's take the case of the reference variables. Let's try and recreate the same objects again. So, let's say animal dog is equal to new animal of dog is referring to 1a, 12, right? So, let's create exactly the same way and cat earlier was referring to let's say 1c10 right so let's say it's 10 cat is referring to here uh, we need to create nothing instead of nothing i will call it ref just a ref so i'll say animal ref and what i'll do in here is i'll assign the reference to cat what ref stores is the reference to the cat. So, 1, C. I'll also create another dog, 2. Let's say it also has the same value for the ID. Right? So, we are creating another dog, 2, which will have animal 12. So, let's say it's stored here, animal 12. And we are calling this dog 2. And this is lo at location 1, E. Right? So, very simple. Now, over here, let's now try the is equal to is equal to operator, right? So, cat is equal to is equal to dog. What do you think would be the output? False, because they are not referring to the same object, right? That's cool. Uh, cat is equal to is equal to ref. Yep, they returns a true because they are pointing to the exactly the same object, right? So, this is the same object they are referring to. However, the interesting thing is dog is equal to is equal to dog too. What do you think will be the output? It says false. Even though they have the same values, that does not matter. What is important is the objects they are referring to. The object they are referring to are different. So here we are referring to a different object and here we are referring to a different object. On the heap, we are referring to two different objects. So here 1a and 1e. Even though the values are the same, but their locations on the heap are different. They are distinct objects on the heap. So, the important thing to understand is when we are comparing reference variables using is equal to is equal to, what we are just comparing is if they are referring to the same object. If they have references of two different objects, it does not matter even if the values are the same. The answer would be false. The important thing to understand here is the is equal to is equal to operator for a primitive variables compares the values. But for reference variables compares if they are referring to the same object. If they are not referring to the same object, it would return false. In this video, we discussed how a reference variable is stored in memory. What would happen when I assign a reference variable to another? And also, how do you compare equality of reference variables? We learned that a reference variable if you do not assign it a value, then it has a value of null. And we also learned that the reference variable points to a location of memory where the actual object is stored. And when we compare reference objects, what we are comparing is if they are pointing to the same object. Dog is equal to cat only if they are pointing to the same memory location. Cat is equal to ref only if they are pointing to the same memory location. And when we are assigning a reference variable to another, what gets copied is the reference of where it is stored in memory. The object does not get copied. All that gets copied is the reference. So, if I say dog is equal to ref, this 1c gets copied into this location. That's all. The actual object is not really affected. We'll talk about these concepts much more when we talk about garbage collection in a future section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous sections and also the little bit of this section until now, we have created classes, created methods in them, created instances of these classes called objects, and we invoked methods on these objects. We also learned about primitive data types, 
versus the reference types. From this video on, we would start exploring the inbuilt reference types in Java. In the next set of videos, we would be starting to look at string wrapper classes and also a few reference types to refer to dates. In this video, let's start with the basics of the string class. Let's start with a simple question. We created a number of literals like this. Within double quotes, we said this is representing text. One interesting thing to note about this strings is actually this is an instance of a class called string. How can I prove that? All that you need to do is to say test.length. Oops, I'm a little too early. I just need to log in into JShell first. So let's log into JShell before I would be able to execute the command. So now I can execute test dot length. I'm in JShell right now and it's printing four. This test string has four characters. Length is a method and test is an instance. Instance of what class? In Java, text is represented by a class called string. If I want to store str, as a test this is how we would do that so string str is equal to test creates an instance of the test and stores the reference of it in str string is very very special all the other objects you would need to do something like a new big decimal right so when we did big decimal we said big decimal bd is equal to new big decimal of let's say 1.0 so we needed to use a constructor to create it however with string you don't really need to use a constructor even though if you would want str is equal to you can do new string of test you can do that but that's not really necessary all that you need to do is string str is equal to test and that's more than sufficient string is a special class in java this test is an instance of the class string. This is called a string literal. We looked at the basic method which is present in here, length. We'll start looking at a few other methods which are present in this string class to retrieve the details about a specific string, right? So in string, the index starts with zero. So this is zero, this is one, t is one, s is two, and t is three. So if you want to get a specific character, so let's say I would want to get the first character of a string, the way I would need to do that is by saying string dot char at zero. The important thing is the index starts with zero. So zero, one, two, and three. So let's quickly check another one string dot char at two. It returns S. Zero is T, one, and two is S str dot char at three that's the last character it's let's say i don't want to retrieve one character but i would want to retrieve a substring from this particular string let's create a more bigger string so bigger string is equal to this is a lot of text so let's say i have this text in here and from this i would want to get the substring starting from is right so i would want to get all the characters starting from here how can i do that doing that is called a substring substring methods accepts the index of this character so we need to pass in the index of this character and it would be able to print the rest of the strings so let's do bigger string dot i would want to do it from i so 0 1 2 3 4 and five so bigger substring of five so it's printing is a lot of text right so that's how you do a substring i'm trying to get a part of this string here we are specifying the start of this string but you can also specify start and end also so i'm specifying five as the start and i can specify okay this is five i would want to get up to six seven eight 9, 10, 11, 12. So let's say I would want to get up to t. t is at index 12. So 
if you want to get up to character with index 12 then you need to enter 13 so the important thing to understand is this side is inclusive this is exclusive so this index is not really included so the character at index 13 will not be part of the substring so the character at index 13 if we do it so if i do str.caret 13 you would see that it returns a space back oops i should have actually done bigger string dot caret 13 so bigger string dot caret 13 it prints a space out so this is the space which is present at character 13 and that is not included in this string because this is exclusive so starting from the character at index 5 to 12 so it's when i pass in a 13 only the character up to index 12 would be included in the substring i'll recommend you to try and play around with these things caret substring and see what you can find one interesting aspect is if you try and give a index out of the range of the string so let's say the string is length 5 and you give an index of 15 then it would throw a string index out of bounds exception exceptions are java's way of telling you okay buddy as a programmer you're doing something wrong i'm throwing you an exception how can i get the 10th character in a string of length 5 that's wrong that's an exception the same kind of exception would happen with char it if you do something invalid and the same thing would happen with substring also so if i say char at 456 456 is an invalid index so it would throw you a index out of bounds exception okay in this video what we looked at is number one we looked at the fact that every string literal is an instance of a class this is the only type of literal which is a instance of a specific class and also we discussed the fact that string is a special type in the sense that we did not really need to do a new string to create an instance of this string all that you need to do is str1 is equal to some string and java would automatically create an object for you this is something unique to string and also we looked at and also we looked at a few important methods substring and char at at the end of this video we were introduced to a simple concept called exceptions which we will discuss a lot more in a separate section on exceptions i'll leave this video with an exercise so let's say i have a string right so let's say i have a very simple string string some string is equal to this is a lot of text again what i would want to do is write some code in here which would print individual characters on separate lines so the output should be t on one line h on next line i on next line s on next line and so on and so forth we'll discuss the solution in the next video until then bye bye welcome back in this video we will talk about some more methods on the string class before we discuss about the methods on the string class let's pick up the exercise from the previous video we have a string and we would want to print each of the individual characters on separate lines right if you are able to do it already that's cool if you are not i'll give you a hint right now so how do i find out the length of this string some string dot length right this gives you that it's 27 the index of this string would run from 0 to 26 length minus 1 I would want to print individual characters at each of those locations. Okay, did an idea strike you? Try and pause the video and try and work it out. Okay, if it did not, then another clue. How do I find out what is specific character at a specific location? From string dot char at five. This gives me the character at index five, which is i right so zero is this so starting with that if you start counting this will be five so it gives me a character five so now does this strike you do you think you can solve this on yourself try and pause the video and try it okay now the solution is very simple right so i is equal to zero i less than some string dot length so i'm running a loop from i zero to one less than the length so from 0 to 26 in this specific example 
and I plus plus and all that we need to do is system dot out dot println and what should we do what should we print some string dot care at I isn't this cool okay you can see all the characters printed on individual lines this is a lot of text again so all that we did is very simple we created a loop starting from zero I mean from zero to length minus one and we incremented I and we printed the character at that specific location isn't that cool okay now let's move on to what we want to discuss in this specific video let's take the same string from the previous example and now I would want to find out if a specific string is present in this so I would want to see if a word called lot is present in this specific string how do I do that the way I can do that is by using a some string dot index of index of and pass in the string what does it is written it returns the starting index of L so it returns 10 so if I do a some string dot care at 10 it would return me L so this is returning the index of L so it's searching for lot in the string and returning the index of the first character of this substring now let's say I would want to search for a character so I'm not searching for a string but a character so let's say I'm searching for I how can I do that care at the same name this is an overloaded method which accepts a character parameter and this returns the index of this because that's the first I oops actually I should use index of right so it's not caret I should use index of I so it returns two so index of is the same method it's an overloaded method and we would use index of to find the index of a string or substring as well as a specific character so I in this string is at location index two now you might want to find out what is the index of the last I which is present in here you can do that to very easily using last index of last index of and this returns 25 one thing you should be careful about is the camel casing so index of O is caps caret A is caps index of last index of I and O are caps so be careful about the camel casing of these methods the name should exactly match you cannot use a different case that applies to anything in Java it's case sensitive except for whatever is going in your literal characters or literal strings the other functions in string help you to check a few things on this string so let's say I want to find out if this string contains a word called again how can I do that I can do use index of but the other option is to do some string dot contains so if I want to present I want to check whether a text is present so I just need to say text and you can see that it returns true I would want to find out if this string starts with a specific string I can say some string dot starts with this this would return true the same thing if I give some other thing it would return a false back the same similar method is ends with so ends with let's say some garbage it returns false if I give the right string so ends with in yes ends with ain yes ends with again yes if I do something wrong false so you can use this to find out if a string ends with or starts with a specific substring the last utility method is to check if a string is empty so you can check if a string is empty by using the some string dot empty actually it is is empty okay so some string dot is empty returns if it's empty or not so any string which has some content is not empty however this string is empty so that's the is empty method the last useful method inside string to check the content is 
equal so you want to find out whether two strings are equal then you can say true dot equals true so this is string so or you can say some value is equals some value so you can also use a string variable on the other side so i can say string str is equal to value and i can say oops string i said str str it should have been string str is equal to value and i should say str dot equals value it would return true so if i want to compare if two strings are equal i can use either equals or if i want to compare them without worrying about the case so for example this value has a capital thing if i do this it would return false because this is caps and this is small but if you want to ignore the fact that that you can say equals ignore case value and it returns true so it ignores the case it does a kind of an upper case on both of this and check whether they are same so in this video we looked at the exercise from the previous video we wrote a simple loop up to the length of the string and we printed all the characters by using caret after that we looked at a variety of methods in the string api to find out specific things from your string whether it starts with specific thing ends with something whether it has a specific substring present in it using contains and how do you compare a string with another string we talked about equals and equals ignore case methods one important thing is we have not really tried to modify the content of the string until now in the next video we would start trying to modify the value of a specific string until then bye bye welcome back you would have heard a number of times that string is immutable that means the value of string cannot be changed is that really true yep it is true so in this video let's explore that a little bit further and look at other ways of getting a modified string from a specific string okay now let's type in a simple piece of code string str is equal to in 28 minutes and let's say i'm concatenating str dot concat is awesome okay some self praise there but i guess you can ignore that so what we are doing is str str dot concat is awesome concat is a function to concat a string content of that specific string with another string so here it's we said in 28 minutes is awesome because there's no space either at the end or here it's becoming like a single word i would try and print the content of str what do you think the content of str would be aha it's in 28 minutes so the thing is the content of str has not really changed so even though i'm calling str.concat is awesome the str remains the same what it does is it returns another string so string another string is equal to str dot concat this time let's be very careful i'll give a space and say awesome now what would happen you can see that another string is assigned this value and if i print str it's in 28 minutes so whenever i'm trying to modify a value of a string what we are doing is not really modifying that specific string so if I'm doing str.concat for a specific string, what we are doing is we will create a new string and return it back. The original string remains unaffected. So str remains in 28 minutes. We are creating another string with the value of the new concatenation. So let's say now I would say string, instead of calling another string, I'll say string2 is equal to another string. I feel that there is uh let's say i would want to append a dot i'm saying string 2 is equal to another string dot concat what happens is a new string is created string 2 with in 28 minutes is awesome with a dot but if you type in str it remains in 28 minutes if you type in another string 
it remains this and if I type in string 2 the value is with a dot this behavior of a string class is called immutability once an instance of a string class is created with a specific value you will never be able to change the value of that specific variable this in 28 minutes will always remain in 28 minutes if you try and execute a method on it it would create a new string but the original value remains as it is it remains in 28 minutes okay now that we discussed this in great detail let's focus on the other methods that are present in string class to get modified values from the string class let's start with the simple strings in 28 minutes is awesome let's assign that so now we have a new string in 28 minutes is awesome and let's say i would want to make it all uppercase how do i do that you can have a function called to uppercase in 28 minutes is awesome and similar to that guess what is the function to do a lowercase yeah you are right it's lowercase let's say there is some space at the end of a string and the start of a string let's say there's a string called str2 um, there is some space at the start and some space at the end and i would want to remove that how do i do that str2 dot trim it removes spaces at the start of a string and at the end of the string in this video what we looked at is the fact that string class is immutable any instance of a string class once it's created in memory the content of that cannot be changed we looked at all the different operations which are present in string like to uppercase to lowercase trim and concatenate which would help us to get a new string with a modified value of an existing string I'll see you in the next video where we'll be talking about a few more utility methods in this string class. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a few more utility methods which are present in the string class as well as we would discuss something very important called concatenation operator. Let's start with the concatenation operator which is plus, right? So we looked at 1 plus 2, what would the value? It would return 3. The same thing if I do strings, what would be the output? Think about it, it's 2L. So it actually just concatenates 1 with 2 and returns it back. Let's say one of these is a string and the other one is number. Will the value change? Nope, it is 1 plus 2. So if the number is 23, let's say, it's 123. However, just 1 plus 23 would return 24. So if there is a string in one of the operands, then what would happen is it becomes concatenation plus behaves as if this is a concatenation so one is concatenated to two three so one two three however there are no strings one plus 23 is returning back 24. if i have one plus two plus three what would the result right it's printing 33. let's try a different thing let's say I don't do this, but I would do this. Mm -hmm. 123. That's interesting, right? So why is this happening? The way expressions are evaluated in Java are left to right. So left starts with 1. So 1 plus 2 is 3. So this is performed as an integer operation. So any normal, any operation between two integers is a integer so 1 plus 2 will return 3 however once there is 3 the result of this is 3 once we have the result now it's 3 plus string 3 then it becomes concatenation so that's why it's 33 in this case let's start from the left 1 plus 2 is 1 is a string 2 is an integer so the result is a string so 1 plus 2 becomes concatenation 12 and 12 is a string again to that we are appending 3 so 123 so the rules of concatenation are very simple it executes from left to right and if you see two integers as part of the operation it would be addition if you see one string and one integer it's concatenation if it's both strings then it's concatenation as well okay that's how we would do a lot of our printing right so whenever we did system.out.println we were using plus right so if i have an integer variable let's say int i is equal to 20 
I can do system dot out dot println value is and we said plus 20 right so this is how we did it values 20 is printed this is because of the concatenation operator string and int string and int it becomes concatenation so if I'm doing plus 20 what would be the result value is 20 20 it's just concatenation try a puzzle right so if you want enough I would want to print 40 what can I do what can I do is put it in brackets once you put it something in brackets the brackets get priority so value is 40 let's look at a few other utility methods which are present in the string class so this is a static method which is present in string this is join method a lot of scenarios you would want to append comma to a list of numbers right so if I want a string with 2 comma 3 comma 4 so I can do something of this kind this returns the first character is what character you want to join with and rest is a list of strings that you would want to append so 2 comma 3 comma 4 so if I just have lesser number values let's say 35 or A let's say this is B and this is C it prints A comma B comma C and if there is only one it just prints A if there are two it would start appending a comma so this is a very useful utility thing when you would want to separate the different values inside a string using a comma the last utility method is to replace so let's say in this string I would want to replace a specific character so I can say replace character a with character Z what would be the output Z B C D or you can say even replace a string right so replace a B with X Y Z so it becomes X Y Z C D that's cool right so what we are doing is trying to explore the string API's one of the important things is trying to discover and understand the API's might become little boring after a while there are so many different methods that are present that it's impossible to remember all of them I think the way you can look at it is try to understand what are the possibilities that are there what are the possible operations that are present you don't really remember need to remember all the method names that are present if you are unable to find out what is the right method to do something you can just say let's say I have a string variable right str is equal to 25 or some text right I can just say str dot and it would show you all the different operations which are present on that specific string so you can try and research that method further and see if that matches your needs and also there would be a few static methods which are present so you can type the class name and press dot and press tab and that would print all the static methods that are present in there we have not really discussed every method which is present in there because that means we will be spending the entire course just discussing the string API but the idea was to capture the essentials and give them to you and at any other point if you would want to find out whether such kind of feature is there you can just type in sti dot or string dot and find out what are the other options which are present the other way you can do to explore the API is to type in javadoc and type in the class you would want to explore and say which version so I would want to look at the string class in Java 9 I would want to look at the javadoc for it you can take this and this should show the entire documentation for this string class so as you can see in here it says the string class represents character strings all string literals in Java programs such as ABC are implemented as instances of this class and if you look at it it says strings are constants their values cannot be changed after they are created right we'll talk about string buffers later but the idea is you can actually look at the documentation in here let's say you would want to explore a specific method what it does concat what it does you can just click the method and look at examples down there as well so one of the things I would recommend you to do is try and look at the API's and try and understand the different methods which are present it's impossible to remember all the API's so try and get an awareness of what can be done and whenever the need arises you go and search the documentation to find the right methods until the next video bye bye welcome back in this quick video we would want to look at a couple of alternatives for the string class one of the problems with the string class is string is immutable 
So as soon as I create a string like this, let's say I'm doing one, two, three, plus one, two, three, plus four, plus one, two, three, four, five, six. Think about how many strings we are creating. So this creates the entire concatenated string. So when we are doing this operation, what we are doing is we are creating individual string instances for one, two, three, and four. So four values in here because the concatenation runs from left to right. First, these two are concatenated and one, two, three plus one, two, three becomes one, two, three, one, two, three. So this is the fifth instance. And after that, another instance concatenating all these three and sixth instance and then a seventh instance. So just to do a simple concatenation, we had to create seven instances of this string, right? The first four are definitely needed because those are values, but there are three additional instances of objects that are being created. And that's a very costly operation. Creating objects is very, very costly. If this is the case, if it's four simple strings, but imagine the case when I have to append 200 strings, how many useless objects would be created? To avoid that, Java provides another class called string buffer. So string buffer is another class in Java, which you can use to create strings. However, string buffer is not as easy to use as a string, right? So if it was a string, I can just say this, oops, that's not allowed with a string buffer. You have to actually use new string buffer of test. The important thing is string buffer is mutable. That means if I do a sb dot, let's say, append and say append one two three and i'll leave a space in here what would happen sb value also gets changed so sb new have sb has the new value right now so the value inside this string buffer is changing so it's actually saying test one two three sb dot set care at let's say i would want to replace this character with a small e so I can say char at index is one comma e. Now, if I do sb, it would show test one two three because we have replaced this character. One thing you would notice that with string buffer is that we are actually changing the value inside the string buffer. So that's an important thing. So in string buffer, you can actually change the values. Whenever you do a lot of concatenations, it's preferred that you would use a string buffer. There is another class which is offered in Java, which is called String Builder. String Builder is very, very similar to uh, String Buffer, but it's offered in the later versions of Java because String Buffer is a synchronized class. What does that mean? That means that String Buffer is a class uh, which is ready for multi-threading. But if you are ready for multi-threading, it means that there is a penalty which is imposed on you. That means when you're running in a single threaded scenarios where you don't really need all the complexities around multi-threading, string buffer might get really slow. And in those kind of situations, you can use string builder. We would talk about multi-threading and all that kind of stuff a little later in this course in a separate section. But for now, you can think that if you don't really worry about multi-threading, then you can use a string builder. So instead of a string buffer, you can use a string builder. So I can say string builder sb is equal to new string builder with your string. If you further explore the APIs of string buffer and string builder, you would see that there are variations in the methods that they offer and things like that. But effectively, the thing which you need to remember is this. If you are concatenating a lot of strings and creating a lot of instances of strings, then it's recommended to go for the alternatives, either the string builder or the string buffer. If you don't worry about multi-threading, then you would really be advised to go with the string builder class. If you want your code to be thread safe, then you would go for the string buffer class. We'll discuss more about multi-threading when we encounter that in a subsequent section. In this video, we discuss the alternatives to string, string builder and string buffer and things like that. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we would start discussing about wrapper classes. We'll try and understand what are wrapper classes and also we would discuss about why do we need wrapper classes. What are wrapper classes? 
So we know that there are a lot of primitive variable types that we have already discussed about, right? So Boolean, byte, char, double, float, int is the one which we used frequently, long and short. The thing is, in Java, there are corresponding classes for each of these primitive types. So these classes are called wrapper classes because they are like a wrapper around this value. So if I take int, the wrapper class is integer. All the other ones are exactly the same name. So boolean, boolean, except for char as well. So char is character. So the wrapper class for char is character, for int is integer, and all the others is just the same name with a capital alphabet starting off. This is how your wrapper classes are. Now, the question might be, okay, if I have primitive values, why do I really need a wrapper class? Why do I need a wrapper class? The thing about wrapper classes is they offer you a lot of options, additional options. Let's say I would want to create a Boolean value from a string or I would want to create an integer value from a string. You can do that using wrapper classes. The other things that wrapper classes provides are a number of utility methods. So let's say I have a float and I would want the integer value of that specific float. I can use an int value method. Let's say I want to convert a string which is in binary format. So binary is zero and ones. So let's say I have a string in the binary format and I would want to convert it into integer representation. There are a lot of utility methods like this which are offered by the wrapper classes. And also wrapper classes allow you to store primitive values into a collection. We'll talk about collections a little later. If you want to add anything to a collection, it must be an object. And wrapper classes provide the objects around these primitives. Don't really worry if you are not able to understand these methods. We will discuss them in detail a little later. The idea behind this video was to introduce you to the concept of wrapper classes and understand why do we need wrapper classes. We'll discuss about each of these wrapper classes and some of the important methods which are present in them in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's discuss how do you create wrapper classes? Creating wrapper classes is very, very simple, right? So just like you create an int i is equal to five. Let's say I would want to create an integer with similar things. I'll say integer, integer is equal to new integer of five. Now, that's how we would create it, right? So now an integer value is created with a value five. Now, let's say I'm creating another integer, integer one with five. So now integer and integer one are having the same value five. This is one way of creating integers. The other way of creating integer values is by using something called value of. There's a static method in each of the wrapper classes called value of, and I can say value of five. And I can say integer one, is equal to value of. So these are the two ways you can create wrapper classes. Directly use the constructors or you can use the value of methods which are present. These are static methods which are present in each of the wrapper classes. If you look at the integers constructor, it can also accept string values, five, two, three, four. So you can do that as well. So you can pass in a string and create an integer based on that. You might be asking, if I have two ways of creating wrapper classes, which one should I use? Which one of these is a better way to create wrapper classes? To understand that further, let's dig in. So integer, let's say I'm creating i1 is equal to new integer of 5. Let's create i2 also using new integer of 5. Same value, I'm creating two integers. I would use integer.value of right now. So I'll call this i3 and do integer.value of 5. Now let's do an i4 with the same thing. Now I'll do i1 is equal to is equal to i2. If you remember this, this is a reference type. This is a reference variable. For reference variables, is equal to is equal to does not compare the value. It compares where they are stored in memory. So i1 is equal to i2, they have the same value, but it's false. But if I do i3 is equal to i4, 
Aha, it returns true. One of the important things is just like string class, all the wrapper classes are also immutable. So that means once a value is assigned to them, you cannot change it. Over here, what is happening is for i1, a new integer variable is getting created and i2, another integer variable with the same value is getting created. What integer dot value of does is, okay, why do I need to create another instance of the same value? It would check and reuse if there is an existing object of the integer with the same value. If it finds another object with the same value, it would try and reuse and it would return the same thing back. That's okay because the value of that object will not change. Integer is immutable. You cannot change the value of it. So having two reference variables pointing to the same object is not a problem at all. What we would recommend is to use integer.value of or the value of methods to create any of the wrappers because value of tries and reuses whatever objects are already created. So it does not create a new object every time. When you use a new, you are creating a new object every time. However, integer.value of does not do that. It would try and reuse existing objects which are present inside the heap. Similar to the integer, there are float functions which accept a double, which accepts a float and also a string. So you can use all these constructors as well as you have a character constructor which accepts a character and a boolean constructor which accepts a boolean as well as strings. So for a string it accepts true, capital true, capital false, I mean you can use true in any case. So it would be able to use that and create a value for it. So for this the value is true, for this also the value is true and for this the value is false. And if you try and do something else, some string, then it would create a value of false. So these are the different things which are present. You can also use the same kind of stuff with the value of on each of these wrapper classes. I'll recommend you to try all that stuff as an exercise. Creating those wrapper classes will not be any different from creating the integer wrapper class that is present in here. In this video, we looked at how to create wrapper classes using a constructor and also value of. The same kind of wrapper classes for integer exist also for all the other wrapper classes. In the next video, we'll learn about more ways that wrapper classes can help you. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we would talk about one of the new features in Java 5, which is called auto boxing, which allows you to write code with primitive values, but compiler does a lot of work for you and converts them into wrappers. And also we would look at a few constants that are defined inside these wrapper classes. Let's get started with this concept called auto boxing. So I said the way you would create a wrapper class is by saying integer seven is equal to integer dot value of seven, right? So this is the way we were creating wrapper classes until now, but this is too long a way because you can do this as well. What is happening in here is auto boxing. What happens is when you do this, Java in the background would do this integer.value of and create an instance of it and put the reference of it in seven. This feature in Java is called auto boxing. The important thing is auto boxing uses integer.value of and we know that integer.value of uses all the things again. So if I create something like seven again, and is equal to seven, because these are using integer.value of, you would see that these are referring to the same variable. So if I say seven is equal to seven again, you'd, you'd see that the value is true. Autoboxing uses integer.value of, the existing objects, the existing wrapper class objects are reused. And you can see that the same reference is present in both seven, and seven again. Autoboxing is a very important thing. At later stage, we would also look at how do we use autoboxing to add primitive values to a collection. Features like this are called syntactic sugar, right? Who, who wants to type in the extra characters? I'm a lazy guy and so I guess it would be you. So we don't really want to type in a lot of code and that's where features like autoboxing would really help. Having looked at all these features, on the wrapper classes, 
The last thing which we want to talk about wrapper classes is the different constants which are defined on each of these wrapper classes. So if you look at the wrapper classes, they have a max value. It indicates what max value can an integer hold. They also have a min value. What is the minimum value that an integer can hold? If you want to find the size of an integer, you can do that as well. And you can get the size in bytes as well. So size is in bits. So this is 32 bits and this is 4 bytes. These kind of constants are present on all the wrapper classes. In this video and the previous sets of videos, we looked at wrapper classes. We looked at the fact that they are immutable. We looked at the fact that there are a wide variety of features that these wrapper classes offer. And we looked at the fact that we should always use value of instead of using new with the wrapper classes. We also looked at the various constants that are present in this wrapper classes like max value, min value, size and bytes, which would help us get more information about what kind of values you can store into these wrapper classes. I'll see you in the next video. We would start discussing about a brand new topic. Until then, bye-bye. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Until now, we looked at various kinds of data types, right? We looked at integers, floating point values, we looked at booleans, we looked at characters, we looked at strings. The only data type which is missing until now is dates, right? So in this video, we would start exploring dates. Before Java 8, one of the constant problems with Java APIs is the implementation of date they did not really have a good date API. And that's where a new implementation for dates is provided in Java 8. The new implementation was based on something called Joda framework. So this Joda was a very famous alternative to the Java API for dates. And Java 8 brought in some of the important concepts from Joda into the Java API itself. So we'll use that API will use the API which is introduced in Java 8 to discuss about dates in this specific video. Java 8 brings in three most important classes. So local date, local date time, and local time. These are the three classes which makes playing with date and time very easy. So what is local date, what is local date time, and what is local time? So date can hold a date. So 10th October 2017, 15th December 2015. So local date can hold a date. Local time, on the other hand, can hold just the time. So it can hold the time saying 23.25. That stands for 11.25 p.m. Or it can say 1.25, so 1.25 a.m. Local date time can store both the date and the time. So it can store things like, okay, 11.25 p.m. on 10th December of 1985. Let's start exploring the API with local date. If I say local date nav is equal to local date, there's a method called nav. This would fail. Now, why is this failing? Think about it. What could be the reasons why it's failing? Local date is in a package called java.time. One of the important things is JShell provides a few default imports. So if I do a slash imports, it would show the default imports. That's the reason why we were able to use the big decimal class, the string class without having a problem because it was in the packages which are in the default imports. However, this package java.time.localdate is not in the default imports, so we need to import it in. So I'll say java.time.localdate. Local date is now imported. Now I'll execute the same statement. And now you'd see that the local date instance is now created. You can see the value of it being printed in here. It's saying 2018, 02, and 01. The same thing if I want to do with local date time, what would happen? Think about it. Local date time dot nav. Error because we have to import that as well. So local date time. The other option is to import everything together. So star. Right? 
So now I would be able to do a local date time dot now. So the difference between local date and local date time, as you can see in here, is local date time represents both date and time, whereas local date only represents the date. And if I do a local time, it represents only the time. And you can see the different details that are stored in here. In the next video, we will start exploring all these three APIs a lot more. Until then, bye-bye. In this video, let's get started with the local date. Local date today is equal to local date dot nav. Make sure that you have the import in place because if you don't have the import, so you need to have the java dot time dot start in your imports. So if you restart JShell, you need to again import it in. So import java dot time dot start. That's when you would be able to local date today is equal to local date dot now. And you can see that it's printing the today's date. So 2018, 02 and 01. One of the important things about the local date is offers a lot of ways of getting information about this date. So once we have created today, now I can get a lot of information about today. Let's look at those methods now. So let's say I would want to get the year. I can say get year and print 2018. I want to get day of week. It's printing Thursday. So it's press, it says today is a Thursday. And if I want day of month, so that prints one because today is the first day of February. So today's date is first February. And if I want to print day of year, it prevents, it prints 32 because today is the 32nd day of the year. So you can see that there are a number of methods which help you get information about the specific date. So I'm able to get which day of the year, which day of the month, which day of the week, and all that kind of information just by creating a simple variable using the now static method. You can also get details about the month, it's February, and if you want the number, you can get, get month value, which would return to. So those are all the important methods in the API, which would help you get information about the specific date. Now, you might sometimes want to get some more generic information, right? Whether the year is a leap year. How many days are there in that specific year? How many days are there in that specific month? The cool thing is Java 8 Datetime API provides you all that stuff very easily. So if I want to find out is leap year, all that I need to do is today dot is leap year. Nope, it's false. So I am right now in 2018, which is not really a leap year, right? So it returns false. I can find more information about it. So you can say today dot length of year. So how many days are there in the current year? 365. I can say length of month, 28. So these methods help you get meta information about the year or the month we are in. How many days are there in the month? How many days are there in the year? Whether it's a leap year and things like that. And also, the date API provides ways to add number of days or number of months or number of years to your date. So I would want to find out what is the date after 100 days. So I can say today dot plus days 100. What's the date after 100 days? It says 2018-05-12, right? So it says 12th May 2018 is plus 100 days from now. You can also do plus months. So plus months of 100. So 100 months from now is 1st of June, June 2026. Or you can even do plus years. 100 years from now. Okay, I will not be allowed alive then. So 2118. These are all the methods you can use to add days or months or years to your date. And you can also have subtraction, right? So today dot minus years 100 or minus months and minus days. So these are all the things to change the date. So you can add a number of days, add number of months or a specific number of years to the date. One of the important things that you need to remember is all these do not change today value. Local date time class is immutable. So what we are doing in here is we are creating new variables. The today itself does not get affected. So today minus years 100 
would be a new variable. So I can say local date time, actually it's local date, local date 100 years before is equal to today dot minus years 100. The value of today on the other hand would still remain today. It creates a new variable called 100 years before with the value. So this is immutable class again. All the methods would create new instances with the new value. Until now, in this video, we have looked at a wide variety of things, right? So we looked at how to get specific information, which day of the year, which month, which year, and all that kind of stuff. We also looked at getting generic information, leap year. Is it a leap year? What, are, what is the number of days in the current year? What is the number of days in current month? And we also looked at different operations to add number of days, months, years, and subtract years and stuff like that. The interesting thing to note is that very similar APIs exist on the local date time class as well. So on local date time class, if I create an instance of it right now, date time dot nav, there are very similar methods present. However, in addition to the usual ones, so let's say I want to do a plus, the local date time not only allows plus days, plus months, plus years, and plus weeks, but it also allows plus seconds, plus hours, and plus minutes. So all that I had to do was now dot plus and press tab, and it would show all the options present. So local date time provides all the options that are present for the local date, plus it allows you options to play with hours, minutes, and seconds, and nanoseconds as well. So over here, what you are seeing in here is nanoseconds. So that's basically what the local date time provides. So similar to adding, you would also be able to get different information, right? So now dot get, you would be able to get minute, you would be able to get second, you will be able to get nano, and you'd be able to get the hour as well. I would recommend you to try and play around with the local date time API on your own and try and find out more things about it. In this video, we looked at few of the important methods that are present on the local date class. We looked at how to play with it. We also looked at a few methods which are present in the local date time. In the next video, we will explore a few more things about the local date and the local date time classes. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a few more utility methods present in the local date class, which help you to compare dates as well as set a specific value to a date. So until now, we created a local date object using local date not now, right? So what we did was local date today is equal to local date dot now. But there are other methods which are there, which can be used to create specific dates. So instead of today, let's say I would want to hard code the date and get the details about yesterday. Yesterday was 31st April, for 31st Jan. So for now, let's hard code. I could have got 31st by subtracting one day from here. Let's hard code the values now. So there's a method called off. I can say 2018 and I can say 01 comma 31. Oops, I got something wrong. Okay, this is how it would be. So yesterday, oops, I got the spelling wrong as well. Okay, yesterday is 2018-01-31. So this is one method which can set help you to set a specific value. So off is a specific method in local date which will help you to create a local date instance specifying the specific year, month, and day. So now today has this and yesterday has this. That's cool, right? There are methods which are present which would help you to set a specific year on this date. So I would want to find out the same day, but with a different year. I can say today dot with year, I can say 2016, for example. So it becomes 2016, the same day, 1st February in 2016. And you can also do today dot with a specific day of the month. So let's say I would want to have the date as of 20th day of this month. So it would become 20 February 2018. You can do the same thing with the month as well. So you can say with today dot with month and say I would want to be in the third month. 
the interesting method which is present in here is today with day of the year. You can say I would want the same year but with a specific day. So 120th day of the year. So it would return me 430. So 30th April is the 120th day of 2018. So what we are looking at in here is we started off with looking at different way of creating the local date with a specific date, month and year. And we are looking at once you are having a specific date, how do you modify it with a specific attribute? So I would want to modify the year or a month or a day or you would want to use the current year with a specific day of the year. So these are all the options which are present in local date to be able to do all these things. One of the typical things that we would always do with dates is we would want to compare. Once you have two days, you would want to compare whether they are before each other or after each other. And there are methods to do that as well. So you can do today dot is before yesterday. Is that true? False. Today dot is after yesterday. True. So this is to allow us to compare dates. So is before and is after are two awesome methods to compare dates as well. Whatever dates that we discussed on the local date class are also present on the local date time and the local time class as well. And in local date time, you would also be able to do things like with hour, with minute, with second and things like that. So you can get specific things to manipulate hours, minutes and seconds as well. I would leave that as an exercise for you to explore the local date time and the local time APIs. In this and the previous set of videos, we explored a wide variety of things related to the local date, local date time and the local time classes. We tried to play around with the dates and we tried to explore the API further. As I said before, exploring APIs is not really a fun thing. It's a huge number of methods that you need to remember. So try and remember what are the operations you can do and if you want specific details about a specific thing that you would want to do, you can always and look at the Java docs of the API. All that you need to do is if you want to search for local date time, I'd, I would just need to say Java doc local date time and Java 9 and you would be able to get the API and you can read it and try and find out more about a specific class. The most important thing for you is to remember that there is a specific class existing and probably you can do a few things of this kind with that specific class. Once you know that, once you are aware of that, you can locate the specific details from the documentation of the API. I will see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, let's explore how to explore different APIs using Eclipse. So let's say I would want to find out everything there is to find out about the list interface. How do I do that? You can type in Control Shift T or Command Shift T and choose the list class. So type in list and you can choose the list class inside Java SC 9.0.1. So let's make sure I'm using the right one. So this is the interface that I would want to choose Java Util. Over here, once you go into a class, you can see the entire source code related to that specific class. If you want to understand what it is all about, you can try and read the description which is present at the top. Also present is the list of the methods. You can also type in Control O or Command O. Control O or Command O will get you to the list of the methods which are present in here. So you can see all the individual methods and if you want to look at a specific one, then you can say, okay, I would want to understand the sort method. And you can see the syntax of it. And also you can see the Java doc related to that. This is a long thing and you can read that it's related to a sort. So this is one of the ways, right? So if you want to directly type in something, you can directly type in java.util.list and go there. The other way is let's say I would want to say list, list is equal to new array list. Right, so let's say this is the code I'm using and I press control one or command one to import the array list and control one or command one to import the list as well. Once you do this, you can do a control or command and click. 
So control or command and click. So press control and click or press command and click. It would also take you to the same place. Now I can look at all the documentation behind the array list class as well. So this is the way you can explore API in Eclipse. You can also look at the methods which are present by pressing control O or command O. If you want to understand the type hierarchy of list, what are the implementations of the list, all that you need to do is say right click on the list and say open type hierarchy. That shows the entire type hierarchy so you can see that list interface is implemented by abstract list, array list, copy on write array list and a lot of other stuff. You can see what are the different elements, methods which are present in each of these classes as well. If you don't really want all the details, but you just want to have a quick type hierarchy, you can say right click and quick type hierarchy. And this would show the high level overview of the type hierarchy of that specific interface or the class. In this quick video, we wanted to give you an overview of how to explore different APIs using Eclipse. You can also get the same information by going to Google. All that you need to do is go to Google and type in the interface, list interface I would want to find out more about. So Java list, I would want to find the documentation related to Java 9. So I put in JDK 9 and typed in Java doc. Once you go in here, you can go ahead and explore the different things related to the list interface. You can see which module it is present in, which package it's present in. You can see all the super interfaces, sub interfaces, all the implementing classes, and you can see the description and also overview of the methods and the description of the methods which are present in here. I hope you had an interesting time in this video. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this section on reference types, we looked at what is the difference between a reference variable and a primitive variable. We looked at the different primitive types. We looked at a few reference variables, how they are stored in memory, how they are initialized, and how does assignment and equality work with them. We also discussed a few reference types which are built in in Java. We talked in depth about the string class. We discussed a couple of alternatives for it, string builder and string buffer. We also looked at a wide variety of puzzles which are related to string. And we also discussed about wrapper classes. We discussed about the eight wrapper classes which are present in Java, which are exactly corresponding to the eight primitive types. We discussed why we need wrapper classes and also a variety of methods which are present in the wrapper classes as well. And at the end of this section, we looked at local date, local date time and local time APIs. We looked at different methods to get specific data from the date to get generic data like leap year or length of the month or length of the year. And also we looked at different methods to compare with other dates as well as to add specific number of days, months or years to a specific date. This was one of the first sections where we tried to explore some of the inbuilt APIs in Java. Exploring APIs can get a little boring at times. But it's very important to understand what you can do and what you cannot do. And once you know what you can do, you can easily explore and try to find the right method to do that specific thing. I hope you had an interesting time in this section. I'll see you in the next section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. Welcome to one of the most important sections of this course, Introduction to Arrays and ArrayList. In this section, we would use a challenge to introduce you to all the concepts at play. What we would want to do is we would want to create a new student, give him a name and also a list of marks. So I would want to be able to create students with three marks, four marks, five marks and all that kind of stuff. And after that, I'd want to be able to get how many marks are associated with the student. We would want to get total sum of all the marks, get maximum, minimum and we would want to do average of it. And also, we would want to add the flexibility of adding a new mark to the student and also removing the marks out of student's history. So these are all the operations we would want to be able to perform. And while we are solving this problem, we will be introduced to the concepts of arrays and array list. We will talk about why do we need arrays? What are the different operations that are allowed on arrays? And then we would move into array list and look at how ArrayList simplifies things. I'll see you in the next video where we would start discussing about the need for an array.
Welcome to this video where we would start discussing about the need for an array. As we discussed earlier, we wanted to create a student with a name and a list of marks, a number of marks. And the number of marks might be, there might be three marks associated with the student or there might be five marks associated with the student. So this number might be varying. So based on the concepts that we know, how can we represent marks? For example, let's it's let's say int is the right data type. So I can say int marks one, right? So int mark one. I can also assign a value, right? So I can say mark one is equal to hundred. So let's say he got hundred out of hundred. Uh, let's say ma int mark two is equal to let's say he got seventy five in the second subject, right? So int mark three is equal to let's say sixty. Now. If I would want to find this sum, then in sum is equal to mark 1 plus mark 2 plus mark 3, right? What we are doing in here is we are creating individual variables to represent each mark. And to calculate the sum, what we are doing is we are writing explicit code to add each one of them. Let's say now there is an additional mark, so mark 4. Now, what I would need to do is create another variable. And if I want to do this sum, I would again need to change the formula to do this sum. I would need to do mark 2 plus mark 3 plus mark 4. So now sum is updated with the right values. The code for the sum changes based on whether I have 3 marks, whether I have 2 marks, whether I have 1 mark. This is the kind of situations where arrays come into picture. Arrays allow you to store multiple values of the same data type. So I can say int marks is equal to and store a set of marks. So I can say 75, 60 and 56. So let's say these are the marks I would want to store. You can store it this way. So you are creating an array marks with three elements, right? So I'm creating 75, 60, and 56. The syntax is very simple, right? So int, the fact that this is an array, this is an integer array, is represented by an open brackets. This is square brackets, right? So it's open square bracket, close square bracket, followed by marks is equal to 75, 60, and 56. Once you declare an array and define the elements inside it, there are loops array available which can loop through all the elements inside the array. Irrespective of whether this array has three elements, two elements or four elements, the way you loop the array would remain the same. So let's say if, it, if I would want to loop this array and I would want to calculate this sum. I can say int sum is equal to zero. I'm just creating a simple sum variable and I can say for this is something called an enhanced for loop. The syntax for enhanced for loop is very simple for open bracket. And what does the marks contain? It contains integers. So int mark colon marks. What we are saying in here? We are saying that we would want to loop around all the marks which are present inside the marks array. Over here, I would want to do a sum is equal to sum plus mark right and i would close this now i if i see the sum variable it contains the sum of all the three marks which are present in here the great thing about this piece of code is that the same piece of code can be used irrespective of how many elements marks array contains whether it's 10 100 thousand the code remains the same in summary, you want arrays so that you can have multiple elements of the same type representing the same kind of concept together. So here, each of these is a mark and they are related concepts and are of same type. So you can group them together and store in a single element, which is called an array. The other advantage with arrays is you don't really need to write code like this. You cannot, you need not say mark one plus mark two when there is two variables, mark one plus mark two plus the mark three when there are three variables and so on and so forth. You can directly write code to sum all the elements which are present in array. 
irrespective of the number of elements which are present in the array. This was a quick introduction video where we just wanted to show a bit of the declaration of the array and a bit of how to loop around it. We'll discuss about the finer aspects of declaring an array and also multiple variations around the loops in the subsequent videos in this section. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will talk about the basics around creation of arrays and accessing values from an array. Let's get started. Earlier, we, this is the syntax which we used to create the array. int max is equal to open bracket 1, 2, 3. So now this creates a mark array. So marks array with three elements 1, 2, 3. As we discussed earlier, you can have any number of elements inside the array. So you can have four, five. So I'm creating an elements with an array with five elements, as well as you might even have just one value in the array, or you might even have no values in the array. That is fine. So an array can, can contain va no values, or it can contain as many values as you would want. What we are do doing here is called declaring an array. What is the type of an array? Marks2 is int array. And the right hand side is where you are defining the contents of an array. So we are saying this array contains five elements and the values are of this kind. This is kind of a shortcut way of declaring an array. The typical way we declare an array is int marks three, let's say is equal to new int array of how many elements. So this is called defining an array where we I'm saying I would want to create a new integer array with five elements and over here is the declaration part. So I'm saying marks is an integer array and over here the actual size of the array is defined. Now once I do this you can see that all the values are being initialized to zero. So if you don't specify any values for anything in an array the default values are zero. Now I can go and access a specific value from the array as well. In array, the index starts from zero. So this is zero, this is index one, this is index two, this is index three, and this is index four. If I say max three of zero, that's the syntax to access a specific value at a specific index. So square brackets, and within the square brackets, we put the index. So I would want to find out in the marks three array, which element is present at index zero. What is the thing? It's zero, right? You can also change the value. So you can say marks three of zero is equal to 10. So now if I print marks three of zero, what would be the value which should be present? It's 10. If I want to set the values as in marks two, one, two, three, four, five, then what I would need to do is to assign values in the Visually. So mark three of zero is equal to one because the index is zero in here. The value is one. Similar to that, mark three of one is two. Mark three of two is, oops, I got it wrong. Two is three. Mark three is four. And the last one, four is five. So now if I say max three, it would print all the values inside that array. So one, two, three, four, five. When creating marks two, what did we do? We use the shortcut, right? So we just said int array marks two is equal to one comma two comma three comma four comma five. So this way of defining an array is actually a shortcut. So it's a shortcut instead of defining an array with five elements and then assigning all the five values. This pro provides us an alternative way of creating an array quickly. The last important thing that we would want to talk now is the length of an array. You can also find the length of an array by saying max 2 dot length. Important thing to remember is this is a property and not a method. So typically until now when we did string dot length it was a method. Just for arrays it's a property so max2 dot length is 5 max dot length is 3 and max3 dot length 
is 5. So marks 3 has 5 elements. We declared marks earlier when we started this video with 3 elements and marks 2 has 5 elements. Cool, isn't it? Now, I'll leave you with an exercise. The exercise is to create an array marks with 8 elements. So create an element marks with 8 elements and write the code to loop around this array and print all the values which are present in this array. To loop around the array, a tip I would give you is the length property. Think about how you would use the length property and also how do you access the elements from the array and print them out. So create an array and loop around it to print the values which are present in it. In this video, we understood how to create an array. We looked at two ways of creating arrays, the simple way and a little more complex way where we define an array and then we assign individual values into it. We also looked at how to access a specific element in the array using an index and how to assign a value at a specific index into the array. At the end of this video, we looked at the length property of arrays, which helps us to get how many elements are there in this specific array. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will look at a few puzzles related to the creation and accessing values from an array. Before we get there, let's take up the exercise from the previous video. We wanted to create a marks array with eight elements, right? So how do we do that? It's very simple. Marks is equal to, let's just have it simple. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. So now I would want to check what's the length of it. So how do I do that? Length, right? Now the exercise was to use this marks dot length to loop around this array. So how can I do that? I can say for int i is equal to zero. The index starts from zero to length minus one. So marks dot length minus one i plus plus. And inside the loop, I can have my code, right? So I can say system dot out dot println. What do I want to print? I would want to print the element at index i. So i is ranging from 0 to length minus 1, 0 to 7. I would want to print the element at index i from this array. How do I get the element at this index from the array? Marks of i. All right, simple. Let's close it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Aha, I made a small mistake. I said i less than marks dot length minus one. It should have been i less than marks dot length or i less than equal to marks dot length minus one. All right, so let's fix that. Okay, there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's move on to the puzzles. Let's start with talking about initialization of the arrays, right? So int, uh, let's say I'm creating a int, let's create a marks array, right? So marks is equal to new int of five. What would be the initial values that would be assigned into the array? Think about it. The initial values that would be assigned into the array will be zeros. The same thing if I did as a double, so double values is equal to new double of five, what would happen? What would be the initial value? The initial value will be 0, 0.0. So for all in the integer types, the default initialization is zero. For all the double types, the default initialization is 0, 0.0. For Boolean, the default initialization will be false. So if you had Boolean array with test is equal to new Boolean of five, you would have false in each one of them. And the last thing is you can even create arrays of objects, right? So let's say I have a class called person. I'm just creating a very simple class without anything. You can even create class of persons, right? So I can say person, person, person array. So persons is equal to new person array of five, right? So this is exactly the same as earlier, except that instead of the double or the int, I'm saying person with a P. 
right? So, this is new person. So, whenever we have objects, whenever we create an array of objects, the default is null. So, an array is created. However, this is not really referring to any of the objects. So, it has a value null. So, default initialization for a object is null. Let's look at a few more puzzles. Let's say I am doing something very similar to this. So, I am saying int 5 of marks. So, I am declaring an array and I am saying array is of 5 elements. Can I do that? It's not possible. So, when you are declaring an array on the declaration side of the array, you cannot say how many elements it has. And on the definition side, so new int of 5 is where we need to typically say how many elements it contains. Can I can create an array? Can I define an array without how many elements it has? Nope. It says array dimension is missing. So, the size of the array should always be on the definition side. That's the right side and the left side should be empty. That's one important thing that you need to remember. So, this is how you would define and declare an array. This array has five elements. What would happen if I try to access the sixth element? Oops, actually I should have said marks of six. So, what would happen if I say marks of six? It would say array index out of bound exception. Remember the exception? So, if you see an exception called array index out of bound exception, that means that you are trying to access an element beyond the limit of the specific array. One another important thing about an array is you can only have values of this specified type. What does that mean? So, I can only have 1, 2, 3. If I try to say 4.0, nope, it says, okay, 4.0 is not an int. So, you cannot store it in here. In an array, you can only store things of a specific type, only of the type int. If I declare it as a person array, then I can only store elements of type person. The last thing which we'll look at is how to print the entire content in an array. So, if I want to print marks, how do I print that? I want to print all the elements which are present in this marks array. How do I do that? Let's redefine the marks array first. Marks is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? I want to print the entire content of this array using system.out.println. How do I do that? If I do a system.out.println marks, What do I get? I get a memory location. I'm not getting the content of the array. So, if you're using system.out.println and if you want to get the contents of the marks, the way you can do that is use a static method in the arrays class. So, arrays dot to string marks. That's how you print the content of the array using system.out.println. This is something which we do often in code, right? So, you'd want to see what is the content which is present in a specific array. So, you can use the arrays.to string. It would give you the string representation and you can print that to the output by using system.out.println. So, this is something which you can try and remember. It's arrays.to string. Okay. In this video, we looked at various puzzles related to the arrays. We started with looking at the default values that are stored in the array. For integer types, it's 0. For floating point types, it's 0, 0.0. And for boolean, it's false. And for object types, we would store a value of null by default. And we looked at the fact that when we are declaring and defining an array, on the declaration side, we cannot specify what is the size of the array. And on the definition side, we should definitely specify what is the size of the array. We looked at the fact that an array index out of bounds exception is thrown when you try to access elements beyond the indexes that are present in the array. We also saw that you can only store values of the specified type in the array. If I'm trying to store a float value into an integer array, it's an error. The last thing we looked at is how to use arrays.to string to print the content of the array. I'm sure you're having a lot of fun and I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. In this video, we would look at a few more basics about arrays. We would look at how you can use enhanced for loops to loop around the arrays. And also, we would look at how you can change the content of an array in 
bulk if you want to set a number of elements in the array to the same value how do you do that and also we would look at how to compare and sort arrays cool right so let's get started let's create a simple array in max it's been our favorite until now right so this time around i'll give a lot of marks so nine, this is a exceptional student who has 90s in everything right so okay now this marks i would want to loop around and print all the values which are present in there so how do i loop around arrays we looked at the first way and the second way in the previous videos right so we can say for int i is equal to zero take i less than equal to marks dot length minus one and i plus plus and do it that's one way of doing it the other way is for int mark in marks you can do a system dot out dot print ln mark right so this would print all the marks inside the array this specific for loop is called a enhanced for loop because this is very simple to write this was something which was introduced in java 5 and i loved it when i saw this because i don't need to really need to do int i is equal to zero and try and find out the length of the marks array the enhanced for loop prevents the need to do all this kind of stuff right so i is equal to zero i less than marks dot length i plus plus and then i need to say system dot out dot print ln and access the element at that specific index so all this complexity will not be needed with the enhanced for loop so these are the two ways you can loop around arrays now let's say I have uh, an array so int max is equal to new int of five what would be the value which would be assigned into max yep it's zero right so that's the default now let's say I would want to fill hundred as the default into all these things how can I do that the way I can do that is to use another static method which is present in arrays class so you need to say arrays dot fill max with hundred so this is very useful when you would want to actually put values which are different from zero so the initialization of int is typically zero but i don't want to use zero as the starting point i would want to use 100 as the starting point then i can say arrays dot fill marks comma 100 the great thing is you don't need to specify how many elements are there in max as well right so all that you need to say is i want this marks array whatever is present how many other elements are present in that fill it with a value of 100 right so that's cool the next thing i would want to do is to compare arrays right so typically when i create arrays let's say array one is equal to one comma two comma three now let's say there is another array array two with the same set of values right so i would want to find out if these two arrays contain the same elements how can i do that there's a simple static equals method so arrays dot equals array one array one comma array two this is written true let's say i had another array array three which had one of these values different then what would it return it would return oops i'm doing array one array two i have to do array three and it returns false so this arrays dot equals methods returns false if these arrays have different lengths so if this had three elements and this had two elements it would be false and it would also be false if any of the elements don't match the arrays dot equals returns true only when the length of the arrays is the same and each of the elements match the last thing which we want to look at in this video is how to sort an array so this array three has three two and three and we would want to sort the values how do i do that i can say arrays dot sort array three now I'm printing the content of array 3 you can see that it's sorted so in this video what we looked at are some of the other basics related to arrays how do you compare arrays how do you sort arrays and we started with looking at the enhanced for loop and also we looked at how to initialize an array with a value other than what is your initial value that's using the fill method until the next video bye bye Welcome back. Now, 
with the knowledge you have gained about arrays in the previous few steps, we are now ready to create our student class. So what we want to do is we would want to create a student, student is equal to new student of name and a list of marks. How do you represent the list of marks? Now we can use arrays, right? So we can use arrays to represent the list of marks. And what we would want to do is we would want to go a step further and implement all these methods. So student dot get number of marks. That basically if there are three marks associated with a student, it would return three. Total sum of marks is addition of all the marks which are present. Get maximum mark is which is the maximum among the list of marks which is present in there. That's maximum mark. Minimum is minimum. Average is the average. So sum divided by number. So that's basically the average. So what I would recommend you to do is I would recommend you to create a new project and start creating a new class called student and have a runner called student runner where you would put all these details out. You can stop the video in here and try it as an exercise before looking into the solution. Okay, let's get to the solution now. What we want to do is create a new project because this is a new section and let's go ahead and say new project. Um, I would want to do introduction to array and array list is the name I'm giving to it. Clicking finish and the project is now here. So let's go ahead and create our new class. Control N, Control N and class. The class name which we would want to give this is student runner. Let's start with the student runner class. Right as usual and over here it's com dot in 28 minutes dot let's say arrays. I would want a main method and finish. Cool, isn't it? It's something which we have been doing multiple times during this specific course. Right. So now what we want to do is we would want to be able to create a student class student is equal to new student and to the student we would want to be able to give him a name. So let's say Ranga and we would want to be able to give a set of marks. So I would want to be able to pass in a set of marks. So how can I pass in a set of marks? Let's create an int. So int marks is equal to new int of five, right? I could have done this and then assign the values in or I'll take the easier route. I'll say max is equal to 34. Let's give bigger max, right? 99, 98, 100. He's unlike me. He gets really good max. At least in the course, I can act as if I get very good max, right? So now what I'm saying in here is student, student is equal to new student of Ranga, comma, max, right? So this is how we can create a student with a name and marks associated with him let's go ahead control one command one what does it do i would want to create a class student that's cool right so now let's go ahead and say student finish we have the student class let's go back to the student runner and this is failing compilation error because think about it why is it failing because there's no constructor right so create constructor student with string and marks right so i'll say string name int marks right now as usual what we'll do is we'll store the name and the marks into member variables so name is equal to name this dot marks is equal to marks control one create field name create field marks as you can see in here now inside this student what we have done is we created a field called marks which is of type integer array so this is integer array this is name which is a string so now when i save this what would you see you'd see that new student of ranga marks that's cool we have the student and the student runner ready what we want to do further is to implement these methods right? these four methods should be easy to implement if you have not done the exercise before then i would recommend you to pause the video in here and try and implement these four methods quickly inside the student class. Int number is equal to students, student dot get number of marks. 
right? So I would want to get the number of marks of the student. So let's go ahead and create the method, create method, get number of marks inside the student. And what should I return? How many marks does this student have? Think about it. What is the easiest way to implement this? I can just say marks dot length, all right? So that would return the number of marks that this student has. Now, that's cool. So I can do a sys out, control space, and say number of marks plus number. Okay, cool, right? So now let's run this program and see what would happen. Run as Java application. Cool, number of marks is three. Simple, isn't it? Now, I would want to find out more about these marks, right? Not just the number. You want to find out total sum of marks, maximum mark, and the minimum mark. And we would want to end with the average marks. We will look at all that stuff in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we created a student class and we wrote a method to get the number of marks. These four methods are left off. And in this video, we'll look at what is involved in implementing them. Let's get started with the total sum of marks, right? So in sum is equal to student dot get total sum of marks. This should be an easy method to implement. So control one, create the method for me, please. And how do I find out the total sum of marks? It should be very, very simple, right? For mark, I have to declare it for int mark in marks, sum plus is equal to mark. Now, I have to declare sum as well, right? So int sum is equal to zero. So sum plus is equal to mark. And over here, I have to return sum back. As simple as this, right? So this is what we have done earlier. So let's go ahead and save this and let's try and print this out so sum of marks how much is it sum cool isn't it so sum of marks is 297 i'm an expert student 297 marks right that's awesome <laughs> let's create the next one get maximum mark and the minimum mark right so let's copy these two in I'll comment this one for now and let's get started with maximum mark. Control one, command one, create new method in maximum work. So how do I find out the maximum? Think about it. How do I find out the maximum mark? So the thing is, the way I can find out the maximum mark is by looping around the marks and trying to find out which is the largest among them. So I'll say int, instead of sum, I'll call this maximum and maximum is equal to you can start with zero and you can say if mark greater than maximum then what what's the maximum maximum is equal to mark what would happen think about it let's say marks has 95 98 and 10. the way it would work is initial value for maximum will be zero for uh, the first when we are trying to loop around this the first value which would come in is 95 so is 95 greater than zero yes so maximum becomes 95 and next element will be picked up 98 right so 98 is that greater than maximum at that point which is 95 yes so maximum again becomes 98 and then we get 10 so 10 is not greater than 98 so maximum will remain as 98 so the maximum which will be returned back is 98 i recommend you to try and check this logic once again try and add a breakpoint and see how you can find out more about this so you can put a breakpoint in here by double clicking and you can go to the student runner and do a right click debug as java application and that would help you to debug the whole thing out so now let's quickly do this system dot maximum of marks let's see what would happen it's the maximum of marks is being printed as 297 because i'm printing sum in here so let's print maximum mark and let's see what would be printed it's 100 that's cool right 100 is the maximum in here 
one of the improvements you can do is instead of using zero i can say integer dot minimum so if you start with the min value this method will even work for negatives right so typically in this situation i would not expect max to be negative but you never know so there might be situations where you have negative max for wrong answers so to be safe what we can do is we can start with integer dot min value now i would want to find out the next one so the next one is to find the minimum mark right so student dot get minimum mark let's create the method okay now how do i find out the minimum mark i can copy this code in and i can refactor and rename renaming is one of the refactoring options which is present in eclipse and typically most of the ides it would rename all the users of this variable so you can see that this variable is used four four places right maximum 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 if i want to change this to minimum i need to individually go and change everywhere if i do a rename then i don't need to do that so you can see that whatever i'm typing in here would come in at all the places so this is an awesome shortcut if you do a refactor and a rename the shortcut for this also you'd be able to see for your specific operating system on your screen so if you do a refactor rename it's over here i've changed it to minimum when we do a minimum we should start with a max value and i would need to reverse the logic so if mark less than minimum then minimum is equal to mark now if you are not able to understand this specific logic then not a problem at all what we are doing in here is we are setting a very very big value so we are saying minimum is like a large value and then we compare each mark against the minimum so 95 against the large value 95 is smaller so the minimum becomes 95 then we compare 95 against 98 95 is still smaller so minimum remains 95 then we compare 95 against 10 and 10 is smaller so the minimum becomes 10 that's how it would work and in our example the data which we have is 99 98 and 100 so the output should be 98 so minimum of marks should be what should it be okay it's 98 that's cool right so this is basically uh, like we are trying to loop around and doing some logic to find out all this stuff about an array last thing which we want to do now is to do the get average marks so we would want to do get average marks the interesting thing is what i did in here right so i said it's big decimal why am i using big decimal why am i using int until now and for this specific one i'm using big decimal because this is involving floating point values right so average if i have three marks the average can be in floating points right so if i have let's say 10 marks and the sum of the 10 marks is 801 then the average is 80.1 that's a floating point and we know that floating point values are not good in calculations so that's the reason why we are going for big decimal i'll first do a control one on the big decimal to import java.math.bigdecimal so that would import the java.math.bigdecimal class which is seen in here and now i would go ahead and create the average marks method so control one over here create method so it's written a big decimal back so that's cool now what we want to do is to calculate the average so to do the average you can do the sum and you can find the total and divide them that's basically what you need to do to find out the average marks right so i can implement the complete logic in here or even better would be to use the logic which is already there so i can say int sum is equal to gets total sum of marks and i can say int number is equal to i can either do marks dot length or get number of marks not a lot of difference because there's just one line of code in there so i'm doing i'm calling the method and i can say return new big decimal of sum divided by number do you think this would work think about it let's run this i would be interested in hearing if you think it would work 
or it would work as accurately as we would want to. Do you think it would work as accurately as we would want it to? Let's see. Now, I'm doing average. Okay, cool. It's printing 99 as the average. That's good, right? Now, let's say I'm making one of these marks 97, right? So, 97, 98, 100. It's printing the average as 98. However, the average I'm actually expecting is 98.66. So, there is a flaw in our code. It's missing the decimals. Why is it missing the decimals? Think about it. You can pause the video in here and see why is the decimals missing. Okay, I'll do it for you. It's basically the fact that you are doing a sum by number. That means that you are doing a integer calculation. Sum is an integer, number is an integer. So, this is an integer calculation. The most accurate way of doing that is by using new big decimal of sum divide by new big decimal of number. So this would be the most accurate way of doing this specific thing. So we are using the big decimal and dividing it by another big decimal. When I do this, I get an exception. So when I'm running the program right now, I see an exception in here. It says non-dominating decimal expansion, no exact representable decimal result. Why do you think I'm getting this error? Think about it. Pause the video in here and try and think about it. The reason is because the average that we are getting right now is 98.6666666. So to accurately represent it is not possible at all because this is like going on. So as many sixes as you would want to add in. That's the reason why exception is being thrown. The way we can solve this is by specifying something called a precision and a rounding mode. So over here, if it's going on continuously printing sixes, I need to tell how many decimal points do I really care about. So let's say over here, I care about three decimal points. So I would only want to care about this. That's cool, right? So 98.666. So because this is 6666, it becomes 98.667. So if I specify a pression of three, this specific thing would become 98.667. However, just specifying precision is not sufficient because if you have values, for example, like 98.6665, for example, this is the value you are getting out of your calculation. You have specified a round precision of 3. So let's say you have specified a precision of 3. That means this is now needs to be expressed in 3 decimals. So it should either become 667 or 666. How does the Java API know whether 6665 should go down to 666 or 667. That's rounding mode. So you have to specify a rounding mode up or down. So if it's 0.5, should it go to 1 or 0? That's basically the round rounding mode. So you, ha you have two values up or down. So let's do that in here. So in addition to the number, when I'm dividing it, I would want to specify the precision. The precision I would want is three digits and I would want to use rounding mode dot up. So I would want to do up. So 0.5 should go to 1. Let's run the program right now. Okay, go ahead and save and run it. Now you can see that it's printing 98.334. That's the average of the three numbers. Actually, I was expecting it to be 98.666, but actually this is right. Actually, 98.33 is the correct average for the marks that we have in here. Congratulations! What we have done in here is created a very, very simple student class where we stored a name and a list of marks. And we implemented a number of methods to get more details about this list of marks. That's awesome. Congratulate yourself and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's try and understand an important concept called variable arguments. To start off, we'll try and understand why variable arguments are needed. And in the next few videos, we'll try and play around with variable arguments a lot more. So int marks is equal to 97, 98, 100, right? So over here, we directly specified ranga in here, right? So I didn't say string name is equal to ranga and then use name in here. What I did was directly specified ranga in here. So can I directly specify marks in here? 
how can I specify marks in here? One of the things you can do is right click, refactor and inline. So inline is another refactoring technique which is present in most of the refactoring tools in all the IDEs which replaces all uses of this variable with the actual value of it. So the value of it is an array, right? So what happens is this marks will get replaced with the actual value of the array. Let's try and do an inline with a simpler variable. So let's say int i is equal to 5, very simple, right? So and if let's say I'm saying int j is equal to i plus 5 and int k is equal to i plus 10. So now the value of i is used in two places, right? If I want to re inline this, I'm selecting it, right click, refactor, inline. So what would happen is both the occurrences of the inline local variable i gets replaced with its value. So this i will be replaced by 5 and this i will also be replaced by 5. So you can see that both the places where i was there, it became 5. So this is called inlining. Same inlining can be done with arrays as well, right? So this is an array. I would want to inline it. Right click, refactor, inline. What would happen? There is only one use of this marks variable. So that gets replaced. The interesting thing is how would it get replaced, right? So one of the important things is you cannot just say, okay, I would want to pass an array of this way. When I want to create an array and pass it as a parameter directly, you need to specify new int. You should say, I would want to create a new array of the type integer array. So I would want to create a new array containing integers. And what are the values which are present in here? 97, 98, 100, right? So this is cool, right? This is good. But this is not really very good API in the sense that anybody who needs to use this now needs to do exactly the same thing. Can I do things like this? Can I say 97, 98, 100? And the values which I specify in here are accepted directly in here. And the other important thing you need to remember is I would want to be able to use this with, let's say student one is Ranga, let's say student is Ranga, student one is let's say somebody else, let's say Adam. And let's say Adam, with Adam I don't want, I want to store only two marks. And let's say there's a student two, Eve, for whom I would want to store e marks. I mean, the reasons might be different, right? So you can, maybe these are students from different classes, different years, maybe they have different kinds of subjects. For whatever reason, these students have different number of subjects. And what we would want to be able to do is do something of this kind. So for Ranga, I would want to be able to store three, for Adam two and Eve four. How do I do that without using a int array kind of thing? So I can do this by saying, okay, if I say new int, and create integer array, that's possible, right? So this would be allowed. So this would be with two elements and this would be with four elements. So this is fine. This would compile and you'd be able to pass in the values. But how do I do that without using the new in? So even with a better, simpler interface, how can I do that? That's where the concept of variable arguments comes into picture. Now that we understood the need for variable arguments, in the next video, we'll discuss the basics of variable arguments. Welcome back. In the previous video, we understood the need for variable arguments. We want to be able to pass different number of arguments for the same method. I don't want to go and define different arguments for each one of them. That will make it very, very complex. And to avoid that, we would go for a concept called variable arguments. Basically, what we would want to be able to do is we would want to be able to define methods. For example, let's say I'm creating a sum method. Int sum, int i, comma, int j, right? So if I want to do sum of two numbers, oops, this does not compile because I need to do return i plus j, right? So this would find the sum of two numbers. So I can say sum of 1, comma, 2, and it would return 3. Now, if I want to do 1, comma, 2, comma, 3, Will it allow? No. Nope. It says I can only have two parameters. So if it has to work, then what I would need to do is create a new sum method, overloaded one, with the int ijk, 
and here I would need to say return i plus j plus k right I have to create a completely new method to do that how can I avoid that how can I not really create a completely new method and still be able to do this kind of stuff that's where the variable argument concept comes in let's start with creating a simple method to accept variable arguments right so I'm going to make it void I'm not going to return anything back for now I would call this method as print right so print let's say I would want to print all the values which are passed so I would want to be able to call print 1 2 1 2 3 1 2 3 4 and with multiple types of arguments how can I do that is void print and int i is how we would typically define the argument if you want to pass variable number of arguments the way you can define it is by pressing three dots in here and this is not single so I'll call this values you can call this anything name of the variable does not really matter but for now I'll just call it values so this is how you can accept variable argument so what would happen is whatever you're passing into this method becomes a list so these values will be an array so it will be a number of values an array with these values so now if I do let's say system dot out dot print ln we learned how to print an array arrays dot to string of values right so that's what we learned earlier so we are printing the content of the array that's passed and closing so it's very simple void print int values is how we would do that if I have to accept one but we would want to accept multiple arguments that's why we said dot 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 system dot out dot print ln is dot to string of values now the print method is created now I can say print one what would happen it's printing an array with one element one comma two two elements one comma two comma three three elements and so on and so forth right so I can create a simple method similar to print now I can call this sum as well right so I can say int instead of print I can call this sum and over here I can say int sum is equal to zero and now I can loop around so for int value from values I can add the sum up sum plus is equal to value and cool now we have the sum oops I forgot the return so we have to do it again mm -hmm. not very interesting right so let's do it quickly for sum plus is equal to value and over here I have to return sum back that's what was missing and now the method is cool I would now can call one comma two it prints three sum of one comma two comma three comma four ten and five comma six twenty one so that's cool right so this is awesome this is what variable arguments enable in this video what we looked at was how to create a simple method using variable arguments all that you need to do is dot 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 and inside the code and inside the code you can access it as if you are accepting a array so this is a cool feature which is present in Java from Java 5 in the next video we will use this concept to implement this for our student problem I'll see you in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we discussed the basic concepts of variable arguments. Now, let's implement that for this specific student class. So I'm going to the student class, and now, instead of our accepting an integer argument, what we would want to do is we would want to accept variable arguments. The way I can do that is by just changing this to dot 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 as simple as that inside the student class I would want to still represent it as an array however when somebody is creating the student class I would want to give them the flexibility of using variable arguments isn't this cool you saw that with just very simple change in code all the code here starts to compile that's the fun and magic of variable arguments right so 
one of the important things that you need to always remember about variable arguments is the fact that variable arguments should be the last argument inside a method you cannot have a variable argument you cannot define a method something of this kind i cannot say void um, let's say print and say i would want to have variable arguments first and then after that i would want to have a string name nope that's not allowed if i try to do this it says variable argument parameter must be the last parameter in that's one thing you need to remember variable argument should always be the last argument inside the method in this very very short video we implemented the concept of variable arguments for our student class and also looked at one important thing that you need to remember with variable arguments variable argument should always be the last argument inside a method i'll see you in the next video where we would move on to more complex topics until then bye bye welcome back in one of the previous videos we were introduced to the concepts of arrays of objects of custom types in this video let's investigate that further and also do a couple of exercises related to strings so we'll create an array of strings and play around with it let's get started let's create a simple type right so person this is a type we are not putting any values in there i mean we are not putting any member variables in it let's create an array of this right so how do we do that so person array persons is equal to new person array of 5 this is the way you can create a array so this is very similar to how we created the integer array int values is equal to new int of 5 you can see that the defaults are null if you really want to assign individual values for each one of these you can do that as well persons of 1 is equal to new person right if it was a better type with constructors and everything you can pass the values in as well so this is now if i try and print person what would it contain only the second one is pointing to an object reference all the others are null so similar to this you can actually create new persons and assign everything this is one way of doing it right so new person and so on and so forth a shortcut way of doing this is by saying person persons 2 is equal to and using a syntax similar to 1 2 3 4 5 right similar to that we can say new person come on new person i'm creating two, just two persons to keep it simple so now this array is created with two persons right so this is with all the types so if you have a constructor you can directly set the values and create elements of that class and put them directly into an array that's awesome similar to this you can even create string arrays so i can say string arrays text values or whatever you'd want to say what text you want to store let's say apple b for ball c for cat right what we learn in nursery similar to this we can also store text into an array the thing is with strings we have a shortcut we don't even need to do new string of you can directly type in the values directly the objects for these literals would be created by java i'll leave you with a simple exercise create a string array with the days of the week so write a method where you are creating a string array with the days of the week and also inside that method try and print the longest string so which day has the most number of letters inside these days so sunday has 6 monday has 6 similar to that find the one with which has most number of letters in it and at the end try and print the days of the week backwards so starting from saturday to sunday in backwards way saturday friday thursday wednesday tuesday monday and sunday so that's the exercise try and doing it and we'll look at the solution in the next video until then bye bye welcome back in this video let's look at some of the code generation features that are present in eclipse let's create a simple bean so let's call this class test bean and let's have a couple of things in here int i 
private int i let's have a private string str right so code generation is one of the features in eclipse to generate code automatically right so you have a few variables which are defined in here i'm pressing all shift s or you can use right click source you can see a variety of things in here these are all the code generation features in eclipse you can also reach them by pressing alt shift s let's start with generating the getters and setters that's something which we have done very often so you can select all the generate so this selects both the getters and setters for everything you have options here to select all or select getters only select setters only or select everything as well and also you can set the access modifier for them we'll talk about access modifiers a little later so you can make these methods as public you can also have final and the other option you can see in here interestingly is to generate the method comments as well so you can also generate java doc comments in here you can go ahead and click ok this would generate the setters and getters including the java doc for them as you can see in here let's look at the other options which are present in here the other option which is present in here is to generate hash code and equals when you want to provide a custom implementation of the equals method we will look at equals method in detail a little later in this course but important thing for you is you can directly generate the hash code and the equals method as well in eclipse itself you can also generate two string you can also generate constructors as well so just you can generate a constructor and choose which fields you would want to be part of the constructor and press ok that generates a constructor and you can also generate constructors from superclass so you can just say constructors from superclass i want to generate the constructor object constructor is what i would want to do and this would actually generate the constructor to go ahead and implement something custom for you in this video we looked at some of the code generation features which are present in eclipse until the next tip bye bye welcome back the exercise that we wanted to do was to create a string array with days of the week right so i just copied this stuff in and let's go to eclipse cool i've opened up eclipse let's go ahead and create a new class inside the arrays so i'll call this string oops i have to first do class say string runner and i would want a main method in this exercise i'll take a little bit of shortcut not really create individual methods and directly do everything in a single method so we would want to create a string array right so how do i create so string array string array days of week is equal to cool i need to put a comma in here right so does this compile yep this compiles so days of the week is called sunday monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday that's cool right so now the second problem second exercise was to find the one with the most number of characters how can i find the length of a string it's by using the length method which is present in this string right how do i find the length of an array it's by using the length attribute on the days of the week i don't really need to uh, use the length attribute i can actually directly loop around it so what i can do is do a for loop right for string day in days of week we need to store the day so string day with most characters is equal to let's initialize it to empty because now empty has zero characters that's cool so that's a good starting point and we can say if day dot length right so day dot length the specific day sunday dot length is greater than day with most characters dot length then what should we do then day with most characters is equal to the specific day let's have a open brace and a close brace let's follow good coding practices now we have a for loop and now i can print the result right system dot out dot print ln i could have typed in sys out as well day with 
most number of characters what is it plus cool isn't it let's run this right click run as job application mm -hmm. Wednesday right I'll just leave in a space here Wednesday has nine characters and that's what is printed out now if I want to print the days of the week in the reverse can I use this this is the shortcut right so can I use this and print the days of the week in reverse no because this would only go forward so if I have to print the days of the week in the reverse what I would need to do I would need to not use this but int i is equal to zero used the usual way i less than days of week dot length i plus plus right this is typically how we would do if i would wanted to print everything in this straightforward way system dot out dot print ln i can say days of week of that specific index right so this would print sunday monday tuesday wednesday on straight lines right so sunday monday tuesday we would want to print it in the reverse so what i can do is i can start from length minus one so i can say i is equal to length minus one and while i greater than or equal to zero i minus minus right so i'm doing the loop in the reverse let's see what would happen now so this would print saturday friday thursday wednesday tuesday monday and sunday so this prints the whole thing in the reverse so in this exercise small one actually we looked at how to initialize a set of strings into a string array and we found out the string with the most characters length in it and we printed this string in the reverse let's get back to the challenge at hand in the next step until then bye bye welcome back now as far as the challenge is concerned we have completed the first few steps right up to here it's done the things which we need to add in right now is to be able to add a new mark and remove mark at index i'm going to the student runner class we would want to be able to add a new mark to a student after the creation of the array i would want to be able to say okay i want to add a new mark to this array and also i'd want to be able to remove the mark so let's say after creating the marks i found that okay this student has unenrolled from this specific subject for which he had handed so i would want to be able to remove this the thing is with arrays doing this kind of stuff is not easy because once an array is created once you set the size of an array once you set the array is five elements you cannot change the size of an array let's take a simple example right so i've created an integer array marks is equal to and i said it's having three elements 34 and 45 now if i want to add another element into this array the only option i have is to create a new array copy these elements in and add the new element as the third array so i can say the way i can do that is say int new marks is equal to i can say new int of marks dot length so i would want to create a new int array with length one more than the marks dot length so now this has four elements now what i can do is i can copy all these elements into the first three locations and then change the last one to have the new value that's the only way you can actually add elements to the array and if i want to let's say delete the last element for the array from 45 then i would say new marks with one deleted i would need to say okay i would want to create a new array with minus one so now an integer array with two elements is created and now i can copy these two elements into here right so that's the only way you can add and remove elements from an array so you have to write a lot of logic to be doing that the summary is deleting and 
adding elements to an array is very very difficult once you create an array with a specific size you cannot change the size of it if you want to increase the length you have to create a new array and copy the elements out to it and this is a lot of logic for us to write and that's where java provides something called an array list in the next video let's get a basic introduction into array list and try and play around with it in this video we understood that one of the problems with arrays is you cannot dynamically increase the length and decrease the length in the next video let's focus on array lists welcome back in the previous video we talked about the fact that the size of the arrays cannot be increased dynamically and decreased dynamically and hence java provides something called an array list as an implementation which provides features to add and remove elements in this video we will look at the basic set of features related to array list we'll have a separate section called collections where we would discuss array list in detail we'll discuss the interfaces related to it we'll talk about all the different methods that are related to array list in detail at a later point in the section on collection for now our focus is on getting to know the basics of array list and making sure that we can use an array list to add and remove elements now let's get started how do i create an array list instance think about it how can i create an array list instance the easiest way is to say array list array list is equal to new array list and inside this array list you can add and remove elements like you would want so let, i can say array list dot add add apple it's added in however you are getting a warning we'll talk about the warning a little later now i can also say apple bat and ball cat so i'm adding three elements now i can see the content of the array list in here by saying array list you can see that all the elements are added in one after the other if i want to remove an element then i can say array list dot remove cat mm -hmm. it says true that means the element is removed and now if i say array list you can see apple and bat so you can see that into an array list i can dynamically add values and remove values one of the things is it's saying warning unchecked call to add e the thing is over here when we were declaring the array list we did not say what type of values it would contain so into this array list i can add strings i can even add let's say add i can try and add a number as well now this array list if i try and print what does it contain it contains apple is a string bat is a string and one is a number and this is not really considered to be a good practice because when i have a list of values i would want all of them to be same type so you can have array list do that by specifying the type when you are declaring it so let's say i would want only to have string so i'll say array list and let's say items is equal to new array list now, if I would want to only store string in this specific thing, then I can say array list of string. This is something which is introduced in Java 5. This is called generics, where you can specify, okay, this array list will only contain strings. And in this kind of thing, if you want to add items dot add, let's say apple, this goes through fine. But if I say items dot add one aha it says nope that's not allowed you cannot add an integer you can only add strings to this specific thing so i can add items dot add bat and items dot add cat that's allowed because these are all strings and i can see the values in items and i can also remove elements right so i can either say remove cat or I can use the index to remove it as well. So I can say items dot remove zero. That would remove the item at index zero. So this is the one at zero. So it would remove apple. It's saying I have removed apple. If I print items now, you'd see that items only contain bat. So in this quick video, 
what we were doing was trying to get an introduction to ArrayList. We saw that we can easily add elements, we can remove elements and do a wide variety of things with ArrayList. In the next video, let's get back to the challenge at hand and modify the array that we stored into an ArrayList. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we learned some of the basics related to ArrayList. Now, over here, we are storing marks as an array. In this video, let's try and convert this to an array list. What we are trying to do in this video is called refactoring. Student root runner is consuming the class student. So it's using the class student. It's making use of the API, which the student class is providing. However, what we want to do here is we want to change the internal structure of student without affecting the student runner. As far as the student runner is concerned, if it behaves like this, student runner is happy. So as long as I'm able to initialize the student, print the number of marks, sum of marks, maximum, minimum, and the average, student runner is happy. And we would want to change the code without affecting the functionality that is being exposed. This is called refactoring. So let's get started. I'm going to change the type of this to array list of integer. So we would want to store numbers in here. So I'm going to say it's array list of integer. I'll say import java.util. The other thing is we'll create a new array list directly in here. So let's create a new array list because over here I can directly take this and assign it to an array, but that's not possible with an array list. What we need to do with an array list is add each individual element. So we'll initialize a new array list in here and over here what we need to do now is instead of this dot max is equal to max what we need to do here is say this dot max dot add each element from the mark so the way i can do that is say for int mark in max i'm looping around it and adding each element to the array list so add mark let's follow the best practices and have a block so cool so now this would help you to add the marks to the array list right so now there are a few compilation errors that you would see in here actually there's one more compilation error length in array you have a attribute called length or a property called length but in array list if you want to get the size of an array list the method is size so that's something we can change marks dot size and the rest of this stuff does not need any change the rest of the code does not really need to change at all so let's now try and run the student runner class and the output of it does not really change so what we have done until now is change the internal representation of marks inside the student from an array to an array list one of the other things that we can do is change the implementation of this. Here we wrote the logic to find maximum by ourselves. But the awesome thing is array list is part of something called collections. We will talk about collections a lot in the separate section related to collections. But collections also has a lot of utility methods. One of the utility methods is max. So it, if you pass a collection to it, array list is a connect collection. So if you pass a collection to it, it would be able to return the max as well. So it would be able to do return collections.max and over here we would want to do return collections.min. Cool, right? So all the logic is now done by the collections class. We don't really need to implement a lot of stuff. Let's now go ahead and run this to make sure it's still the same output. Okay, the output remains exactly the same. That's cool. Now we have a way where we would actually have a complete class based on an array list. One of the other things I would want to be able to do is I would want to be able to print the content of student by just using something very simple. So I would want to be able to say system.out.println student. And I would want to be able to see the content of the student class. So right now, if you look at it, this is what is being printed. So system.out.println student prints system.out.com.in 28 minutes array student some garbage or it's not really garbage it's where this particular hash code of it so let's not worry about that but what what we would want to be able to do is to print the exact content of this student object 
the way we can do that in java is by defining a two string method so if you do a public string if i say over here for now let's just return name of the student right so what we are doing is public string two string and returning name so you'd see that if i do system dot out dot print enough of student it's printing name so it's printing name of the student along with the name i would also want to print the marks of the student so i can do something like name plus marks right i mean this is kind of very very trivial so now you can see ranga with the marks present in here that's cool right so that's a two string representation of this specific class because there is one concatenation only being done in here it's okay to use a string if i was concatenating 10 different values then probably we should have considered to use a string buffer but this is fine so it's name plus marks and we are returning that particular thing back in this video we refactored the student class to use an array list instead of an array in the next step we would look at adding the delete and the add marks methods until then bye bye welcome back in the previous video we completed the refactoring from switching to a array to an array list in this video let's focus on adding the remaining two challenges that were left out student dot add new mark and student dot remove mark at a specific index right so let's start with student dot add mark so we would want to add a mark at the end of the thing right so add mark now i'm um, uh, i've done control one and created the new method so add mark i would call this mark so you can tab between them and over here i can add the mark to the list so marks dot add mark that's it right so now that's cool and i'll go to the student runner we have already printed the student before that so i'll print the student after adding the mark let's see what would be the result mm -hmm. so you can see that ranga before had three marks and now there's a fourth subject for which we have a mark as well that's cool right with simple method call we are able to add it in next method we would want to add in is remove mark at index right so we would want to remove marks at a specific index how can i do that i can say create method remove mark at index and let's go ahead and tap through and this one i would want to say index as you can see we focus a lot on making sure that the names of the variables are relevant right so marks dot remove and we would want to remove the object at a specific index so we would want to pass the index in so let's do that and now if you execute the code you'd see oops i've not printed the student after the change so let's do that and let's print that out right now mm -hmm. you can see that the element at index one so this is the list from which we are trying to delete an element and the index one is 98 so 98 is removed and we have 9735 you can try other operations and you would see that they work exactly as you would expect them to work in this video what we did was we added the other operations that we wanted to add into the student class to add a new mark and remove a mark at a specific index until the next step bye bye welcome back in this section we got introduced to the concept of arrays we understood why we need arrays because we want to store data of same type multiple types and varying amount of data so that's why we wanted to have arrays we implemented a number of operations using arrays right so we started with implementing number of marks sum of marks maximum minimum and we implemented average marks as well after that we realized the fact that with arrays adding and removing elements is a challenge and that's where we switched to array list we discussed about some of the basic operations which we can do with array list and we added in our new operations as well one of the important things that you need to remember is array list is part of something called collections we have a different section where we would talk about collections in depth and over there we would talk about a lot more things related to array list i hope you had a lot of fun doing this section and i'll see you in the next section until then bye bye welcome 
back. Welcome to this section on object oriented programming again. In the previous section, we understood the fact that objects have state and behavior. However, all the objects that we had created until now had really simple state. They either had a couple of variables representing the state and had a few methods representing behavior. In this section, we will take it one step further. We will create a lot more variables representing the state and also we would talk about behavior and think about what are the methods you can create to represent the behavior. We will also talk about an important concept called object composition. The classes that we create can contain instances of other classes. So the checking account here can contain a customer which is also another class that we have created. We'll discuss about object composition and how you can create state and behavior while using object composition. After that, we would move into some of the most important concepts related to object-oriented programming. We will talk about inheritance, why we need it, what are the basics, and we'll discuss a few puzzles about inheritance. We will talk about an abstract class, why do we need an abstract class, and talk a little bit about practical uses around abstract classes. After that, we would get into interfaces. Interfaces is a very important concept and people confuse between interfaces and abstract classes. We'll discuss how to think about uh, interface and how it is really different from an abstract class. We'll end the section talking about polymorphism. I'm excited about this section because there are a wide range of topics that we would be talking about. I'll see you in the first step of this section. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's look at a few of the basics that we discussed in the previous section on object-oriented programming and also look at what are the things you need to think about when you are designing a class. Let's get started with the basics of a class, right? A class is nothing but a template. You create objects based on this template. So Ducati is a instance of the motorbike class. Honda is an instance of the motorbike class as well. These instances are called objects. So Ducati is an object, Honda is an object. The motorbike class has a member variable called speed. The Ducati can have a value for that speed. We are setting it to 100 here. And Honda can have a different value for that speed. And this is called state of an object. In this example, we just have one member variable representing the state. But you can have a number of member variables which are representing the state of a specific object. The state of an object is nothing but what are the values that the member variables have at that point in time. The important thing is the state can change, right? So initially the speed was 200, but at a later point in time, we are increasing the speed or decreasing the speed. Now, how are we representing the state change? The state change is happening through the methods that we expose. Over here, if you look at the motorbike class, we are exposing a number of methods to provide information about the state or to make a change to the state of this object. So these methods are called the behavior of an object. So objects have a state, which is what are the values for the member variables, and a behavior. That's basically the methods that are exposed by an instance of that specific object. Now, typically, whenever we are designing classes, we need to decide three important things. One is, what is the state? So what are the different variables, member variables that would represent the current state of a motorbike. Here we have speed. Maybe you would want to have something like a color of a motorbike, make of a motorbike, or a wide variety of other variables to represent the state of a motorbike. Which gear is it in? And all that kind of stuff, right? The second important decision that you need to make is what are the constructors? How do you want to allow the construction of a motorbike? In this example, what we did was, okay, when somebody directly creates a motorbike instance, we said, okay, we will give it a speed of five. Or we can also create a motorbike by setting the initial speed. In the next step, we would discuss about a few other options you can think about when we are creating the constructors. The third decision you need to make 
is behavior right what are the operations that you would want to allow on the object in the next step we would add a lot more state and also a lot more behavior into our objects in this step we quickly revise the important terminology class object state and behavior and also we discuss about the three important steps that you need to follow when you are thinking about any specific object what is the state what are the constructors how do you want to allow creation of it and what is the behavior what are the methods that can act on it in the next step we'll try and use this and design another simple class until then bye bye welcome back in the previous video we talked about a few important questions that you need to ask when you are talking about your classes right so the first one is what is the state that means what are the member variables you need to have and the second one is how do you want to allow creation of a specific object that is what are the constructors that you would want to allow third one is what is the behavior you would want to allow that's basically the member methods let's consider an example right a ceiling fan the fan here is not really a fan of a actor actress or a director what we are talking about is a ceiling fan which gives you a little bit of wind right that's the fan we are talking about so for this fan class you can think about what are the different elements that represent the state of a specific fan object you can think about how you want to allow construction of a fan object and you can also think about the behavior what kind of changes you would want to allow in the state of a fan class you can pause the video in here i have left out a few clues in here about how i think about it now i would recommend you to pause the video in here and also think about how you represent the state what are the different constructors you would want to have and what are the different behaviors that you would want to allow you can pause the video here okay let's start with the solution right so i said over here i said the state i am looking at is make radius color is on and speed so basically what we are doing in here is we are saying this is the manufacturer this is the radius of a wing of a fan and this is the color of the fan and this is whether it's on or off and if it's on or what is the speed so those are the different things that are important to represent the state but you might be thinking of a wide range of other stuff as well we'll use these variables to represent this state before we get into the constructors let's represent these in here right so i'm going to copy this let's create a new project i'll call it object oriented programming two that's the name i'm giving it and you can go ahead and click the finish button so this would create a project and over here i can actually go ahead and create a new java class right so new G java class i'd want to call this what do i want to call this i would want to call this fan runner right so as usual we'll go with the fan runner com dot in 28 minutes dot oops level two so let's use that as the package name and click finish right i could have actually created a main as well main control space okay now we have a main method which we can use to run so now i'll go ahead and say fan fan is equal to new fan right so let's create a fan class control one create fan okay i'll use the same package so i don't need a main so finish that's cool so we have the fan class right now now let's think about the state we would want to have these are all the variables so let's quickly create them so make um, i would want to say private string make and radius i would want to actually represent using uh double is fine because it's not going to uh, change i'm not going to do a lot of calculations around it so double is fine if i am going to do calculations using it then probably big decimal would be the right choice for color private string color is fine and for ease on how do you represent it think about it whether it's on or off right boolean and speed uh, let's say there are five levels and i would represent it uh, for enough using a byte because that's more than sufficient the speeds let's say can be one to five or something of that kind typically when we are doing a lot of programming like this we would use enums for speed we would use enums for color and maybe make as well at a later point in time we, when we talk about enums we would be discussing why enums and how enums for enough let's use the basic data types right so let's go ahead now 
over here the first decision that we would need to make was the state so we are using these variables to represent the state of the object second important decision that we would typically need to make is how to allow creation of the objects right so how do you decide what kind of constructors do you want to allow the question you need to typically ask is what are the most important things that this object cannot live without right so a make is definitely needed because when i create a fan i should know the make and when i create a fan radius also is important right so can i really have a fan without wings so the radius becomes important and also the color right so when i create a fan i can say color is also mandatory right the fan might be off or on so this is not really important and the speed might be 0 to 5 right so it does not need to be 1 so when it's off the speed is 0 so it can be anything between 0 to 5 so speed is also not really important when I'm creating a fan the constructor I would want to create is at the basic level they should be able to have these three things specified so over here when we are creating the fan object we are specifying nothing in here but I don't think that's a good practice so because we are allowing creation of a fan without specifying the make without specifying the radius and without specifying the color so what we want to do is we would want to create a constructor public fan to which i would want to pass in string make double radius and string color this would ensure that anybody who's creating fan object would pass in this value so let's go ahead and implement this dot make is equal to make and this dot radius is equal to radius and this dot color is equal to color that's cool right so now we have the initial state of a fan ready but you'd see a compilation error because now the default constructor does not any exist as soon as you provide a constructor Java will not provide the default constructor so we would need to provide value so I'll say manufacturer one and the radius let's just say it's 0 0.34567 meters I mean does not really matter some value and fan uh, let's say the color of it is green we have established the state for a fan and we also established the constructor for the fan now I would want to actually print the state of the current object so what are the values which are present in the fan as of now right so typically how we would do that is this out fan right so let's try and print this it's printing the package name and the class and the hash code of it from memory what we want to print is the values so how do I make this print the values I can create a two string method right so public two string Oops, it should return a string back what I would want to return is a string of this format right so I would want to say make is some value comma radius is some value comma color is some value and we would want to have the value of is on and we want to have the value of speed right so that's basically all the values that you would want to have the thing we can do is use string concatenation I can say make um, plus I can put this in a string and plus radius and things like that but you don't want to do a lot of string concatenations because it creates unusual unnecessary objects the other way to do that is by using a string dot format method so I can say a string dot format it's one of the methods which is present in string so we specify the format in here and then you can specify the values so over here we would want to have make radius color and is on and speed and we need to specify where the values have to be used the first one is make percentage s it's a string radius is a double so we should use percentage f and color is a string percentage s is fine uh, is on is a boolean percentage b and speed is a integer percentage d so return string dot format what we are doing in here is we are providing a string representation of the entire object so we can see the entire state of the object just by calling the two string method whenever you try to do a system dot out dot print ln as long as you are ma matching this syntax right public string to string 
this method would be automatically called and the output from this method is printed. So let's see what happens. You can see now that make is manufacturer 1, radius is so and so, color is green, is on is false and speed is 0. So when we create an instance of the class, we are actually getting the default values, right? So for is the on and speed, this gets a default value of false and this gets a value of zero. That's cool because that's the state typically when we create a fan. In this video, what we are looking at is what is the state that you would want to represent a fan with and how do you want to allow the creation of a fan object? We also looked at how to print the current state of a fan, right? In the next step, what we look at is what are the different methods that we would want to allow to alter the behavior of a fan? Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous step, we created a constructor for the fan and created a method to print the content of the fan, print the current state of a fan, right? So this is what we have right now. Now, let's focus on the behavior. What is the behavior that I would want to allow on a fan object, right? So, is there a chance that once I have an object of a fan, it's make changes or a radius changes, color changes? Nope. Very little chance that any of these change once I have created them, right? So, the two things which might typically change, whether it's on or off and the speed, right? So, those are the two things on which we can expose behavior. So, I can start off down here. So typically two string would be the last method in a class. That's kind of a convention. It's not really necessary. So now I can create methods to modify the ease on variable. So I can actually create methods saying public void ease on and I can ask the consumer to pass in the value, right? I can say boolean ease on and I can do something of this kind. This dot is on is equal to is on. So what would happen if in this kind of situation, the way it would work is if let's say I would want to fan dot set fan dot is on false, right? So that's the state. And now if I print it, is on would have a value of false. Or I can say is on true, right? and is on would have a value of true. So this is one way of doing it, but the way I like to do things is by thinking about the consumer, right? So instead of is on true or false, I like this kind of methods much better. So public void switch on and say this dot is on is equal to true and switch off this dot is on is equal to false. From the consumer perspective, I feel this kind of a syntax is much more usable. So when we are thinking about behavior, you are thinking about the consumer who is using your API. So instead of saying is on, you can say fan dot switch on, right? This is much more useful API for a consumer to read. And you can see that is on is right now true. Now, after that, he can say fan dot switch off. And we would see that after the switch off, the state of the fan is on becomes false. So this is kind of the way you need to think. Think always from the perspective of your consumer. What, what is the behavior that he would expect from your specific object? Now, the other thing I can change of this is the speed, right? So I can expose a simple method for changing the speed. So I can say public void set speed int speed and Actually, we are using a byte, so let's make it byte speed. This dot speed is equal to speed. So that's cool. Now let's do fan dot set speed five. Let's typecast this to a byte to make sure that we make the compiler happy and say we are using a byte in here. So let's run this right now. Now you can see that the speed is five, but when it's off, it's setting the speed remains five, right? So now I can think about the behavior. When somebody switches off the fan, I'd want to actually set the speed to zero, right? I just need to add a typecast as well because I'm representing it as a byte. So set speed byte of zero. By default, this is int. 
so to make it a byte i'm making it a typecast in here so to convert this to a byte and we can use that right similar to this we can actually when somebody switches on the fan if you'd want to actually set a default speed you can actually do that as well so you can set default speed to 5 now let's run this you can see make speed is 5 and when you make it off speed is 0 in between you can alter the speed right so I can set it to 3 so after switching on let's print it and now the speed is becoming 3 and switch off after that we are printing it again so let's see what would happen so when this when I switch on the fan the speed becomes 5 I'm making the change in the speed to 3 and I'm switching off to 0 so what we are looking at in here is what are the operations that I would want to allow on a fan and we are trying to implement them and also trying to implement the logic for them right so what we are doing is all the logic related to a fan we are actually putting it inside the fan class itself so the switch on not only turns on the fan but also sets a specific speed switch off would set the is on to false and also set the speed to zero so the important thing to realize is these are not just getters and setters typically when people start thinking about objects the only methods that they would expose from a specific object is getters and setters related to that that's not really a good practice you need to start thinking about how a consumer would be using your objects and create methods which make it easy to use your objects in the last couple of steps what we're trying to do is to apply what we have learned about designing a class right we need to think about the state how do you want to allow creation of the object and also we would want to think about what is the behavior you would want to allow so we were trying to take that thought process and apply it to a fan class i'll leave you with one exercise where you can think about a rectangle class right so a rectangle has a length and a width you can think about what constructors you would want to allow the rectangle to have and what operations you would want to allow on a typical rectangle think about it and i'll see you in the next video until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we'll discuss the exercise from the previous step. What we wanted to do is create a rectangle class. And we talked about length and width. And we wanted to think about how do we want to allow creation of those objects. And what are the operations that you would want to allow. So let's get started with a new class, rectangle runner as usual. And I would add a main method and press enter to do a finish this is cool and let's directly start with creating a rectangle class rectangle rectangle is equal to new rectangle All right so i'll do a control one create a rectangle class and i would yep i think that's cool let's do a finish now we have a rectangle class and we have a rectangle runner class now let's start thinking about oops typo in here which should have been rectangle so cool so we have a rectangle class the first decision you need to make is what is this state so what are the different things that constitute the important things about a rectangle let's keep it simple and use an int so int length oops and let's get a width in here right so when we create a rectangle object can it exist without a length and the width nope right so i would want to create a length and a width so this is the constructor that i would need to allow so control one and i will say create constructor int length and int width because a construct a rectangle without length and width does not really make sense right so they are mandatory so the constructor i would want to allow is this length is equal to length and this dot width is equal to width let me just move these values up cool so now we have length width and we have a constructor with the length and the width now we thought about the state we thought about creation of the rectangle the next thing we want to do is think about the operations the operations that i would want to typically do are maybe the current state of the rectangle right so we can create a two string public string two string and return the current state that's one thing which we can do now what are the other things that i can do what are the other operations that i would want to expose on the rectangle right so typically 
you might want to change the length and the width that's one thing you can do so for that you might expose getters on the length and getters on the width and setters on the length and setters on the width right so those are basic kind of operations so you can do all shift s or right click source generate getters and setters and you can choose length and width so this would generate the getters and setters right so that's the basic stuff we have get length set length get width and set width now what more operations do you want to allow the operations i can think of are probably calculating the area right so i would want to be able to calculate the area so i'll set pub int area so what's the area of a rectangle length into width that's the area right so return length into width and the other operation i can think about is perimeter of a rectangle right perimeter so return two into length plus width right so that's the other operation now let's go ahead and implement the two string return string dot format i want to have what's the way i would want so i'll say length width let's also include the area and the parameter perimeter in the state length again all of these are integers so i can say percentage d width percentage d area percentage d perimeter is also percentage d and the arguments that we need to pass in are length width now area is a method so area perimeter cool okay let's now see with the rectangle runner how things are so rectangle we are ready now i will say sys out rectangle and let's change the width and print the content as well so rectangle dot set it's rectangle dot set width i'll change it to 25 and let's see what would be the output after that let's see what would happen now okay length is 12 23 area is being calculated and the perimeter is also being calculated over here 374 so in this short video we discussed about a rectangle how you represent the state of a rectangle how do you represent the creation of the rectangle and what are the operations that you can allow always think from the perspective of a consumer so whoever is using the api whoever is using the methods that you are exposing from your object think from their perspective and create methods which would make it easy for them to use it that's the essence of how you design your objects even though you might be thinking hey i am the one who's using these objects why do i need to think about from the perspective of somebody else i think that good design always starts from thinking outside in that's basically thinking from the perspective that somebody else is going to use this and thinking how they would want to use it so kind of putting yourself in the shoes of somebody who's using your class is the best way to think about the design of a class in the next steps we would move towards creating more complex objects until then bye bye welcome back in the examples we looked at until now we were taking objects which contains simple values in them string double boolean byte right so we use simple values to represent the state of the object however state of an object can get much more complex than that you can have an object inside another object this is called object composition from this step on let's focus a little bit on object composition and look at the kind of complexities it would bring in let's get started with a simple example right so you would have a customer who has an address right so i can have customer class created let's call this customer runner and i would say public static void main and finish right so this is as usual now i would go ahead and create a customer class is equal to new customer 
and create class customer. Let's go ahead and do that. Cool, right? So we now have a customer runner, a customer class. Um, typically, when we talk about a customer, let's say a bank account customer or some kind of customer, right? So this guy would have a name, let's say private. This is kind of a primitive value, right? Uh, he has a name, but he might also have an address. The address is something which can be an object on its own, a class on its own address, right? So now what we are doing in here is called object composition because customer has an address and we will represent the address as another class, control one. And we are saying create class address. Over here, let's take a very, very simple address, right? So when we talk about addresses, they can get really, really complex. So line one, line two, line three, and so on and so forth. Let's just say we have line one, let's say city and a pin code. You can add in a lot more details to the address. Um, I mean, a country, state, and also line two, line three, and stuff like that. For now, let's st st stop with this. Okay, so this is called zip in most of the countries. So instead of pin code, I'm calling a zip. And now you'd see that this customer contains an address. This is called object composition. So customer object contains a reference to an instance of the address object, right? So when we design our classes, one of the important things that I would start with is what's the relationship between the different objects that are involved here? Customer contains an address. Now, if I take it a step further, I can even say a customer might contain a home address and a work address, right? So now this makes it much, much more complex. When we design our construction of the object, so this is representing the state of the object. So the state of the object for customer represents a name, a home address, and a work address. Now, when I talk about creating a customer object, now I would need to start thinking about more details. So whenever I create a customer, do I need an address always? So is home address mandatory when I'm creating a customer? If it is mandatory, then I would include it in the constructor. If it is not mandatory, then I would not include it in the constructor. For example, let's assume it is mandatory. So public customer, and I can actually start saying string name, comma, address. Let's say home address is mandatory, work address is not really mandatory. So I would start with something of this kind. So I would say this dot name is equal to name and this dot home address is equal to home address. Similar to the earlier steps, we would also think about what are the operations that we need to allow, right? So for a customer, what are the operations that you would want to allow? So let's say once a name is set, you don't really want to allow changing a name. Let's say home address, you'd want to allow certain modifications and work address, you'd want to I love certain operations. So you can actually create methods for them. So let's create getters for them. So all shift test or right click source generate, generate getters and setters. I would not want to generate getters and setters for name. I would want to only generate getters and setters for home address and work address. So you now have operations which are defined. So let's pick this and move this below operations. So now somebody who creates a customer can create it with a name and a home address. And when the home address changes, they can do set home address. And if they want to add in a work address, they can actually say set work address as well. That's cool, right? So now address, um, now we need to think about how do we want to allow creation of an address, right? Let's assume to keep it simple that all these are mandatory. I can generate the constructor, right? So all shift S, right click source, generate constructors using fields. And I would use all these three fields. And now we have a constructor with all these three fields present. So whenever we think about a class and creation of a class, we think about what are the important things that are essential. And what are not essential, we would probably get, create a setters for that. In this example, we assumed everything is important. Now, you'd also think about, okay, you'd want to allow modifications of a li line one city or zip. I think I would not want to allow modifications. If somebody wants to, uh, update the address, they can create a new address object and set it as the address to the customer. If I look at the customer runner class, there's a compilation error because we changed the 
customer creation process. You can try and pause the video in here and try and create a customer object with a address value and the name and see if you can do it on your own. Now, let's go ahead and try and do this. So first thing I would want to do is to have a customer, I would need to have a name, right? So I'll put name as Ranga and we would need to pass in a home address. So home address, so home address, I'll create an address object. So address, home address is equal to new address of, we have a line one and we have a city, let's say it's Hyderabad and we need to pass in a zip, right? So let's say 500035 is a zip. So this is how we can create a customer object, right? Now, if I want to set a work address, customer.set work address, I can do work address and I can create another instance for the work address. Let's say it's a line one for work and let's say I'm working in Hyderabad and let's say in a different pin code. So this is how I can actually set a work address, right? So what we are doing in here is we created simple instance of the address and we created a customer with that address. We created work address and set the work address into the customer as well. Now, if I print the customer, what would you see? Customer. We did not create a two string, so it would print the customer entirely. So what we'll do is we'll also create a two string, simple two string. So we'll start with the address, public string, two string. And let's return very simple one for now. Let's keep it very simple. Line one plus space plus city. You can also use a string dot format to format it in a much better way. For now I'm keeping it very simple and written the concatenation of everything back. And in the customer, let's concatenate public string to string. And in the customer, it, we have work address and home address. So let's do using string dot format, string dot format. First, let's decide the format. So let's customer has a name. So let's print the name first. And after that, customer has a home address. Let's print that next. And next, he has a work address. Let's print that after that, right? So values that need to be passed in are name, um, home address, and work address, right? So it's it's quite simple, right? So you can you should be able to work this out very easily on your own. And over here, name is a string. Um, home address is an object. We would want to get the string representation of it. So percentage S, work address is also an object. So I'll put percentage S. So what we have in here is very simple piece of code, right? So we are printing string dot format this. Now let's see what would happen if I run this. Okay, now it says name Ranga, home address line one, Hyderabad 500035, work address line one for work, Hyderabad 500078. That's cool, right? So that's uh, how object composition is supposed to work. What we are doing in here is simple object composition, right? So we are creating an address and setting it into the customer. We're also creating a work address and setting it to the customer as well. If I actually print it, print the customer before this, you would see that work address would be null. So if I actually run this again, you'd see that, you can see that the work address here is null. The important thing to get out of all these series of videos about object-oriented programming is the way we are approaching object-oriented design, right? So first thing is we would decide the classes, then we would decide the composition, how each com class is composed. Over here, we decided the customer would have two instances of the address class, that's called composition. And then we would decide about how you'd want to allow creation of the objects. After that, you'd start thinking about the different operations that are involved. The focus behind these steps has been to get you initiated with object-oriented programming thinking. So we are creating simple classes, simple operations, and now we were looking at object composition. Before moving into more complex object-oriented stuff, we will look at a simple exercise in the next video. Until that step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this quick exercise, let's do a exercise on object composition. So let's talk about a book. A book has an ID, name, and an author. 
I mean, we can create actually author as a separate class on its own, but let's keep it simple. Let's say author, we only store the name and it's a string. We'll also store a list of reviews for a book, right? So each review has an ID, description, and a rating, right? So let's represent rating using an int, description as a string, and ID as a int as well. So this is the kind of code that I would want to do, right? So I would want to be able to create a book, passing in an ID for the book, the name of the book, and the author, and I would want to be able to add in reviews. So a book can have multiple reviews, so you can call the I review method multiple times to add reviews on a book, right? And at the end, when I print system.out.println book, it should print the content of the book and the reviews associated with it. You can pause the video here before you can look at the solution. Now, let's get started with the solution for this problem. I've created three classes, book runner, book, and review. So book runner is just the main method. So this contains exactly the code as we saw in the description of the problem, right? So it contains the book. So the if you look at the book constructor, it's very simple, right? So you have an ID, name, and author passed in. So we have a field called ID, name, string, author, string as well. The interesting part of this is the reviews. So because reviews are multiple, so the relationship between book and the reviews is one to many. One book can have multiple reviews. So what we are doing in here is storing the reviews as an array list. So I'm initializing the array list right here, new array list. And in the add review method, what we do is we add the review passed in to the reviews. The add review method takes in a review and adds it to the array list. And the review class is quite simple, right? So you have an ID rating and description, and we have the constructor set getting all these values and setting it into the local fields. In each of these classes, we have a simple two string method, which is just concatenating the values and returning them back, right? So if I run this, you can see uh, that I have a book, ID, name, author, and a few reviews for the book as well. In the next step, let's move into more complex things related to object-oriented programming. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will discuss about one of the most important concepts in object-oriented programming called inheritance. Before that, let's create a very simple class, right? So I'll create a new class. I'll put it in the package level 2.inheritance. And I'll call this class as person. So I'll create a person class. Let's say a person has a name. Um, let's say I would want to have his email address. And let's say we have his phone number. Right? I'm making it very simple. I'm just doing all of them as very simple strings. Let's create the getters and setters, all shift S, or right click source generate. I'll select all. So this is a very simple class, person, right? Now, let's say I would want to create a new class called student. So in addition to the person class, I'd want to have a few more details in the student. One of the ways to do that is by copying the person class, pasting it, and calling it student. It would create a new student class. And over here, we have the same details as we have in the person. And now I can store a few more details, right? Private string. Let's say I would want to store the college, which college she's studying in. Let's have an integer representing which year he is studying. What we did is we replicated exactly the same code that is present in here. So we have the same getters and setters because we copied the co code over. Now I can also create getters and setters for the remaining things, right? Right click, source, generate getters and setters for college and year, right? When you look at these two classes, you'd see a lot of duplication between them, right? So the person has name, email, phone number, and also these methods. And student also has the same methods and same fields. In addition to this, student has college and year, and setters and getters for college and year. Between these two classes, we are duplicating a lot of code. 
because the same code is present in both these classes these three lines of code and also these lines of code until set phone number so these six methods are duplicated in both this person class and the student class now duplication is a very bad thing to do because later let's say i would want to change email from a string let's say to i'm creating an object called email then i would need to change it in the student class as well as in the person class let's say instead of the name i would want to split it into first name last name and middle name even that change i would need to do it in the student class and the person class as well and that's difficult to maintain that's where inheritance comes in inheritance helps us to reuse the code inside the person class and create a new class called student which only has the new thing that it would want to contain so we would want to extend the person class and create a student class and have a few additional attributes and methods that's what inheritance allows us to do what i'll do now is i'll rename this class so rename refactor and rename i'll just told this to student without inheritance right that's not good so i'm leaving it as a reference for you for a later point in time for now what i would want to do is i would want to create a new class called student so i'll create a new class called student finish and this student class i would want to get all the features all the attributes which are defined in here all the member variables which are defined in here along with all the methods how do i do that it's by using the keyword extends and i can extend person so by doing just this specific thing you'd get all the things that are present in the person class and in addition you'd be able to do new things let's say i would want to store the college name private string college name and private int year right and i can generate the getters and setters for this as well i click so generate getters and setters and i'll select both of these select all and press okay now when we actually try and use this object is when you realize the power of inheritance let's go ahead and create a new class i'll call this student runner and i'll add a main method in here over here what i'll do is i'll create a student class student student is equal to new student so over here you'd see when i do a student dot you'd have all the methods that are present in the student which are college name and year in addition we also have the methods which are present inside the person class so get email get name get phone number and also you would have the set methods as well so set email set name set phone number set year and set college name so basically what we are doing is by extending the person class we are inheriting everything from the person class in this kind of relationship student extends person person is called the super class and student is called the sub class and what we are doing in here is called inheritance so in inheritance subclass extends superclass and subclass gets all the features which are present in the superclass thereby what we can do is say student dot set name ranga so we are able to set the name as ranga we will be able to set email id as well right so email let's say it's in 28 minutes at gmail.com so let's say that's the email so you can do all that stuff inside the student class even though inside the student itself there is no set method for neither the email nor the name in this step we introduced you to the basic concept of inheritance the way we would do inheritance is by saying student extends person student is a subclass person is a superclass and we saw that student now contains all the details that are present in person as well as the details that are present in the student so inheritance is a great way of reusing code which is present in other classes however it might not be always good to have inheritance relationship inheritance is called a 
is a relationship you can see that in here right student is a person so student is a person that's the reason why we are extending person class as a student some places you might have code you would want to reuse but if there is no easy relationship between those two classes it is not really recommended to use inheritance we'll discuss this and a lot more in the subsequent videos until then bye bye welcome back in this video we'll discuss about one of the most important concepts about inheritance that is that every class which does not extend anything actually extends object class okay what am i saying let's see that with an example right so we have a person class present control shift r person dot java right we have a person class with name email phone number the methods which are present in here are get name set name get email set email get phone number set phone number right that's cool right so let's now create an instance of that class right person person is equal to new person right person dot as soon as i do a dot you'd see a number of new methods come in which are not defined in the person class at all equals you are seeing here a notify notify all you see a hash code in here you see a to string and a wait method as well now where are all these coming in from think about it right i have not really defined these methods called equals or hash code or notify in the person class where are we getting them from this is because of a feature in java that's basically that if you don't actually extend anything in java every class extends object so this is what is happening in the background there is a class called object in java you can do a control and click over it and it would open in the object dot class and this object class is the root of the class hierarchy that means that every other class would either inherit from object or it would inherit from some other class which is inheriting from object so it's root of the class hierarchy as you can see in here it says all objects including arrays implement the methods of this class so over here you'd find a number of methods like hash code equals clone two string is also present in here that's the reason why we would be able to do things like person dot two string and let's say this returns a value back let's say i would want to print this out value i'll also print sys out person so the two string method is something which we get because of the fact that person extends object class if i don't do this what would happen is java would automatically add that extends in and we would see that this code which is present in here would continue running let's comment this piece of code which is present in here and run so you'd see that now i can see both of them are printing the same thing what happens when i do a system dot out dot println person is internally this would call person dot to string this is what is happening so whenever we send an object and try to print it the to string method gets called the to string is implemented inside the object class and that's why we are able to get it there are a wide range of other methods which are present in the object class let's not really worry about them right now equals hash code and other stuff we'll talk about them in subsequent sections for now the important thing that you need to understand is if a class does not extend anything like the person class in here then it would by default extend object and gets a lot of functionality from the object class in the next step we we'll look at an important feature in inheritance called method overriding until then bye bye in the last step we discuss the fact that by default all classes extend object class all classes are subclasses of object class if i don't specify anything here i'm extending an object class right so let's say 
I directly specify it in here just to make it really explicit, right? And I know that in the object class, we have a definition for the two string method, right? So if you search here, control F for two string, you'd find the definition of the two string method, right? The two string method is printing the name of the class, a thread, the hash code. That's the default implementation that is provided by object. Thing is, you can override this definition in your class. So let's see what's happening right now and we'll override this and see what would happen after that. Okay. So let's get started. Now, when I printed this value person earlier, we saw that this is the thing which is being printed. This is coming from the two string method, right? This is the name of the class, including the package name at, and this is the hash code. Where are these things coming from? This is coming from this in here, right? The name of the class at now, I, for person class, I don't want to do this. I would want to change the implementation of the two string method. So instead of the at, I would want to re put something else. So I'll say hash in here, right? I'm just copying that code in here and putting in hash. It doesn't like, you can even just remove everything and just put hash in here. Just what we wanted to see is what would happen now if I run this in here, right? So we are printing person. Let's see what would happen you'd see that is printing hash because now in the person class we are saying don't use whatever is coming from here we are saying directly use what i am providing in person class we are overriding the implementation which is provided by the object class so whatever you give in here is what is represented as the two string for person class so let's run this again you'd see that both of them are printed as hash now you can actually override this to have all the values, right? So name plus hash plus email plus hash is not really good because we are using string concatenation plus phone number. Now you would see when I run this program that this is what gets printed null, null, null because we have not really set any values into the person object at all. So if you go ahead and set values into the person, person dot set name, Ranga, person dot set email, let's just say Ranga at in 28 minutes dot com, person dot set phone number, let's say is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And now if we run it, you'd see that we are printing the value of what is present in here. However, we saw that if I remove this method, what would happen? The code inside the object class comes into picture. So in this subclass, I can override the implementation which is provided by the super class. So super class is providing an implementation. And if we want to override that in the subclass, we can do that by implementing the same method and returning a different value back. In this step, we looked at what is called overriding. We looked at how to override a two string method. In some of the earlier steps, we did an override of two string, but at that point in time, we did not really understand what was happening in the background. Now, we know that object has a two string method and because person extends object by default, we can override that and provide a new implementation for this specific method. So until now, we talked about a few important things related to inheritance. One of the things is when you inherit from other class, you inherit all the features present in that specific class. That includes the member variables which are present in here. That includes the member methods which are present in here as well. And also we looked at something called overriding. Overriding is when you would want to override the implementation which is provided by a super class inside your subclass. In the subclass, we can provide a different implementation for that particular method. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's discuss about an exercise related to inheritance. What we want to do is we want to create a class called employee. We want to extend the person class. So you would want to extend the person class and create a class called employee. And the employee should have a title and a employer name, 
uh, employee grade salary so these are the four fields in addition to those which are present in person that we would want to have in employee class and also we would want to create a two string method in employee which would print all the values including those of the person so from the employee class i would also want to print all the values which are present in the person as well this is because when i'm trying to print an employee it means i'm printing not only the title employer employee grade and salary but also i would want to print the name phone and email you can pause the video in here and you can try that as an exercise now let's look at the solution for this what we want to do is create a new class called employee so employee if you want to actually extend and identify the super class in here you can do that as well i'll do it inside the code itself implement not sorry implement it extends extends person and the attributes which we want to have are title so i'll say private string title private let's have it as a string for now employer name private care employee grade and private i would want to be accurate with the salaries so let's put big decimal salary i can do a control one and import java.math.big decimal that's cool i can do a right click source generate and get a setters and select everything so select all and press enter so now we have our employee class ready right so if i now go to the runner class and let's comment this code out and let's say i would want to create an employee class employee employee is equal to new employee employee dot set you can see that i get the set name set email and also the set phone number which are from the person class you can see person highlighted in the text in here as well small font and you would also have the methods which we have defined inside the employee class also so that's cool right so now we have all the methods that we have defined in here now let's go ahead and set values into it so i'll just try and copy the stuff which is present in here so instead of person it's employee and let's set a couple of details directly on the employee as well so employee dot set employer employee grade let's say his grade is a and employee dot set title let's call him programmer analyst right so let's set a few details in here now what we want to do the last exercise was to implement a two string to print all the values including those of person so how do we do that system how do we invoke two string so all that i need to do is say system dot out dot println employee right so now oops not caps it should be small now let if we run this what would happen now this is the two string which is being printed right ranga ranga at in 28 minutes dot com one two three four five six seven eight nine zero you can see that in the employee class we do not have a two string method at all where do we have the two string method inside the person class and that is what is written in the name email and the phone number so let's now quickly go ahead and implement the same thing in the employee class right so in the employee class let's do that so i'll say title employee name employee name actually it's employer name right and employee grade cool right so i'm not printing the salary let's we would want to keep salary private so let's not print that so if i run this so it's printing programmer analyst null because we did not set an employer name and it's printing a employee grade that's cool right so what we are doing in here student runner is we are trying to print the employee and these three these two values are getting printed but these three are not getting printed now how can i also print these values think about it how can i access the values of the person class from the employee class you can use something called a super so i can say hash plus super dot get email 
Super dot allows you to get values from the super class. Here I'm invoking a super class method here. So let's run this. You'd see that email is now appended. Even better option to do this is by saying, I'll, instead of appending at the end, I'll append at the start, right? Super dot to string plus hash. So what we are doing is we are calling to string on the super and then appending the specific details of this one. What would happen? It would now go ahead and append all the details. So these are all coming from the super class and these are from the subclass. In this short video, we were creating the employee class. We created four attributes. We extended the person class and we implemented the two string method and we call the super dot two string without the super dot two string the super class two string was not getting called so only the details which are present in the employee were being printed the details which are present in the person class were not getting printed to enable that we actually did a super dot two string which also got the details of the person and now when we print the content of the employee class we also see the content of the person class and the employee class and that's cool that's all for this step and i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the previous steps we talked a little bit about inheritance how we inherit all the features from the superclass and also how to call specific superclass methods and how to override them in this step let's focus on constructors and how they would work with superclasses the person class right now does not have any constructor, right? So let's go ahead and create a constructor. Let's say I don't want a person without a name to be created, right? So whenever a person is created, let's say I would want to mandatorily say you have to specify a name. So I'll say generate constructor using fields and choose I, email is not mandatory and phone number is not mandatory. So I'll want name to be the mandatory one. So now we have a constructor with name right so i'll remove the set name method which is present in here because i don't want to use the set name method anymore now what happens here is that the person now has a constructor with a name right so let's go ahead and see what's happening with all the compilation errors which are present in here so the first thing is there is no set name so that's the reason why this is failing because there is no set name method anymore now employee.java there's a compilation error here because it says implicit super constructor person is undefined for the default constructor and the same error would be present inside class now what's happening in here right so if i remove this constructor and save it it would automatically proceed however if i add this constructor in compilation errors what is happening why is the errors coming in the first thing is let's try and understand public let's just create a simple constructor and let's do a sysout person constructor right and let's go to the employee and let's create a constructor here as well public employee and sys out employee constructor now let's run this student runner class so we are creating an employee so let's see what would happen so you can see person constructor and employee constructors try and think about what is happening in the background so try and pause the video try and run the thing and try and think what's happening in the background why is the person constructor getting printed first and then the employee constructor is getting printed and then and at the end we have the employee details let's comment this and run this you can see that the person constructor is printed first and then the employee constructor is printed the way it works is as soon as i call the employee constructor here we are calling the employee constructor right so employee constructor implicitly there would be a call to something called super so as soon as i call the constructor a super method call would happen implicitly so if i explicitly call this 
then that's fine. If I don't, then Java compiler would automatically add the super class in. So the super class constructor would get called automatically. So remember this always. So whenever you create a constructor in the subclass, the first line automatically the super class constructor would be invoked. So that's the reason why first you see person constructor. So the call comes to employee, super method gets called and then the employee constructor is printed and that's what we are seeing in the output right now person constructor and then employee constructor is printed out whenever you create an object of a subclass the superclass constructor is automatically called even though i don't explicitly call it right even if i comment it out it would happen what's happening in our example what we did was in person class we created a new constructor so let me change this to a string name and say this dot name is equal to name now what would happen in this kind of situation we saw that there were compilation errors present in here let's see the employee class and the compilation error says implicit super constructor is undefined it's saying i'm trying to call super but there is nothing in here so one of the things which we can do is to say public person and create a default constructor right so once I do this, you'd see that the compilation errors in these two classes disappear. But we don't want to allow creating a person class without a name, right? What kind of person is he without a name, All right? So we want to make name mandatory. So what we want to do is when we are creating a student class or the employee class, we want them to pass in the name. So I would need to say string name. So whenever somebody is creating an employee, then I would want to make the name and the title mandatory. Then what would I need to do? So you are getting an another error in here, right? So even though I'm making it string and name, it's saying implicit super class person is undefined, must explicitly invoke another constructor. So what we can do in here is to say super of name. So what we are doing in here is we are saying, okay, I would call the superclass constructor with the name and then I can say this dot title is equal to title, right? So this is what we are doing. And let's go to the student class and also do something similar. He, even here we have an error. So it says implicit super constructor person is defined for default constructor, must define an explicit constructor. So it's saying, okay, person is undefined. I cannot call person. So if I don't provide a constructor the way it is is you have public student and what does it do by default it just calls super and now there is nothing called super present right super in the super class i have to pass in a name so that's the reason why this is failing that's the reason why what we'll do is we'll say string name and pass in name and for student let's make having a college name mandatory so college name and I can say this dot college name is equal to college name. Now I can go ahead and say student runner. When I create an employee, what I would need to give him a name, right? So I first give him a name. And then I would need to also give him a title, right? So I would give him a title, which is programmer analyst. Now let's try and execute the program and see what would be the output you can see that first the person constructor is printed then the employee constructor is printed and after that you have all the details so you can see the person details the name that we are setting in as well as the title which is present in the to string i'm sure this would have been an interesting video about inheritance and constructors the thing is if you don't really provide any constructors then implicitly the super class no argument constructor would be called so if there was a person constructor with no arguments in here that is what is called from both student and employee if student and employee don't have any constructors when you provide an explicit constructor in the super class with an argument then you need to call this constructor from both the subclasses and what we did was we called it by saying super of name.
we also saw the fact that if we don't really call super of name, the first line would be something called super. And in our situation right now, it gives us a compilation error because there is no default constructor which is present inside the person class. To make this compile, I have to call super of name. In summary, the most important thing you need to remember is from a subclass constructor, a super class constructor should definitely be called. It can either be explicit like what we are doing in here or if I remove this, it becomes implicit. I'll see you in the next video where we will be talking about a wide range of puzzles related to inheritance. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's talk about a few puzzles related to inheritance. Let's launch up JShell, launch your command prompt and type in JShell. It gets started. Let's create a simple class, right? So let's say I have a class called animal and let's say I have a class called pet, right? There is no relationship between this, right? So let's say I'm creating a class called dog and I'm saying extends animal comma pet. Is this allowed in Java? This is allowed in C++, but it's not allowed in Java because in Java, multiple inheritance is not really supported. While some people say you can actually extend two interfaces and that's multiple inheritance. For me, that's not really multiple inheritance. When we talk about interfaces, we'll discuss this in detail. But for now, you can see that I cannot extend two different classes at the same time. Multiple inheritance brings in a lot of complexities, which makes programming with C++ a little more difficult. That's the reason why Java chose not to have multiple inheritance at all. However, you can have a chain of relationships. So what I mean is, let's say I'm redefining the class animal. Now, let's say class pet is extending animal, right? So class pet can extend animal and say a new method, right? Public void groom. So a pet, we would want to groom, right? So basically, so I can do system.out.println groom. So now I have a pet class and we have an animal class and I have, have a dog class which extends pet. So what we have in have here is class animal, pet extends animal and dog extends pet. So now I can say dog, dog is equal to new dog. What would happen? This constructor gets called. After that, the pet class constructor gets called and then the animal class constructor gets called. And after that, do you think anything else gets called? Yes the object class constructor gets called because this extends object. What we are establishing here is called the inheritance hierarchy. So dog extends pet, pet extends animal, animal extends object. So that's kind of the inheritance hierarchy. So you can have an inheritance hierarchy, but you cannot have multiple inheritance in Java. So dog dog is equal to new dog. And when I say dog dot to string, what gets printed? The method get, which gets called is on the object. How does dog get the two string method? Because dog inherits pet, pet inherits from animal, animal inherits from object and object has the two string method and that's how dog gets the two string method as well. And also on the dog, you can call the groom method as well, right? So groom is also there. So it prints groom. How does it get groom? Because dog extends pet and pet defines the groom method. The fun part about all these stuff is you can have a superclass reference variable that can hold a subclass variable. What do I mean, right? So I can say pet, pet is equal to new dog. That's allowed. This is a subclass variable and it can be present in a superclass reference variable. So you can see that it's allowed and I can say pet dot groom and it prints groom. However, the reverse is not allowed. I cannot say dog dog is equal to new pet. This 
it says incompatible types pet cannot be converted to dog so you can hold the reference variables of a subclass in a superclass variable pet is a superclass and dog is the subclass so you can in this superclass variable i can hold the subclass variable the last important thing that we would want to talk about is something called instance of so if i say pet instance of pet it's true pet instance of dog it's true so you can check whether the current object is an instance of any of the superclasses then it returns true so pet instance of string it says error it cannot be converted to a string you can say pet instance of animal true pet instance of object so instance of can be used to find out if the current object is an instance of a specific class let's create an instance of the new animal class animal is equal to new animal in the previous example what we did was we actually created pet as a new dog right so this actually is a dog instance and that's the reason why pet instance of dog was written true however here we are creating animal animal is equal to new animal is animal a instance of pet you can see that it throws an oops i should say pet it returns false because animal class is a super class a super class variable is not a instance of a subclass and same is the case with animal instance of dog it prints false to however animal is an instance of the object right so that's true so this is how you can make use of the instance of operator in this video we looked at a few puzzles related to inheritance until the next video bye bye welcome back in this video let's start with a very important concept called abstract class let's start in this step to understand what are the restrictions behind an abstract class and in the next step we would talk about where are abstract classes typically used let's get started with understanding the basics of an abstract class typically when i create a class let's say class animal and let's say i am saying public void bark what i would need to do is i would need to provide an implementation to all the methods that i would want to do so let's say system dot out dot println and test so what i'm doing in here is i created a animal class with a bark method right i provided the implementation for the bark method in here as well what i can do is say animal animal is equal to new animal this is creating an instance and animal dot bark so it's printing test that's typically what we have been doing until now so for every class wherever we create a method we provide the implementation of that specific method abstract class provide a feature by using which you don't need to specify implementations of a few methods for example let's say i call class abstract animal right so class abstract animal and over here what i'm saying is public void bark and putting a semicolon i'm only providing the declaration of the method but i'm not providing an implementation of it what does it say it says missing method body now declare abstract so let's go ahead and declare it as an abstract so what we can do is we can put a keyword called abstract public void bark and semicolon and press enter you'd see that another error crops up it's saying abstract animal is not abstract so you are defining an abstract method but you don't have an abstract class you can read this out so the way we would define an abstract class is by saying something like this abstract in, in front of the class we put a keyword called abstract and abstract animal and inside this we would define a method as abstract by putting public void bark 
So what we are doing in here is we created an abstract class called animal with a bark method, but we are not really providing an implementation of the bark method. Who would provide the implementation of the bark method? It's the subclasses. So let's say I would want a class dog tense abstract animal. Now let's close the definition in here. It says, okay, you are not abstract and you are not overriding the abstract method. So I'll not allow you to be created. So if a class wants to extend an abstract class, we would need to provide an implementation for the abstract method. So now I would need to say public void bark and let's provide a simple implementation system.out.println. Let's just assume it's a dog. So bow bow, right? And enter. So what is the class doing? It's extending an abstract class and providing an implementation for the bark method, right? So the dog class extends the abstract animal and provides the implementation for bark. So now what I can do is I can go ahead and create instance of the dog class, right? Dog, dog is equal to new dog. And then call dog dot bark. Is that allowed? Yep, it's printing in. However, for the abstract classes, you cannot create instances. Abstract animal, animal is equal to new abstract animal. That's not allowed. This is not really allowed. You cannot create instances of the abstract class. So let's quickly revise what we have learned in this video, right? So we said we can create abstract classes. The way we would define abstract classes is by starting with a keyword called abstract. And you can have abstract methods in your abstract class. By abstract methods, we mean methods which does not have a definition, does not have a body. They don't tell what they do. So they just have the declaration. They have the syntax of how you can call them. That's basically what they have. And what we have realized is for an abstract class, you cannot create instances. However, we can extend abstract classes and create concrete classes. This is an abstract class because this is having the keyword abstract, right? For a concrete class to extend an abstract class, what we would need to do is provide an implementation for all the abstract methods. And we create an instance of the concrete class and we saw that we were able to call the method. This is cool, right? But there might be a question in your mind. What kind of situations should I really go for an abstract class? Let's see that in the next video. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous video, we talked about the basics of abstract class. In this video, let's look at one of the uses for an abstract class. Let's create a simple class. I'll call this abstract recipe and click finish, right? One of the important things is we would want to make this class abstract. So I'll say public abstract class abstract recipe. Let's think about some cooking dish that you would want to do. Typically for every cooking thing that you would need to do, there is a little bit of setup that is involved, right? You'd want to prepare prepare for it, right? You want to do a preparation, then you'd want to do the recipe, and then you'd want to do the cleanup, right? Typically, whenever I have, I need to cook something, I need to start with preparing for it, right? So I need to get all the things that are needed, make sure everything is clean and all that kind of stuff. Now, the second thing would be to actually do the recipe, so do the uh, dish. The third one is to clean up after everything is done, right? So this is kind of the steps that we typically follow. These kind of situations are where abstract classes are very, very useful. So let's say I would want to make sure that all these three steps are mandatory for all the classes that implement the recipes. So what I can do is I can create a method called public, let's say void 
execute and in this I would call prepare instead of prepare I will call this get ready so get ready then I'll I'll call this do the dish and the last one is to clean up right so this is kind of the thing but I'm setting these steps involved right but I don't want to decide what is involved in doing get ready what is involved in do the dish what is involved in cleanup I don't want to in get involved with that I would want each of the recipes to decide that for themselves so what I can do now so I can say void get ready I can say void do the dish and void cleanup so what I'm saying is I don't want to provide the implementation I provide the algorithm I want I don't want to provide how it should be done the subclasses should take care of it right so this is what is a typical use of an abstract class now whichever dish wants to implement the abstract recipe what does it need to do control and new class so let's say I'll call this recipe one right so recipe one let's say I say it's extends abstract recipe I get a compilation error it says recipe must implement the inherited abstract method so it's saying it should implement so the shortcut is control one and add unimplemented method so I'm doing that and you can see that there are default methods which are present so let's say the get ready for this is system dot out dot print ln get the raw materials and let's say the get the utensils right so that's I'm just doing a little bit of algorithm in here this is not really an algorithm so here I can say do the dish and over here I can clean up right so at the end the last one I can say clean up the utensils now I can now create a class called recipe runner recipe runner with a main method and I can execute this recipe right so I can say recipe one recipe is equal to new recipe one and recipe one recipe dot I can call the execute method so the definition for the execute method is actually provided by the abstract recipe the definition for each of the steps of the abstract recipe are provided by the recipe one class right so now if I run this what would happen get the raw materials get the utensils to the dish clean up the utensils right so let's say over here in this recipe we are not using the microwave right let's say I'll create another one with recipe with microwave I'm just copying the recipe one and creating recipe with microwave and in here because we are using the microwave I would say switch on the microwave and over here clean up the utensils and switch off the microwave and get stuff ready and over here I'll say put it in the microwave now, over here we are defining the individual steps differently right so over here in recipe one we had different steps and here we have different steps but instead of recipe one over here I would want to now run recipe with microwave right so recipe with microwave so I'll call this recipe with microwave you can see that when this runs the same kind of stuff would happen so do this clean up the utensils and now get the raw material switch on the microwave get stuff ready put it in the microwave clean up the utensils and switch off the microwave what the abstract class allows us to do 
is to define the basic algorithm. We are defining the different steps which are involved. So we are saying get ready, do the dish and clean up. And we are providing the actual implementation of the steps in the subclasses, recipe one and recipe with microwave. This is exactly what most of the abstract classes do in various kind of frameworks, right? So there are a number of Java frameworks which are present and all the abstract classes provide kind of the sample algorithm. So they implement the high level algorithm and they leave the specific details to the implementation classes, to the classes which are extending the abstract class. This is one of the ways in which abstract classes are typically used. I'll see you in the next step where we would be talking about a few puzzles related to the abstract class. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, let's discuss a few puzzles related to the abstract class. Now, let's create an abstract class, abstract test. And I don't have an abstract method in the abstract class. Is that allowed? Syntactically, it is allowed, right? So you can create an abstract class without any abstract methods present. That's allowed syntactically, but I have no idea why you would want to do that. That's the abstract class without a abstract method. Now, let's look at another small puzzle. Let's create a very simple abstract class, abstract algorithm. abstract void steps semicolon so this is how we create an abstract class right so that's not the puzzle the puzzle is let's say now what if i say class algorithm one extends abstract algorithm and close brace what would happen now if I press enter now, what would be the result? Okay, it says it should either be abstract or it should implement the steps, right? So I would need to provide an implementation for void steps or it should be abstract. So how do I make the class abstract? Think about it. So the way I can make the class abstract is by making this also abstract. So I can extend an abstract class and still be abstract myself. The only thing I would need to do is to add an abstract at the start, right? So an abstract class can extend another abstract class. And if an abstract class extends another abstract class, it does not need to provide implementations for the abstract methods in the abstract class. Now let's try to do something with this abstract algorithm. In here, I'm trying to store a private variable, private int step count. Is this allowed? Think about it. Can an abstract class can have a variable in defined in it, a member variable? Answer is yes. You can have an abstract class with variables that are defined. And also you can have abstract classes with concrete definitions for methods. So I can have this and I can have a private or a public int get step count. I can return this value back, step count. This is allowed too. So you can actually have non-abstract methods inside an abstract class as well. That's what we also saw when we did the abstract recipe, right? The execute method here is a non-abstract method because it is having a concrete implementation. These three methods were abstract. They did not have a implementation. There you go. Those are some of the important puzzles that are related to abstract class. I'll see you in the next step. Welcome back. In this step, let's try to understand about a very, very important concept in Java programming called interface. A number of starting programmers find it difficult to understand the difference between an abstract class 
and an interface. Syntactically, with Java 8, both of them are almost the same. But from the usage perspective, how they are used, and the thought process perspective, how do you think about it, interfaces are very, very different. So, what we are doing in this step is try and give you a little bit of thought process in how you can think about interfaces, right? Now, let's look at the picture that you are seeing on the screen right now. So, that's a console, right? That's a gaming console. So, in there, whatever buttons that are present in here is the interface that is present to the game, right? So, whatever game you are playing would actually implement something for each of these buttons. So, when you press this button, what should happen? That is what the games would implement. Let's say you are playing a Mario game or a chess game. These games provide implementations to the different things which are present on this interface. And that's exactly how you would need to start thinking about interfaces in Java or for that matter in any object-oriented programming language. Let's create a very simple class. Control N. Instead of class, I'm going to choose something called interface and click next. Right? I'll call this gaming console. Let's take a very, very simple gaming console. Let's just say there are four buttons in it, right? So I'll not make it a very complex gaming console. So I'll say public void up. down, left, right. So what we have in here is a very, very simple gaming console interface definition. Who provides the implementation for this? The implementation for this would be provided by the games which are implementing the gaming console, right? So over here, the syntax is very simple, right? Public interface, instead of class, we are using the keyword interface. And inside here, we are just defining the syntax of the methods. We are not really worried about what they do. All that we are worried about is how can you call them? That's basically, so we are providing the declaration and not the definition. Let's move it to a different package. Actually, I created it in an inheritance package. Let's create it in the interface S. I cannot have the package name as interface because it's a keyword. So I'll make it interfaces and move the gaming console to that particular package. So we now have up, down, left and right. So now I can provide implementation to this gaming console, right? How can I provide an implementation for this gaming console? The way I can do that is going here and create a new class. And let's say Mario game, right? Mario. Click finish. I don't really need a main method in here. Over here, what we would want to do is we would want to implement the gaming console. Implements gaming console, right? Now it says error. So control one, command one, add unimplemented methods. And you have all the methods from the interface coming in here. And you can define what you want to do on each of these buttons, right? So what I can do here is I can say, Mario game, when you press up, what does it do? It does a jump, let's say. Or this one goes into a hole. So left, let's say, does not do anything. Right would go forward. So what we are doing is providing implementations for an interface. So this gaming console what we are doing is we have methods in here, up, down, left, and right. And we are providing the implementation for those buttons in here. So now I can have a game runner, right? So the game runner, let's say, is the one which uses this interface. So let's call this game runner, and I'll do this in here. Finish. So the game runner, I can create an instance of the game, right? So Let's say Mario game, game is equal to new 
Mario game and I can call methods on it up down left right right up down left right so this is cool right so jump goes into hole go forward and for one of these there is no implementation now the advantage of the interface is that you can actually have multiple implementations of it so what I'll do is I'll copy the Mario game control C control V and I'll call this chess game right let's just say this is a very simple implementation so up I'll say move piece up down move piece down and left is move piece left and the other one is move piece right let's say this is the implementation for a chess game so now in the game runner I can actually just replace this statement with a simple statement chess game game is equal to new chess game so when we replace the cartridge something of this kind happens and what happens is now we are playing a chess game and the magic of this is you can use the gaming console as the so if I say gaming console game is equal to new Mario game you can see that I can run the same code this is jump goes into a hole and go forward and if I replace the Mario game by a chess game so with the same code we are getting different implementation this is also called polymorphism but this is what is possible with interfaces right so I can provide multiple implementations for the same thing interface basically represents the common actions that can be performed so in the gaming console the common actions that can be performed are up down left and right and we are providing multiple implementations and interface provides us a way to interchange between the implementations I can use either the chess game implementation or I can go with the Mario game implementation without making a lot of changes in my code so I'm easily switching from a Mario game to a chess game now have these concepts in mind and in the next step we will discuss much more about interfaces in this step what we talked about is the fact that interfaces provide the actions the common actions between classes we can have multiple implementations of the interface we use the implements keyword and provide the implementations for that we saw how to execute code using interfaces I'll see you in the next step welcome back in the previous step we looked at one example of an interface we saw a gaming console the interface of it and we created two implementations a Mario game and a chess game in this video let's look at another example of interface right so let's say a project a specific project is running which wants to outsource part of the coding of a complex algorithm to another team and let's say the complex algorithm is something of this kind it accepts a number as input it accepts two numbers and returns a int as an output now how can they do this so how can the project continue working on its code while it continues to outsource the complex algorithm what we can do is we can create an interface for the complex algorithm so let's get started I can start with interface as a public oops name is let's just say complex algorithm and finish we are creating an interface complex algorithm so make sure that it's not a class this is interface complex algorithm and over here I can define the method let's in complex algorithm number one number two now the project what they can do is they can start let's create a new class so let's assume this is a project class right so the project what they can do let's add a main method in here now they would want to use the complex algorithm so what they can do is actually create a dummy algorithm so they can create a dummy implementation of this interface 
So what this project does is, okay, I don't really have a real implementation of the complex algorithm. So I'll create a dummy implementation of this complex algorithm. So they would go ahead and say, okay, I'll create a dummy algorithm. And this dummy algorithm implements complex algorithm. Compilation error. So I'll add in the unimplemented methods. Control one or command one should get you this. And over here, let's say the dummy algorithm would actually just add these one, add these numbers and return them back. We are returning the details back. Now what the complex algorithm, the project can do is now it can start using the dummy algorithm as the algorithm. So it can start working. It can say complex algorithm, algorithm is equal to new dummy algorithm. So it can start working with the dummy algorithm initially and it can say algorithm dot complex algorithm 10 comma 20. So in the code of the project, what we can do is we can do something of this kind. So we can use the dummy algorithm and continue working with it. So let's do a sysout. And now if you print it, we are using, what is the project doing? It's using the dummy algorithm and it can continue working. So you can write code using this dummy algorithm. That's all possible because we have an interface which defines what is the communication between those two systems. So both the systems are accepting that there will be a method like this. There will be a interface like this and the outsource team would provide an implementation, a real implementation for this. Now, what happens when the outsource team provides a real implementation? Let's say control C, control V, I'm copying the w, dummy algorithm. Let's say this is the real algorithm, right? So this real algorithm, let's say is provided by the team. So after some time, the team comes up with the real algorithm. And let's say I'm just implementing some dummy logic in here. So it's multiplying it. So let's say this is a very complex 10,000 lines of code, which implements the entire algorithm, right? So all that the project needs to do now is to, to switch from the dummy algorithm to the real algorithm. What, it, what does it need to do? It just needs to change this to real, right? And then it can continue using the real algorithm. So now you get the real values from the real algorithm. Oops, actually I made a mistake. I changed the dummy algorithm to star and the real algorithm to plus. So let's reverse that and let's run the program again. Now you'd see that it's 200. Interfaces also provide a way to communicate between two different projects, right? So you can define an interface defining how you expect a method to be, a method call to be. And the outsourcing party can provide an implementation at a later point in time, and the project can continue working with a dummy implementation of that specific thing. So interfaces provides you a way to continue your work even when an external interface is not really available. Once you define an interface and provide a dummy implementation, you can use that while the real implementation is not really available. The way you can actually think about interfaces is it establishes the communication agreement. It establishes the contract between two classes which are talking to each other. So what are the methods that a specific class is definitely going to implement? And all the other classes in the system can depend on the fact that that particular class would contain all those methods. Having discussed about interfaces so long, in the next video, let's talk about a few puzzles related to interfaces. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome. Back. In this video, let's look at a few puzzles related to interfaces, right? So interface, let's say interface one, I'm creating an interface. And let's say there's a method in here, void method one, right? So it's very simple interface, right? So can I extend interface, interface two extends interface one. Is this allowed? Think about it. Do you think it would be allowed? So I'm creating method two in here. And is this allowed? So should it be implements or extends? That's the question, right? So the answer is it's allowed. An interface 
can extend another interface that is allowed however if a class wants to implement this interface to what does it need to do now will it compile nope it will not compile because it needs to provide now the implementations for both these methods so it needs to say i am providing an implementation for method 2 public void method 2 and empty code right so is this sufficient if the implementation provides implementation of method 2 nope because it needs to also provide implementation for method 1 so let's go ahead and provide implementation for method 1 as well so method 2 method 1 and only then we would be able to class create the implementation of the interface so the summary is you can extend the interfaces but if you would want to implement the second interface then you need to implement methods in that interface as well as the interface it is extending let's go on to the next question let's say now i would want to implement interface 2 but i only want to implement method 1 i don't want to implement method 2 how can i do that is there a way that i can do that think about it so I would want to implement interface 2, but I only want to implement method, one of these methods. I don't want to implement both these methods. What can I do? The way you can do that is by creating an abstract class. So you can create an abstract class implementing, let's say implementation abstract, and I can say implements interface 2. However, over here, I don't really need to implement any of the methods. We can, let's say, implement method 1. This is allowed because we are saying this is abstract class and abstract class can implement part of the methods which are defined in the interface that is allowed. However, any class, any concrete class which extends this abstract class would definitely implement everything which is present in the interface to and the interfaces it is extending. In summary, you can have abstract classes implementing interfaces which do not have implementations for the interface. But if you have a concrete class extending that abstract class, the concrete class and the abstract class combination should provide the implementations to all the methods defined in the interface to and the sub interfaces. Now let's create a simple interface. Interface, interface three. Now over here, I'm trying to create a variable int test. Is that allowed? Think about it, is that allowed? Nope. As you can see, it's not allowed. Let's see why it's not being allowed. So let's say, I'll say int test is equal to five and close. You can see that interface is created. What we are creating in here is not really a variable. What we are creating in here is a constant. So in interfaces, you can create constants and not variables. By default, this is actually a constant. You cannot change the value of this constant. Before Java 8, we cannot really create a real implementation of a method inside an interface. But from Java 8, it is allowed. So let's look at how to create an implementation. Let's say interface 4, I'm just creating a simple method in here right so i can say default void print and over here i can provide an implementation i can say system dot out dot println default oops there's a syntax error right so interface is what i would need to have typed in so default void system dot out dot println okay this is allowed so now you can see that you can have a default method this is allowed from java 8 what happens is if a class let's say test implements interface 4 and does not provide a implementation of this print method it gets the default implementation so if i say test test is equal to new test and I call test.print, what would I get? The default implementation, default. However, you can override that as well. So I can say class test1 implements interface2 and provide a implementation of that. So I can say 
public void print i can override the implementation which is present in that interface system dot out dot println override and that's allowed right so it created class test one now i can create instances of the test one right so test one is equal to new test one and i can say test dot print what would happen it would print override so what we saw in here is interface can also provide a default method the way we can provide that is by using a keyword default and after that it's the usual so this defining a method is usual except that the keyword is default and this is acting as a default implementation for that specific method in the interface the use of the default methods is typically when you are extending an interface let's say i have an interface with three methods and i have thousand classes implementing th those three methods now if i add a fourth method to the interface all the thousand classes will start having a compilation error what do i mean let's take a simple example right so i'll go into the project and let's say interface just quickly create a test interface test and let's say this has one method right let's keep it simple let's call it void nothing right and now i have two classes implementing it right class one implements test right and i would need to provide an implementation so add unimplemented methods let's also create a class to implementing test right so we have two classes implementing the test right now right they don't they're not really doing anything but let's not worry about it so let's say this interface we are extending and i'm adding in one more method void nothing one what happens all the earlier classes start failing compilation because they are not implementing the nothing one so when i'm implementing a test interface i would also need to implement nothing one right now so if i extend test with a new method these two classes also need to implement this to prevent that from happening to prevent the compilation error from happening what we can do is say default void nothing and provide a default implementation then the compilation errors would start disappearing this is especially useful when you are providing the interface but some other third party is providing the implementation for your interface in those kind of situations especially having a default method would be very very useful because you are not breaking the external parties code in this long step we actually discussed a wide variety of puzzles related to interface we saw that an interface can extend another interface and if i want to implement a class which is not implementing every method which is present in the interface then i can make it abstract and also we talked about the fact that there are default methods in interfaces in from java 8 which help you to provide a default implementation for a specific interface implementers of that specific interface can override the implementation but the default is useful in cases where we are extending an interface and we would want to prevent the implementers of that interface from having compilation issues i'll see you in the next video we would be talking about the differences between interface and abstract class welcome back in this video let's discuss an important concept the differences between an abstract class and an interface actually speaking there is no relationship between an abstract class and interface except that their syntax really looks similar right so when do you go for a interface when we would want to have two systems talking to each other or two classes or two components talking to each other and we would want to establish a communication pattern between them we'll define a method saying okay this is how these two things will talk to each other and one party would provide the implementation and the other party would consume the interface right so that's basically where interface comes in abstract class comes in in a little bit of a different context over here with an abstract class what we want to provide is a high level structure we would want to leave the implementation details 
to the subclasses. What we are doing in here is we are saying, okay, I would want to be able to ensure that all subclasses meet this structure. And to be able to use abstract class, we are going to use inheritance. So, is a relationship exists between the subclasses and the superclass, which is the abstract class. So, each of these recipes is really an abstract recipe. However, that kind of a relationship does not exist for interfaces. Speaking the truth, the thing is, when we are comparing interfaces with abstract classes, we are comparing apples with oranges, right? No comparison at all. But typically, this is something which is asked a number of times. The way you can answer that is by saying there is no real relationship. But when it comes to the syntax, you can try and compare them a little bit. Let's now look at some of the syntactical differences, right? So one of the important thing is in an interface, you cannot call something as private. I cannot call a method as private because in interface, everything is public. So in an abstract method, on the other hand, you can have private methods. So you can say something is private. The other thing is in an interface, you cannot have variables. You cannot have things which whose value change. If you have a value like this, in the interface, it is actually a constant value. This value cannot change. However, in an abstract class, similar to a class, you can have all kinds of variables. Because abstract class is nothing but a class, except that some of the methods in the abstract class might not have a concrete implementation. The other difference between an abstract class and interface is that a class can implement multiple interfaces. Array list, for example, which is one of the things which we discussed earlier. So array list, if you look at it, it implements a number of interfaces. So it implements a list interface, a random access interface, a clonable interface, a serializable interface. You don't really need to worry about what are the exact things. But the thing is, a class can implement multiple interfaces, but you cannot extend multiple abstract classes. So you cannot have two super classes, right? It basically comes down that you cannot inherit from two different classes. In this video, what we did was look at what are the syntactical differences between interfaces and abstract classes. Until the next step, bye-bye. Welcome back. Now that we discussed the differences between interface and abstract class, let's do a simple exercise. So what we want to do is we would want to create one interface and one abstract class. If you look at the interface that we would be creating, it's called flyable. Typically interfaces represent common actions that can be performed. So we would want to create an interface flyable with a fly method, right? It's fly. And what are the things that can fly? Bird and an airplane, right? Bird does not have anything in common with an airplane, right? Except that both of them can do the same action, that is to fly. So interface represents common actions. We would want to create an interface called flyable and we would want bird and airplane to implement the interface flyable. And what we would also want to do is we would want to create a runner class where we would want to do fly flyable flying objects is equal to new bird and new airplane. So we are creating an array. Here you can see that the reference variable is of the type interface. So the reference variables of type interface can hold the implementations of the interface. Class bird is an implementation of the interface and airplane is also an implementation. The fly method for bird should print with wings. Fly method for airplane should print with fuel. What you need to do is to loop this and invoke the fly method and all these objects. So that's exercise number one using an interface. And the exercise number two is using an abstract class. So we will use an abstract class animal. Uh, what we want to do is we would want to have an abstract method called void. So this should be an abstract method, make it an abstract method. And dog should extend animal and print bobo. And cat should extend animal and print meow meow. And what we would also want to do is to store the new cat and new dog array into a references of type animal and loop around it and invoke the bark method. So I'll recommend you to pause the video in here and try and implement them as an exercise. 
Okay, let's look at the solution for the interface. Let's create a new class. I'll call this interface runner or I can actually even better call this flyable runner because that's the interface that we are trying to test and I'll create a main method and do a finish, right? So what we want to do is we would want to create an interface flyable. For this exercise, I'll start using a few inner classes. You can actually create a class da right down here. So class flyable. Actually, we would want to create an interface flyable, right? So interface flyable with a void fly method, right? That's what we would want to create. And we wanted to create two implementations of this flyable, right? So bird and airplane. So class bird implements flyable. And you should get a compilation error, control one, and unimplemented methods. Let's implement it in here, right? So what should be the implementation? This out. We said with wings, right? And let's go ahead and implement the next one. Bird, after the bird, it's aeroplane, right? Aeroplane implements. How does the aeroplane fly? With fuel, right? So with fuel. And now in the flyable runner, we wanted to create an array. I already gave the code for you for that. Right, it's very simple, flyable flying objects is equal to new word, new airplane. And I would want to loop around them. Oops, there's an error. Oops, I made a mistake. It should have been flyable array here, right? So that's what it needs to be. And now I can loop around it, right? Flyable flying objects, flyable object, colon, flying objects. And I can now say object dot fly. And when I run this, what would you happen? With wing and with fuel. First, the fly method is called on the bird. So it prints with wing. And now, second, it prints with fuel for the airplane. So what we are doing in here is using an interface to represent the common method between two completely different stuff. That's exactly what an interface is all about. The interface represents common actions that can be performed the next example which we wanted to do was to create an abstract class and the idea was to create an abstract method void bark and create two implementations of the abstract class dog and cat dog is written, printing pobo and cat is printing meow meow and to loop around it similar to how we did with interfaces i'll leave this to you as an exercise, we'll discuss the solution to it a little later when we talk about polymorphism. In this step, we solved a couple of simple problems related to interfaces and abstract class. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will talk about something called 97 things a programmer should do. There are a lot of good practices around programming and also how do you make sure that you are in touch with what's happening, right? This is one awesome resource that I found. As you can see in here, it says pearls of wisdom for programmers collected from leading practitioners. So if you go and click this 97 things every programmer should know, just type in Google 97 things a programmer should do, actually should know and you should Take the first link it's a git book so you can go ahead and see it or you can actually go to the programmer.97.things.oreilly.com either of these sites is great on the oreilly site you'd be able to directly click and see the 97 contributions so the, click the 97 contributions which are present in here or if you are going to the git book you can download the entire pdf so you can download the pdf and see what are the content which is present in here these 97 things are awesome for a starting programmer. So it gives you tips on how can you learn fast? What are the best things that you can do in a project? Things like the Boy Scout rule, always keep improving. Make sure that you follow the best practices for code reviews. Make sure that you continuously deploy. Make sure that you are learning continuously. Comment only what the code cannot say. How do you design APIs? Some of the things which you might be seeing in here might be over the top for now. But don't worry, try and read it 
even if you don't understand it that's fine for now it does not really matter the important thing is to try and make sure that whatever is present in here becomes a practice by the time you become an experienced programmer all that you see in here are experiences from a wide range of programming practitioners and this is awesome advice that you can follow either download the PDF from the gitbook or have a link to this page and you would do really well. I'll see you in another video where we would have a few more tips. Until then, bye bye. Welcome back. In this video, we will talk about an important concept called polymorphism. I'm opening up the game runner class which we created during the interfaces. So, over here, let's create a simple array. So, We'll discuss the example first and then talk about what polymorphism is all about, right? So I'll create a array. So I'll create an array of gaming console. So gaming console array games games is equal to let's say I create a new Mario game and a new chess game. Right. So what we are doing in here is we are creating a very simple array of chess game and mario game and storing it into a games array and what i'll do is for game game in games right for gaming console i should say for gaming console game in games what i would want to do is call all these methods right if i run this right now What would you see? It says jump, goes into hole, go forward, and move piece up, down, left, and right. So what we are doing in here is with the same piece of code, we are same piece of code, we are executing code from two different classes. We are not changing the code which is getting executed. The executed code remains the same, except that when we are calling it with different games, we are calling code from two different classes. So Mario game and the chess game so the same code is having two different behavior based on whether we are using a mario game or a chess game and this is called polymorphism the thing is the poly polymorphism applies as much to interfaces as well to the inheritance concepts as well let's create a simple example with inheritance let's create a new class so i'll call this um, animal runner and I'll create a public static void main in here so over here let's define a couple of classes in directly in here so let's create a class animal let it be an abstract class right so abstract class animal and I would want it to declare abstract method abstract void park right we did this earlier right so abstract void back and let's say class dog implements or extends animal and over here we would want to implement provide an implementation so public void back and let's say sys out Bow, bow. right we did this earlier and this is I'll create another one cat and let's say meow meow right so over here we are creating two classes dog and cat which extend abstract class animal and over here what we'll do is we'll create another array right so we'll create animal array so animal is an abstract class animal animals is equal to I'll create an array with new cat and new dog right and let's move this piece of code outside the class so over here it's not really accessible so what I'll do is I'll move it here now you should be able to access that we'll talk about inner classes a little later and why we were not able to create an instance a little later for now I moved this outside the class so now you should be able to use the array and let's loop around it for animal animal in 
oh this is actually animals so animals i can say animal dot park right so if i run this program right now you'd see that it would print meow meow and bow bow actually we are using the same reference variable and calling the same method on the reference variable but we have two different behaviors when cat is when the method is called on cat meow meow and when the method is called on dog it's bow bow so this is what is called polymorphism polymorphism is same code different behavior over here with abstract class we have that thing where we are having the same code providing different behavior based on what is the content of the reference variable right so if this any animal is pointing to a cat a different method is executed if this animal is pointing to a dog a different method is getting executed depending on whether the interface reference variable is referring to a mario game or a chess game the functionality varies the executed method is different and this is what is called polymorphism if you are properly implementing interfaces and you have multiple implementations of the interface or if you have multiple implementations of the abstract class polymorphism is a default consequence of it in this video we looked at the basics of polymorphism it's basically same code different behavior we saw how to do polymorphism with interfaces as well as with abstract classes until the next video bye bye welcome back welcome to this brand new section on collections we will start this section with a question why do we need collections let's look at that in this specific step in the previous sections we talked about arrays we talked about the facts that array is a fixed length right so once i create an array with a specific length i cannot change the length of an array so here we have an array of 15 elements index runs from 0 to 14 and let's say i would now want to insert a new element 100 at the index 2 so at this location i would want 100 to be inserted what i would need to do is to write a lot of new code right i would need to write code to create a new array with 16 elements after that i would need to copy the first two elements and then insert the new element 100 into it and after that i would need to copy the rest of the elements that's a lot of work and that's what array list does for you array list is a collection similar to array there are a lot of other data structures how you can store your data linked list hash table tree the question java asks you is do you want to focus on the low level data structures or do you want to focus on your business logic and java also provides a solution for that java provides a number of built in collections some of the important collection interfaces that java provides are list set queue and map you can use these collections to solve a wide variety of problems in the next steps we would learn about each of these collections what are the different variations that are present with each one of them and how do you choose the right collection for the right problem in this video we looked at why we need collections the underlying data structures are very complex even inserting a simple thing into an array or deleting a simple thing in involves writing a lot of code other data structures like tree linked list are even more complex java provides implementations of these data structures called collections so you can focus on the business logic and don't really need to worry about what's happening beneath them what we would need to get is a good understanding of each of these collections and what is the data structure underneath it and when is the right time to use which collection 
we'll focus on those questions in the subsequent videos i'll see you in the next step welcome back in this video we will start talking about one of the basic collection interfaces list we talked about list in a previous section so this is like a quick revision of whatever we have learned about list and array list in the previous sections if you would want to find the documentation for any of the interfaces that we are going to discuss all that you need to do is type in java 9 and type in the name type in java 9 and list you can pick up this one always take the latest version of the documentation because there might be a lot of changes between versions of java so what we are picking up is the java 9 as you can see java sc9 list once the page loads up you can see a lot of information about the list interface if you scroll a little bit down then you would see all the important documentation about the list interface right important statement is this is an ordered collection that means you have precise control over where each element in the list is inserted what does ordered mean that means you can actually insert elements at a specific position so you can say i would want to add an element at a specific position i can get elements from a specific position the other important thing you see in here is lists typically allow duplicate elements and it also says list interface provides four methods for positional access to list elements i would recommend you to spend some time looking at the list interface documentation over here you would be able to find out what are the super interfaces of list that's basically what are the interfaces list is extending and also the sub interfaces what are the other interfaces which extend list and also you'd be able to find what are the implementation classes so which of the classes implement the list interface you would also find the details of each of the methods that are present in the list interface and also the other methods which in inherits from other interfaces now here is the important summary about a list interface the most important thing about a list interface it, it really cares about which position each object is in you can add elements by specifying a position saying okay i would want to add an element in sixth position i can add an element in tenth position you can also add elements without specifying a position and then it is added at the end right so this is a lot of boring theory let's get started with the interesting part let's do the hands-on now on the list i am in jshell i've launched it up and now let's say i would want to create a simple list so i would want to create a list which can store string values how can i create that i can say list of string this is a generic saying this list would hold string values and I would want to give this let's say we are going to play with a list of words and I would want to create a new list the easiest way to create a new list in Java 9 is say list dot off so off is a static method which is present inside the list interface so I can use this and I can create apple bat and cat and semicolon so this is the easiest way to initialize a list with a set of elements what we are doing in here is we are using a static method called off list of apple bad cat isn't this awesome code to read in earlier versions of java it was not possible to do as simple as this you had to create a new array list or something of that kind and then add each of these elements or you had to create a array and then try and convert it to an array list this is one of the awesome features which i love from java 9 similar methods are available in other programming languages as well and java now has picked it up right so this is cool now from these words i can get all the details right so if i want to get how many words are present in this so it's a length method oops length is what is used on a array right so it's 
in array list it's size in collections it's always size in arrays we have a length property and in array lists or collections we have size size is used to find out how many elements are present inside your collection there is also a method to find out is it empty so is this list empty nope it isn't right so it returns false back you can also get the element at a specific index as we read in the documentation the index starts with zero so this is zero this is one and this is two so all that we need to do is say words dot get of zero what would it print apple so this is the way you can access a specific element from a list now i would want to find out if a element is present in this list or not what can i do i can use a contains method so i can say words dot contains dog does it contain dog nope it doesn't does it contain cat yes it does list provides you a lot of simple methods to find out details about what is present inside the list let's say i want to find out where the cat is present so i can use index of cat so i'm trying to find out where cat is present right so it's present at location 2 right so if i print words this is 0 this is 1 and this is 2 so index of cat is 2 if you try and find out the index of something which is not there what does it return minus 1 so when it returns minus 1 it means that the word is not present inside the list in this video we started with creating a implementation of the list interface and we played with different methods which are present in the list interface to retrieve details about what is present inside the list i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye welcome back in the previous video we created a simple list and we tried to get the details about what is present inside the list in this video we would start exploring a fact called a immutable list and also we would talk about some of the ways you can create mutable lists now what is immutability mutability and all this fun right let's start with that right so we talked about the fact that string class is immutable we talked about the fact that the big decimal is immutable wrapper classes are immutable what does that mean that means that once you create an instance of that specific class you cannot change the value of it similar to that anything that you create using the off functions list dot off or later we would be talking about map dot off anything you create with these functions it's a immutable list so now into this list i cannot add anything so if i say words dot add dog what happens it kicks me out it says unsupported operation exception it's throwing an exception saying whatever you're trying to do is not supported on this specific list now if you want to create mutable lists the options are either i can create an array list or i can create a link list or i can create a vector now you might be asking how can i create an array list how can i create a link list based on these words it's very easy right so if i want to create an array list of the words what i need to do is i need to say words array list let's say that's the name i'm giving it words array list is equal to new array list and say words right so i would also want to say this an array list of string so i can say list of string words array list is equal to new array list of words now this becomes a array list so now i can modify values in it similar to this actually if i want to create a words link list i can do this as well new link list 
and similar to this you can also create a vector so you can say instead of this vector and this would be a words vector the great thing about creating an array list link list or a vector is you can add values into it so words array list dot add let's say i would want to add in dog it's allowed and now if i print words array list you'd see all the contents so words array list now you can see the dog is added at the end and similar to this we can add values to words link list and words vector as well now you might be asking when do i use array list when do i use link list when do i use vector how do i choose between them the other question might be what are the other operations other modification operations that each of these lists support we talked about add what are the other operations that are present we will discuss about those things in the next steps in this video we looked at the fact that anything that you create with list of is a immutable list you cannot change the data and if i want to create a mutable list i would need need to create an array list link list or a vector based on this data we saw that we were able to execute an add method on this i'll leave it as an exercise for you to play with the link list and the vector so words link list and words vector try and add values to it and try and see what's happening with them try and play around with them and i'll see you in the next step where we would start discussing about array list versus link list versus vector until then bye bye Welcome back. In the previous step, we created instances of array list, link list, and vector as well. In this video, let's try and understand what is the difference between an array list and a linked list. Now, let's start with the basic data structure which is used underneath this. Underneath array list, the basic data structure which is used is an array, and same is the case with an vector. However, with a linked list, the data structure which is used is a linked list. What does that mean? Let's look at a picture. So, this is an array. Underneath an array list or a vector is an array. Underneath a linked list is a data structure called a linked list. We talked about array earlier, right? So, in an array, the values are present next to each other and therefore I would be able to get a specific value at location 8 if i want to get it i can get it very fast however with an array inserting values and deleting values is a time consuming operation if i want to insert an element here then i would need to move all the other elements one step to the right and insert a new element in here i would also have to create new arrays in certain situations if i have to delete 50 then i have to delete this and move all the elements to the right one step to the left right these are costly operations because there are multiple elements that i would need to move up and down the other kind of data structure is a linked list in a linked list you have a reference from one element to the other element so the way elements are stored if i am storing six elements like this is i would have a link from 45 to 25 25 to 4 13 and 6 So if I want to find the fifth element in a linked list then I have to start from here and say first element second element third element fourth element and fifth element so trying to access something from a linked list is very slow but if I would want to delete an element from a linked list let's say I would want to delete six from the linked list then all that I would need to do is delete this element and change the next value of 13 to 5 so change the link 13's link would change to point to 5 or if i would want to add a element in between so between 45 and 25 let's say i would want to insert 100 then i can change the link from 45 to 100 and 100 to 25 so the important thing is to understand that the underlying data structure beneath a array list and a vector is an array and beneath a linked list is a linked list for an array insertion and deletion are costly 
and accessing a value from the array is very fast. For a linked list, inserting an element and deleting an element is much more easier than an array. But accessing a element at a specific location based on the index or trying to search through the linked list is a little more costlier. Trying to find an element at a specific index is a much more costlier operation with linked list because you have to go through an element by element. In summary, array list insertion and deletion are slower compared to a linked list and it allows a constant time access. However, with the linked list, elements are doubly linked. In the picture, we saw only the forward link. Actually, in the linked list implementation in Java, we use something called doubly linked list. That means you have a link forward and also a link backward. So you have a link to the forward element and the backward element as well. As we discussed, iterating through a list is very very slow because you have to move from one element to another element and also accessing a specific element is slower so if i want to access fifth element it would be faster in an array list compared to a linked list however linked list would have faster insertion and deletion so think about when you would use an array list when would you would use a linked list when you have very few insertions and deletions, very few modifications in the list, and you would want to access the elements based on their position, you'd go for an array list. If you have a number of insertions and deletions, then you would go for your linked list. In this video, we tried to understand the difference between an array list and a linked list. We looked at the underlying data structure beneath the array list and the linked list. We saw that the underlying data structure beneath an array list is an array. Linked list is a doubly linked list, which has a link to the forward element and the backward element. We also discussed the right problems where you need to use array list and linked list. In the next video, we will move on to the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, I would introduce you to another awesome tip related to programming. This thing is related to teach yourself programming in 10 years, right? Typically, we see programming saying, okay, learn in 24 hours, learn in 10 hours, learn in 5 hours. But that's not sufficient to be an expert programmer. Programming is something which would take a long time to pick up. And that's what this resource would help you to understand. Teach yourself programming in 10 years. I would recommend you to spend some time reading it line by line and trying to understand what's present in here. The idea is very simple, right? So if you do something for 10,000 hours, then you become an expert at it. That's basically the idea from Michael Gladwell. This is very clearly illustrated in a book called Outliers, which I love. This has been proven in multiple fields. And here are a few of the things that are suggested so that you have fun and you keep learning. So if you look at the suggestions, they are one is to practice, keep practicing every day. So try and do something creative every day. The other suggestions are to read a lot of books, read programs which are written by others. Make sure that you're talking programming with other programmers as well. The other suggestion in here is to try different programming languages. I would recommend you to spend some time reading every word in here and try and see what you can figure out from here. Good luck and I'll see you in the next tip. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's discuss the difference between a vector and an array list. We understood the difference between linked list and array list. Now, when did you choose a vector? When did you choose an array list? If you look at the vector class, it's present since Java version 1. So it's present from the first version of Java. However, array list class is only present since Java 1.2. So array list came later. Before that, whenever you wanted to use a list, you had to use a vector. Now, what is the problem with a vector and why did array list come into picture? Let's see the difference between the code. Let's pick up a couple of methods from ArrayList 
and the vector classes. So trim to size for example in vector is synchronized. However, in array list it's not synchronized. If you look through all the other methods you'd see that there is synchronized on most of these. However, when you get to the array list you'd see that there is no synchronized on these specific methods. What difference does the synchronized keyword make? Let's say you have 25 synchronized methods in a class. What happens is if this instance of this class, if an instance of the vector class is shared between multiple threads, then only one of those threads can be executing any of these 25 methods. So at a particular point in time, only one thread can be executing any line of code inside these synchronized methods. Why do you want to do that? Because you want your programs to be thread safe. The behavior of your program should not change when you are accessing it from one thread or 15 threads. And that's what synchronized tries to do. We looked at what is the fundamental difference between a vector and an array list. The important difference is that vector, all methods are synchronized. That means vector is thread safe in the sense that you can use vector in situations where you are sharing data between multiple threads. However, array list is not thread safe. One of the things you need to always remember is thread safety does not come free. It has a performance impact because when one thread is executing a piece of the synchronized method, then other threads might be waiting for that thread to complete execution of the synchronized method. Unless you need thread safety, you would go for an array list. If you would want thread safety, then vector is one of the options that is present. Synchronized is one of the basic ways to implement thread safety. There are a number of approaches to thread safety that have evolved in the last decade or so. And Java also provides those options. Those are called concurrent collections. And we would look at concurrent collections after we look at threads and thread safe. For now, vector is the most basic option to provide synchronization to make sure that your code is thread safe. If you don't worry about thread safety, then you can go for an array list. That's the main difference between a vector and an array list. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In the previous steps, we discussed the difference between array list and linked list. We talked about the difference between array list and vector. In this step, let's focus on all the different operations that you can do on these lists. In the first steps, we discussed how to get the data from a list and we discussed the fact that by default, the list which we create we using list.off is a immutable list. So we cannot change the data. So we discussed what are the three ways you can create a list or linked list or vector. Now, in this video, we would be using the words array list to play with the array list and insert data into the array list. However, the same operations you can either do on a linked list or a vector. These operations do not really change based on the implementation of the list which we use. Let's use the words array list and play with it. If I want to add a element to the array list, the way I can do that is by saying words array list dot add, let's say elephant. So this is how you would add an element. You can also add an element at a specific index. So let's say I would want to add it at position two. I would want to add ball. Now you would see words array list has ball at index 2. So you can add elements at the end or in between at a position of your choice. The important thing about an list, this is common to all the lists, is a list can have duplicates. So if I say Array list dot add ball again. I'm not specifying index this time. You can see that this is added in. 
you can see that it is added at the end. So you can have the same element present twice in an array list. Array list allows duplicates. Let's say I have another list which is present and I would want to take all those elements and add it into this array list. So let's create a simple list, right? List of string, new list, and let's say this is list dot of, and let's say this is storing yak and zebra. Now let's say I'd want to add all the elements of this list to this list. How do I do that? I can do that by words array list dot add all and pass in the collection. So the collection is new list, right? So that returns true. And if I print the content of the words array list, what would you see? You'd see yak and zebra at the end. Actually, you can also specify a position. So if you put add all to common new list, then all the elements would be inserted starting position two. Until now, in this step, we were looking at all the operations to add elements to a list. You can either add single element, you can add an element at a specific position, or you can add a list of elements to a existing list. Now, let's look at operations to modify the data which is present in the list. Let's say I would want to change the element at this index 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Actually, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So at index 6, I would want to change the element. So I don't want a ball, but let's say I would want to have a fish because ball is out of place in here, right? So let's say I would want to put a fish in here. How do I do that? I can say words array list dot set six comma fish so what would happen is the element ball would be removed and its place we would have fish so if i print the array list right now you'd see fish in here instead of the ball so this is how you can change the element that is present at a specific position the last set of operations to modify are involving deletion of elements you can delete elements from an array list in two different ways based on the index and based on the element itself so let's say i would want to remove the element at index 2 what would happen it's it will remove the element so if i print the words array list right now you'd see that ball is not really there so what is happening here is remove to is returning as the element and it removes the element from the array list the other option to remove an element is by specifying the element directly so i can say remove dog then the first instance of dog would be removed and it returns true so it says now if i print the list you'd see that dog is not really here now if i try to remove an element which is not there so in the existing list dog is not there so it returns falls back so it says okay i'll try to search for a dog but it's not really there right so in this small step we looked at all the modification operations that you can do on a list we started with adding elements into the list we looked at methods to change the element at a specific position and we also looked at methods to remove elements from the list based on index as well as the element itself I would recommend you to play with these operations again. We were using an array list, so I would recommend you to create a vector and also a linked list and try to play around with these operations. Another exercise I would recommend you to do is to create three different lists and try to create a list merge of all the three lists. So create lists called list1, list2, list3 and create another list called merge list with all the elements in list one, list two, list three. So those would be the two exercises for this specific video. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this video, we would look at the different ways you can iterate around the array list. I would want to loop around this array list and print all the values which are present in it. How do I do that? That's basically the focus of this video. One of the ways you can do that is typical for loop, right? So I can say for i is equal to 1, do we know the length of the array list? 
right we know that right so words dot size or length it's size right so for array, for any collection it's size and i plus plus and i can say system dot out dot print ln words dot get of i right so it gets the value at index i and prints it so that's the most basic way right there is also an enhanced for loop right so you can say for string word in words i would want to do a system dot out dot print of word and so it exactly gives the same result so this is the basic for loop this is the enhanced for loop on a list of string other than this lists also provide an iterator so you can say iterator words iterator is equal to words dot iterator so iterator is another way you can actually iterate around a list in this approach we would need to use a while loop so while words iterator dot has next so this is one of the methods which is present in the iterator interface while there is an element present in the words dot iterator what i'll do is i'll try and loop around it so print ln now i would want to get the next element how do i get that so it's words iterator dot next so this would give me back the next element and i can go ahead and close the loop now you'd see that the same output happens at apple bat and cat so while there are elements to iterate around while words iterator has next let's go ahead and do a next and we print that element in here in this video we tried to learn about how to iterate around arrays and print the values which are present in there so we discussed three different ways of doing that as an exercise you can try creating an array list with integers so try and create an list with integers and try iterate around it using all these three approaches i'll see you in the next step until then bye bye in the previous step we discussed about the three ways of iterating around the list right why do we have three different ways of iterating around the list why do we need them that's because in certain operations you would want to use a specific kind of looping in this video let's look at what kind of operations you should use what kind of a loop let's go ahead and recreate the list so now we have a words list and let's actually create an array list as well so words i'll call this words a l array list or a l i'll keep it at small so words a l which is array list and this array list i would want to create it based on the words which were created earlier right so how do i do that i can do that by using new array list of string and specify the words because we are specifying the type of what it has on here i don't really need to specify it in here as well so i can actually remove this this is one of the new features in java so you don't really need to specify the type on both the sides so this is a list of string so here it can infer that this is a list of strings so i can do this so now we have a words array list right so we have words and we have a words array list now if i would want to loop around the list and i would want to print those words which are ending with at how can i do that the easiest way would be to just go with the enhanced for loop right so string word from words because we are not making a modification i can use the list that should not be a problem and i can say if word dot ends with 80 then i can say system dot out dot print ln the word and close the loop right aha i made a syntax mistake so let's see where it is over here right and let's fix it okay it's printing bad 
and cat. That's cool, right? So we are able to loop and print the values based on a specific logic. This is cool. If I have to do the same thing actually with an iterator, I would need to write a lot of code. So in these kind of situations, for loop might be preferred. We would actually discuss a better way of doing this using streams when we talked about functional programming and lambdas a little later. For enough, with whatever we know, this is the best approach, bat and cat. So we loop around using a enhanced for loop and we print the values out. Now, if I would want to actually delete all the values which end with at, can I use a enhanced for loop? Let's check that out right now. So string word, because I would want to modify the list, I'm going to use an array list, right? So you cannot modify the default list dot off because it returns an immutable list. Array li we created an array list of words, al, and that's what I'm making use of in here. So words al, and the logic we would need to write is if word dot ends with at, then what do I want to do is I would want to remove words dot remove word, right? So I'm trying to remove the word. Let's close the if and close the loop. Oops, I made a mistake. I should have actually had words al in here. Let's fix that right now. So words al, words dot ends with at. I would need to actually remove it from words al. I not be able to modify the words, right? So I need to print words al. And now let's see what's in the words al. You'd see that it has apple and cat. We tried to remove all the things which had at in there, but you'd see that cat is not deleted. Why? The reason is that when you're using an enhanced for loop, in the middle of the loop, it is not recommended to make modifications, especially deletions from the list because you are removing a word from that specific list and it might change how the iteration happens. In these kind of situations, it is recommended to go with a iterator. So if you want to remove a specific word from a list, the best approach would be to use a iterator. Let's see how we can do that. Let me reinitialize the list again. So I've reinitialized the list again. I said list of apple bad cat and word al, words al is new array list of words. Now I would want to delete everything that is ending with at. How can I do it with an iterator? So the way I can do that is iterator. We would want to iterate strings. So iterator of string, iterator, iterator, we can use words al dot iterator right so now we get the iterator and now we can use the iterator to loop around so while iterator dot has next what do we want to do while it has an element if iterator dot next element what do we want to check on the iterator dot next element we want to check if it contains or ends with actually if it ends with at what do you want to do if it ends with at? What do you want to do? We'd want to remove it. So how do I remove an element from an array list using an iterator? There is a method for it. So iterator dot remove. Now I can go ahead and close the loop and press enter. You can see that this has got executed. And if I now look at words array list, you'd see that there is only one word in there. It's apple, bat and cat are deleted. So in this video, what we were looking at is how do you make a modification in between a loop to an array list? The best way to do that is by using a iterator. So iterator is the best way to delete. If you're just looping around it, then probably an enhanced for loop is the best way to go with it. However, if you are trying to make a deletion or something of that kind, then it's better to go with an iterator. It's safer to go with an iterator. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. We are learning a lot of things around list, array list, vectors, linked list, and a wide variety of collections. In this step, we will focus on a few puzzles with lists. Let's say I just create a simple list, right? So I'm creating a list saying list values is equal to 
list dot of i'm saying a then i'm putting a character a then i'm putting one comma 1.0 what do you think will happen what do you think will happen so i'm actually creating a string a character i1 and 1.0 what will happen okay it's actually creating the list and if i actually try and do value dot get of 2 what would happen it would print 1 if i do a instance of and try and check what is the instance of whether it's an instance of integer it's printing true so what is getting created in value.get2 is not an int, it's getting an integer. What is happening in here? Let's try to understand in depth. Right? One of the important things is in a list, you cannot store primitives. So here I'm trying to store one, a character A is a primitive, 1.0 is a floating point constant. Now, what is happening? How am I able to store it in? Think about it. We learned something when we were talking about wrapper classes. That's the concept called auto boxing. What happens when I'm trying to create a list is all these get auto boxed and a wrapper class gets created. So for this one, the wrapper class is integer. For the character A, the wrapper class is, think about it, what was it? It's character. And for the last one, which is value.get3, it's an instance of, by default, floating point constants are double. This is a character, now uh, it's auto box to a character, this is auto box to an integer, and this is auto box to a double. And here we are creating a list of a variety of values, string, character, and integer and double. If I don't want to allow that from happening, if I want to allow my list only to have specific kind of values, that's where generalization comes into picture, generics. So now what I'm doing is I would want to only store list of string text values. Now what would happen? Obviously it would fail because now I'm trying to store, you can see what is it saying? I'm trying to store a double, an integer, a character. These are not allowed inside a string. So if you are actually saying list of string, text values is equal to list of something, then you can only store string values into this list. You cannot store values of other type. When we discuss about generics a little later, we'll understand how to create methods and classes that use generics. For enough, the way you can understand it is if I say list of string, I can only store string values in it. And the other important thing is inside a list, you cannot store primitives. Everything gets auto boxed. Let's try and create a list of numbers, list of integer. And let's call this numbers is equal to list of a set of numbers, right? 101, 102, 103. 104 and 105 so let's say this is a very simple list right now in this numbers if i do an index of 101 what do you think will happen index of 101 what would return it says zero because it does a search using this 101 it boxes it and finds the element and returns the index as zero now, I would want to take this and I would want to create an array list because I would want to modify the values inside this. So let's go ahead and do that list of integer and I will say numbers as usual AL is equal to new array list. I don't need to specify the type. We learned why in the previous video. Numbers, what would it happen? It would create a new array list with these numbers present, right? So now if I say numbers al dot index of 101 yeah there's no change it returns zero because that 101 is present in this place now if i want to remove number 101 from this list can i say numbers al dot remove 101 
oops it says index out of bounds exception it says index is out of bounds why is it so what is happening with the index of method is there is no overloaded method for index of there is only one method which accepts a object so what is happening is this 101 is getting auto boxed into an integer and you are searching for integer however when we look at the remove method if you look at the remove method if i press a tab right now you'd see that there are two remove methods right so there are two remove methods one accepting an object the other one accepting an index and when i say 101 what happens is instead of using this method and converting this in 101 auto boxing 101 to a integer what it does is it matches with this method and it uses 101 as the index so if i want to remove element 101 i would need to say integer dot value of so i'm creating an integer and then i'll be able to remove it i could have used new integer of 101 as well but as we learned in the wrapper classes integer dot value of is much more efficient now if i do numbers al you'd see that 101 is removed okay in this video we looked at a few random puzzles related to lists we tried to play around with the list try to understand them a little more if you were not able to get a few parts of it that's okay the idea was to just dig a level deeper than what we usually do and try to see what's happening let's get back to the usual stuff in the next step until then bye bye welcome back let's now shift our attention to sorting a list of numbers let's quickly create a list of numbers so let's say a list of integer numbers is equal to new nope list dot off that's the easiest way right so let's say 123 12 3 45 so it's a list of numbers and because we would want to be able to sort it what we would need to do we would need to create an array list because this is an unmodifiable list i'll go ahead and use the reference variable as list of integer numbers al is equal to new array list of numbers that's cool right so now we have numbers al is equal to new array list of numbers and now we can modify this let's check if there is a method called sort inside the integer array list oops there is and now let's try and call this sort aha it says i would need a comparator so what is a comparator let's get to that a little later so if i want to by default use the sort method which is present inside the list interface then i would need to use a comparator let's not really worry about what comparator is for now we'll get to comparator a little later for now there is another sort method which is present so we tried to do the sort directly using the array list method or the list method actually now let's see another method the other method is collections dot sort and you can pass in which array list you would want to sort this is a static method sort is a static method which is present in collections and numbers al is the collection you would want to sort so let's do that and let's now print numbers al okay cool now it's sorted 3 12 45 and 123 right so this is basically the popular way to do sorting collections dot sort now let's go ahead and actually create a more complex class so instead of storing just numbers inside a list what we'll do is we'll try and store objects of a specific class let's go to the eclipse workspace this is almost the first time that we are creating a project for collections so let's get started with creating a project for the collection so new java project i'll say collections and you can click enter to finish the thing right now once you click finish and you create the project 
you would be able to go and create a new class right so typical stuff that we have doing multiple times class and this one i would want to call it a students runner or we can call it students collection runner and i would add a main method right what i would want to do is i would want to create a student class so let's create a new class class student and um, let's go ahead and add a string name let's make it private as usual private int id and i'll create a constructor you know how to create a constructor right so it's basically right click source generate constructors and choose this we have a constructor let's create getters and setters right click source generate getters and setters and i would want create getters and setters for everything so what we have created is a very basic class so we can create a student and we are able to get and set the ids as well so that's cool now in the students collection runner let's create a list of students how do we create a list of students let's say i would want to create three students with specific ids and names can you go ahead and try how to do that okay let's get to how to do that the way you can do that is list of student students is equal to let's use the list dot of method itself and over here i can create new strengths right so new student of one comma ranga let's create a couple more so i'll put a comma here new student of let's say the id of this student is 100 comma adam and another student new student of two comma eve let's make sure that the imports are there so i would want to make sure it's java.util be careful it's not java.awt sometimes people make a mistake of choosing the wrong package we are interested in the java.util.list so let's go ahead and do that now if i go ahead and actually do a sysout of students right now what would be printed think about it what would be printed what I would want to do is make that better. So let's go to the student class and have a two string public string. Oops, two string and return ID plus space plus name. Just a couple of concatenation, so it should not be a problem. Let's now run this. Now you'd see one is wrong at 100 is Adam to receive. That's cool, right? So now we are able to print the students and see the values which are present in there. And now what we want to do is sort the list of students. Since we want to sort the list of students, what we can do is we'll create an array list for the students, right? So list of student, we want to modify the list. So we would all go for an array list. Students AL is equal to new array list of students now i would need to import the array list java.util.array list so let's import that as well now one of the important things is we are using array list in all the examples because that's kind of the default whenever we talk about collections the first thing which comes to our mind is array list right so that's the reason why we are using array list but in these examples you could have used linked list or vector without a problem with exactly the same results. So the results will not change. The performance might change a little bit, but the results would exactly be the same. Now, I would want to start, sort the students which are present in students AL. How do I do that? Do you remember what we used earlier? We said collections dot sort, and we passed in students AL. This is a compilation error. If I look at, I've, press control and hover over this and go to open implementation you'd see that only comparable interface implementations can be passed in i can only pass array lists with those classes which implement the comparable interface how did it work with integer let's take a look control shift t integer java 9 
uh, you can see that it's already implementing the comparable interface if I look at the comparable interface control and click this you'd see that there is a method which is present in here compare to this compare to defines how can you compare two objects of the same type that's basically what we are implementing in here so if you want to be able to sort two numbers you need to know which one is greater if you want to sort two students you need to tell which one of those is greater or lesser and we use the comparable interface to do that we saw that integer and string classes already provide a implementation of the comparable interface that's the reason why we were able to use them in collections.sort but for student we need to implement the comparable interface let's look at how to do that in the next step until then bye bye welcome back the previous step was one of the first steps where we ended with a compilation error right that's not really good let's fix that in this specific step we said we would need to implement the comparable interface in the student class so let's go ahead and do that so i'll open it open the student class and i would want to implement comparable interface right so we already talked about interfaces when i implement a interface what i would need to do i would need to implement all the methods which are defined in there so now as soon as i say implements comparable i get a compilation error i'll take the shortcut control one and say add unimplemented methods where is the unimplemented method that's down here right so compared to you can see that this is generating an object actually i would want to compare with other students so as a comparable of student now i can actually change this to student as well so we would want to compare one student with another student so that's the reason why we did that and now how do we want to compare these students i would want to when i sort i would want them to be in the increasing order of ids so i would want to use the id and sort them in the increasing order of ids so we would use something called return integer dot compare and say typically this is the way it would be this dot id and typically when we write to compare to we call this that so this is the current object that is the object we are comparing against so the integer dot compare is an awesome implementation this is this is present from one of the recent versions of java java 7 and if you see this it returns if x is less than y it returns minus 1 if x is equal to is equal to y then it returns 0 uh, if x is greater than y then it returns 1 so that's how the comparable interface also works so what would happen here is the current id would be compared with the id of the student that we are going to compare it against now let's go ahead and save the student collections runner you can see that the code compiles and now let's do a system.out.println after the sorting let's see what would happen so you can see that now the students are sorted according to their ids now if you want to reverse the sort order then what i can do is this would ensure that the smaller one gets preference now if i want to reverse it i can say integer.compare that.id comma this.id i'm reversing the order so what would happen when i execute it okay you can see that 100 is first 2 is next and 1 is next so for reverse order i would send that first for the ascending order i would send this dot id first in the short step we learned how to use a comparable interface implementation so how to provide a comparable interface implementation for a student and sort the students based on our own criteria until the next step bye bye welcome back in the previous step we looked at how to implement the comparable interface and do the sorting using collections.sort we implemented the algorithm that we would want to use to compare two students and that was used to sort the students so we saw that when we changed that first and this next then we were able to sort it in the descending order of ids however you might have a question 
what if I would want to sort it differently in different situations. Over here what we are doing is we are implementing it in the student class directly. Right? So, I am implementing the logic on how to compare students and how to sort them inside the student class directly. Let us say I would want in certain situation I would want to use ascending sorting and in certain situation I would want to use descending sorting. How can I implement that? That is a great question. Let us answer that in this specific video. One of the things that we can look at is the collection.sort method. Right? The collection.sort method we were using this one until now. There is an overloaded method which accepts an implementation of something called a comparator. So, when you are sorting you can also send a comparator in as the second an implementation of the comparator. So, what we want to do in here is now implement a comparator. So, instead of creating a separate class, I would create a small class in here. So, class, I will call this descending comparator or descending student comparator because this is going to compare students. Implements, we are going to implement the interface comparator and for students. So, we would want to compare students, right? So, let us do that. Let us import java.util.comparator. There would be a compilation error. That is cool. Control 1. Add unimplemented methods. And now, I can go here and implement the comparison. Typically, what I would love to do is go here and say this is student 1 this, and this is student 2. Right. So, student 1, student 2. And how do we compare? We already know the integer.compare. So, integer.compare student 1, student 2 right now we have oops i want to compare their ids not the students themselves right so dot get id okay cool now this would be ready the descending order comparator is ready so i can now just say this is ascending order plus this if i want to sort in the descending order then i can do this i can pass a new instance of the student comparator, descending student comparator. And what would happen? Let us print that out. So, after using descending sorter comparator, this is the result. Let us run this program and see what is happening. Cool, right? So, when I am doing using the default, I am not passing any argument, then it is using the logic which is in the student class and that is ascending and descending. Actually, you can implement multiple implementations of the comparator interface. So, I can copy this and I can create 10 different implementations and I can sort the students using 10 different algorithms. If you want to sort by name, if you want to sort by ID, if you want to sort by combination of name and ID, whatever combination you would want to implement, you can go ahead and implement it and sort based on it. Now that we have implemented a comparator, let us get back to something which we saw in this last step. We saw that there was a sort method which was present inside the implementation of the list itself. So, in the array list, there is a sort implementation which accepts a comparator. So, now actually I can use this comparator, I can use the new descending sort comparator in here as well. So, if I actually do this, so this is one option collection.sort and the other option is actually directly call the sort method and passing the descending student comparator and when I run this you can see that it is as expected. One of the errors that we have done is actually what we are implementing is an ascending student comparator right. So, we are putting it in the ascending. So, let us rename this. So, right click refactor rename I would want to actually call this ascending. This is an ascending student comparator and over here as well this should have been ascending student comparator and I will change everywhere to be ascending student comparator and let us run this and now you can see ascending student comparator is 1 to 100 and instead of ascending this should have been descending <laughs> okay looks like I have to get my maths right again right so I have forgot what is a descending order and ascending order descending order is going down and ascending order is going up mm -hmm. I'm making such silly mistakes, right? Never mind. 
let's focus on what we have learned in this specific step. What we have done in this specific step is we created a comparator class. Implementing a comparator class helps us to implement different algorithms for the same student. So for this student, I can compare based on ID, name, or whatever I would want to compare based on and have multiple algorithms. And depending on the situation, I can use this specific algorithm which I would want to use for sorting. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, let's review what we have learned about list interface and a few implementations of it. List extends the collection interface. So it implements everything which is present in the collections interface. And in addition to that, it would provide methods which care about the position of the object. So you can insert elements at the end of the list, in the middle of the list, wherever you would want to. We looked at the list interface and we saw wide variety of methods. We saw add all, get, set, add, remove, index of. If you want to find the last index of, because the list can have duplicates, the same element can be present three or four times. Last index of can be used to find the fourth, the last position of a particular element. We looked at the wide variety of methods which are present in the list interface. We also looked at iterators and how to loop around the list. We looked at three different implementations of the list interface. One is the array list, which uses array as the underneath data structure. That means insertion and deletion are slower compared to linked list. But if you want to access a specific element at a specific position, you'd be able to do that very fast. Linked list, the underlying data structure is a linked list, which is a doubly linked list. So you have linked to the element before and the element after. The thing about the linked list is that iterating it is slower as well as finding an element based on a specific index is also very slow compared to an array list. However, you'd be able to insert and delete elements faster. We also looked at vector, which is a thread safe implementation of a list. Vector implements thread safety by using synchronized methods. However, there's a performance impact when you're using vector in a multi-threaded scenario because all the methods in vector are synchronized. We'll talk about better approaches to thread safety called concurrent collections after we discuss about threads. In the next step, let's move on to the other collection interface, set. I'll see you in the next step. Until then, bye-bye. Welcome back. In this step, we would switch to this set interface. Until now, we have been talking about the list interface. Let's start talking about the set interface here on. In this step, let's understand what is unique about the set interface and what kind of situations you'd go for a set interface. The set interface extends the collection interface, but does not really provide a lot of new methods. Then what is the need for a set interface? The most important thing about a set interface is you can only have unique things. You cannot have duplicates in a set. If two objects are equal, then only one of them can be in this set. The other thing is compared to the list interface, set interface does not provide positional access. Let's do a hands-on and look at both these points in this specific step. How do we create a set? It's very similar to how we create list, right? Set of string, set is equal to new, nope, list dot, nope, set dot off. So set dot off, I want a set of apple, banana, and a cat. Mm -hmm. This is cool, right? We said set does not allow duplicates, right? Let's say I'm trying to add set dot add apple again. Will that allow me? Nope. It says unsupported operation because set by default will not allow modification. We need to create a hash set. So hash set is one of the implementations of a set. We'll talk about the different implementations of set in the next step. For now, let's go ahead and say hash set 
is equal to zero string hash set is equal to new hash set of the set we have already created. We'll want to use the same data. Now, in a hash set, let's try and add in apple. Will this be allowed? What will happen? Try and guess. It says false. It says apple is already in the list. Why do you want it add? Why do you want to add it again? So if I actually press hash set, then you can see apple cat banana. There is no new apple. The other interesting you can thing you can already see is that apple banana cat has become apple cat banana. So the order is already lost. So when we are using hash set, we saw that the order is a little different. Even here, when we created the set, you see that when we created a set of apple banana cat, but it became banana apple cat. The most important thing is a set does not care about the position of the element. It cares, okay, there is apple, but it does not worry where the apple is present. That's why you cannot say set dot add two comma apple. You cannot do set dot add anyway because it's unmodifiable set. You cannot even do hash set dot add. It says no suitable method found for add. Because on a set, you will not be able to do add based on a position or remove based on a position. In summary, in a set, you would not be able to have duplicates. And in a set, the position is not really important. So you cannot say I would want to add an uh, element at a specific position. Those are the two important differences between a set and a list. Set is used to store 